Summon Sign is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode eight of Summon Sign, Last Stand Media's weekly in-depth gaming discussion podcast. I am your host, as always, Brad Ellis, and joining me this week is, or are, is Colin Moriarty. Good to be here What's with up, you. Dude? Thank you. I'm, I'm here two, two times in a, sorry, I was writing a note, uh, two times in two weeks I know. to annoy the masses. But now you got also, back pain. Yeah, my back hurts, dude. Like, you know, I had an interesting day actually today already, you know, get up at 11 as usual. I got up at two, by the way, yesterday in the afternoon, which was awesome. Wow. Holy shit. Because I went to bed at like five. Hell diving, of course. And (laughs) um, so I I play my drum kit every day just for a little while, just to kind of get it, get it out of me. I love music. I love listening to music and all this and love playing. So I just put on my, I have a drum playlist on my Spotify where I just, and I put my earbuds underneath noise canceling headset which kind of defeats the purpose so the music is blaring but i don't really hear the drums as loudly and i like to play (laughs) along with like whatever songs come up that i like to play around with but when i sat down today my my drum my pedal my bass pedal was fucked up and now i'm not a mechanical person i don't know if everyone knows about this being i'm i'm fucking i'm a fucking idiot so Hmm. uh, i don't know almost anything that's useful there's almost nothing that's useful that i know and certainly nothing with me so i'm like looking at this thing it's very complicated all these levers and I'm trying to figure it out. And lo and behold, I show it to my wife, Micah. She went to a machinist high school and was like and worked in a factory for a while. So she's actually like really handy. She fixed that thing in like two seconds. Damn. So God bless her. <laughs> God bless Micah. God bless and God her. bless the drums as well. Absolutely. Dude, playing the drums sucks so bad sometimes because <laughs> everything's just need? breaking. <laughs> because it's just always that's why I minimize my kit. Like when I got this new kit, I got a minimum, a more minimal kit than I'm used to because I'm like, okay. I'm so sick of changing hardware of changing skins this thing's now out of tune why does this thing randomly sound different it's like constant and i've been watching these drum youtube uh roadie videos which are awesome like the day in the life of a drum roadie and i'm like oh my god i would kill myself if i had to do they're like changing yeah. constantly changing skins and doing all the and tuning in and i'm like oh my god so just that little thing threw me off today and uh <laughs> And so I'm, but I'm glad to be here. I'm glad I got some drumming in and I'm everything's safe and sound. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here. (laughs) And also our guest is Hogue Law, man. He's back. Hogue, I don't think I've ever talked to you ever like in a video or anything like that. But no, I think back when I was a patron of Easy Allies, I occasionally got the, the monthly email and I think you were the author a couple of times, but yeah. I have nothing as exciting as drum fixing to add to the conversation this morning. I, uh, <laughs> I was traveling this past week and I'm a, I'm a very poor traveler. Uh, I, uh, I get concerned that somebody's going to lose my bag or that I'm not going to make it through security or I'm going to be late for the right. flight, all these various things. Right. And, uh, this was basically the worst I got, uh, I, 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 our car was the wrong time. We couldn't get to the airport. Ideally I got padded down Here's something for your fans, your viewers, and your listeners. I got patted down at the airport because I had a groin warning both directions. <laughs> so apparently my groin nice. is a weapon of international terror. Hell yeah. Nice. But, but after that, the trip was fine. Had a good time. Got into a warmer climate than Michigan in the winter. Uh, and uh, I did not have to fix any drum sets at all week. Mm-hmm. That's big. <laughs> That's, That's big. Good. So, you, so you were subjected to a little security theater. But I, I got was, I got a little pat down. I, yeah. I actually feel bad for those guys because they're always like, I'm sorry about this. It's like, it's whatever. Uh, I don't feel bad for them at all. I, it's like people that work for the IRS. It's oh, like, I hate all of I you. Feel bad for them I don't guys. give a fuck about any of you. You know, I hope you all lose your jobs. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I say that I, I was just talking to Mike about this, actually, like an old girlfriend of mine. Like, so you might you probably you might know this whole the IRS is in is in two like major offices and one's in Utah and one's on Long Island. So where I was, where I was from. So a lot of just random people I knew worked at the IRS and I dated this girl there and I literally had an earnest conversation with her. I'm like, why would you ever work for the IRS? You know, like why would you ever Mm -hmm. aim to do that with your life? You're the tax man. 
You crazy? I assume some, people a, like some amount of security in your salary for the most part. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, certainly. But back in the days of Shay's Rebellion or something like that, they'd be stringing these people up, you know, <laughs> for taking yeah, five. Tax, for- <laughs> tax collectors are in the Bible a little bit. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. No, I get that. Yeah. That's one of the things that I think is virtuous about Islam is the whole anti usury thing, like apparently built into you know, the, the religion, which I was like, oh, that's kind of nice. I, I don't know if they. It is. Although I will tell you, since we have a large Muslim population in Michigan, that's that right. one of the things I got essentially accidentally proficient at was doing loans and loan documentation that were framed in different ways to avoid the imputation of interest that was still compliant with uh, the the Muslim faith. So they, they still have loans and things. They still have their businesses function. They just go about it in a structurally different way. Yeah, it's very interesting. Off topic, hmm. but very interesting nonetheless. Yes. I'm often good at bringing things off topic, Brad. Well, I apologize. I mean, oh, no. I mean, I've called on the show. That's just the way it goes. Yeah, I think it's my fault. <laughs> I'm totally used to that with that last stand. That's, and I love it. I embrace it. Did you guys chaos. do that a lot on Easy Allies? Go off, go uh, off the rails? Not nearly as much as you guys. <laughs> like, that's kind of, I mean... I don't want to judge that because I didn't really listen to the content, but that sounds that's don't you want to be a little. Yeah, little we're loosey goosey. Of course, you got to yeah. be loosey goosey. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes sacred symbols is 40 minutes before you talk about a video game, which is oh, totally it's longer fine. than that. Usually way yeah, longer, than which that is usually. totally fine. I personally yeah. enjoy it, so I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Sacred symbols is the most inaccessible video game podcast that was ever made. It is. Um, and the and it's ridiculously big somehow. Everyone loves it. Yeah, I don't know. It's one of those things we talk about it often on the show where it's like, what if we got more serious and streamlined it? And then people say like, well, that's part of why it's big. And I'm like, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I don't fuck with a good thing, you know, plus it's just I really do I think that to... I really I really think yeah. the personality is important. There's a lot of places you can go to get information about whatever it is, movies or yeah. TV or games and connecting with people and the personalities and what drives them, whether or not they're the best critic in the history of the world is as important as anything else in this space and others now. Yeah, you're very, it's very well said. Brad, how are you, by the way, before we before oh, I leave man, most of the show Oh, man, I'm good, again? dude. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is getting close, so I'm very oh, excited. Yeah. Very, very excited. I'm just trying to get you play Persona. that demo? Oh, I did, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was I, good stuff. I enjoyed that demo quite a lot. Oh, that's good to hear, Hogue. I didn't know I'm a big Final Fantasy fan. Yeah, I knew you liked some of them. I didn't know how big you were, though. But that's good. Oh, yeah, no, it's it's probably my favorite series. Uh, oh, and excellent. though I do feel that the remake project is a bit of a marketing dupe, mm-hmm. like especially when you get to the end of that first game, I, I've come around to at least being excited about going through that world again. And they're certainly toying with certain expectations, even in the trailers. Yes, sir. Uh, and so they're having fun with it. I, I hope it's a fun game. But having played a lot of Infinite Wealth at the top of this year, the, the impression I get from both the state of play and the demo is that they're really going in that direction of all of this extra stuff that feeds back into the main growth patterns for the characters in the plot line. And I think mm-hmm. that's a smart way for JRPGs to go in 2024. So I'm excited about playing that game. February oh, yeah. 29th is going to be a good day. Yeah, I know. And Colin's very excited also. Are you playing through? Yes, you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm just listening. Uh <laughs> yeah, uh, I I haven't actually started. I was going to reach out to Dagan because Dagan and I were, are, Dagan's already playing it and I'm going to replay okay. it and we were going to do it on knockback. You're going to cover it as well, I think, on what are you going to cover it on here or is it on Sacred Symbols Plus? I have no idea what you guys I are going to do. I was it asking so, what you wanted to do about it and you said you'd get back to me. Oh, yeah. OK, well, so I haven't gotten back waiting. to you. So I have to talk to Dagan because I think I need a little bit more time. I'm probably not going to be able to play Rebirth right when it comes out. I'm so, I'm too overwhelmed with things to play right now. Like, OK. I I don't like bouncing off of games if I want to play them because it usually means that I don't get back to them in a timely fashion, sometimes even at all. So a good example of that is Metro Exodus. It's like I bounced mm-hmm. off of that and I'm like, I'll get back to it. And then I never did. So now I have to start the whole thing again because I can't just jump back into it. I don't know how to do that. And Banishers, which we'll talk about in a little while, I'm really, really enjoying it. But I'm uh, it's awesome, actually. But I'm still early in it and I just don't want to bounce off of it yet. And sure. we're going to talk about Helldivers, obviously, too. And I want to talk about the Starship Troopers kind of dialogue that's going on around the, the mm-hmm. around it as well. But I was wondering if Dagan and I should actually segue. And I brought this out to, you know, Starship Troopers, the book. Oh, yeah. Do, do one on the book and then do one on the movie, which would be for knockback, which would be very different because they're very different from each other intentionally. Yeah. And then we get into Final Fantasy seven later. So but I'm glad you brought up Final Fantasy. I'm glad you brought up Final Fantasy seven for one reason, and it's because. 
I am so tired of people asking me and you brought it up. You kind of alluded to it. I'm going to allude to it right on. I'm going to hit the nail on the head and you can beep this if you want, if you think it's a spoiler. <laughs> you want to know why I'm so insistent on you playing Final Fantasy seven before you play Final Fantasy seven remake? Because they're two separate games okay they're not remakes it's a different game it's a different universe it's an alternate universe that's why you want to play both of them okay that right, is the right you. answer yeah well, no after the super bowl when the when the <laughs> meme about travis kelsey yelling at andy reed was going around yeah the tweet i put out was final fantasy 7 remake is a play on words they're remaking the world but not the game yes i tried to tell people that more gently i suppose right exactly and then they think it's being you're being annoying like oh you, you have such a purist and it's a, all right it's like all right no asshole they're fucking different it's not a they remake different. i'm not telling you to play star ocean 2 and then play star ocean 2 right. remake i'm they're they're two different they're different oh yeah yeah right, and, and, and some of the toying that they do right i mean like they are clearly playing with Aerith in the trailers going into rebirth and the name alone is a bit of a toy uh and it's interesting to see that because they did that at the end of remake and it doesn't really make a ton of sense if you don't have seven as your background. Right. That's the beauty of playing the original. Right. That's, that's why what I recommend that's, it. I just, you're right. You use the right word, Brad, gently. That's what I've been trying to do for years is to just gently be like, you should definitely play the original. So you get the yeah. context. That's the word I kept using was like, you need the context. And I think what people were reading in that reasonably enough was like, okay, I don't need the context of what happens if they're just going to make it prettier and do it again. And I'm like, Oh yeah, but that's yeah. not, it's What's happening? Case. No, yeah. it's not Star Ocean to Star Ocean 2. It's not front mission to front mission first. It's not any of those kinds of things. Right. Tactics Ogre Reborn or to <laughs> let us cling together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you just kick the door down. That was not gentle. That was kicking the door down with like a shotgun in your hand. I'm, I'm tired of the nonsense. Yeah, dude. he's sick of it. <laughs> I mean, how much more of the flippant nonsense do we need in the chicanery? I don't know. Out yeah, that's there true. Before, yeah. Before we get down to brass tacks, go play Final Fantasy 7 and grow up. Yeah, try to yeah, do it. <laughs> it's a fantastic game. It's so good. Please do it. Oh boy. Um I got some more questions I want to do before we get into what we're talking about. First of all, Hogue, I want to know what you think and Colin also, because it's a bit there's been some time. All the Xbox stuff that's been going on recently, the thing they did last week. How you feeling about all that? Well, I mean, I think the messaging obviously got away from them a little bit. And I think the comments that I've made on social media and elsewhere have primarily been about the way that Xbox has decided to market itself over the previous couple of years has been this kind of closeness, personability marketing with Phil Spencer at the head, but other people within their management. And that when you have that kind of parasocial relationship and your your backers, whatever that looks like, influencers, whatever term you want to use online, kind of get away from you. You have this mob mentality develop. And I think if they weren't aware of it before, and I think some of them were, that they know now that if they have these kinds of situations, they can get away from them real quick and then they need to make a statement like they did last week. Now, do I think it's the end of the Xbox ecosystem? Do I think it's the end of the console world as we know it? I do not. I don't think any of that was ever going as far as some of the people made it out to be as it was happening. But do I think Microsoft maybe let the messaging get away from them? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling, Colin? I know you had plenty of words last week, but how are you feeling now? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. It's kind of what I said. I, I circulated a video, I believe, on Twitter. I'm trying to use Twitter more to, to promote the shows, even though I mm -hmm. don't really want to, but it's good for us. And so to be part of the dialogue and what I had said in that clip was it's not, I, I didn't think ever it was going to be like this catastrophic thing where... And I said, I think something like, I don't think it means anything that like Xbox exclusives are going away. The Xbox brand's going away. There'll be another right. Xbox. It's like, I, but I am surprised by a few things. And I think that maybe Hogue touched on this a little bit, which is I'm somewhat shocked by how easy it is to sell fanboys on things. Xbox's messaging is really bad. And if you think that it stops at these four games, I have a fucking bridge to sell you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I have all sorts of amazing offers and opportunities for you to take advantage of, um, because you'll believe, you'll believe literally anything. And <laughs> I don't now I've said before, I think the blade thing is, was conspicuous as hell. I think that that's obviously coming to PlayStation, but what I'm more interested in is first of all, these four games are an interesting experiment. And I said on the show, and I want to reiterate it here because we have different audiences here is if you want more games to come to PlayStation and switch by them when they come out. 
Now I'm going to, I'm not going to buy them all. I'm not going to buy Sea of Thieves and um, uh, Grounded. That was the other one, right? But I am right. going to buy Pentiment and I'll buy uh, the Hi-Fi, Hi-Fi Rush. Rush. And, and pro- yeah, right. And probably put them just on my backlog because I don't know when I'm going to get to them. But I want to send them mm-hmm. a message. It's like, keep them coming. That's, this is great. Now, what I'm curious about is what the, the, the interviews that went out, and you probably saw these, right? That went with The Verge and some others. Right. Were, it wasn't quite as tight. Like I almost don't understand why they needed to do a presentation at all. Because when we when we released this stuff on Sacred, we were we actually stopped the show and watched the podcast and then came back. So I didn't really got a ch- chance to like marinate on it and talk about it. Mm-hmm. And I, I do think that they uh, didn't really need to do what they did. I think that they could have quickly come out and squashed it. And if they weren't going to even announce the games and let the studios announce the games as they're ready, then there's really no reason to have that other than to give people more quotes uh, to not, not, not take out of context. I mean, I think Phil Spencer talks out of both sides of his mouth. So um, one, one minute he's, he's asking who benefits from hell divers being exclusive. And the other minute he's talking about exclusives for his own platform. He's just, he's, he's just a nonsensical entity at this point in my mind. But I think the, I think the, um, the bigger thing that I take away is, and it's, this is being understated in some sense is that from take two, and from their financials, Q3 financials, we know that at the end of the calendar year last year, there were 77 million current gen consoles in the wild. We know now that there were 58 point, 54.8 million PS5s at the end of December, which means there's only 22.2 million Xbox Series Xs uh, or Series yeah. Xs and Ss. And in fact, more than half of them or half of them are probably Ss. Mm-hmm. And I have both an S and an X in my house, so I'm not insulting either console. It's just like whatever. So I think. Microsoft Xbox is doing what's necessary to keep them alive. And they were basically telling you that. And anyone who couldn't the the media illiteracy of being a, unable to read between the lines of what they were saying is really fa- unfathomable. Like there are some really stupid people out there if, <laughs> if, if they if they can't. And I'm, I'm talking mostly about like the, the, the chatters on Twitter and stuff and the fanboys yeah. and the people that are constantly in words like you don't know dick about this business um, and have no business talking about it at all. So I, th- I think it'll be interesting to see where this starts, but what they're going to learn is that they can make more money and so more games will come. And so I, mm-hmm. I, what I do wonder, and I want to do a podcast dedicated to it. I was thinking about inviting Jez Corden, my buddy that covers Xbox mm-hmm. onto it to talk about like what let's make like a strata of games, like what makes sense and what doesn't. Right. And because I made the claim on Sacred Symbols, much to the chagrin of many people where I'm like Helldiver's success, especially Helldiver's success being predicated mostly on PC, which is now clear. Most of the people playing the game are playing it on PC, not PS5. Um, and that to me says like day and date for PC games, obviously is what you should be pursuing in the future. Mm-hmm. And that freaks people out. And so th- I understand fanboys being freaked out about all sorts of different things, but, um, I'm, I'm mostly interested at this point in, um, how they manage this, like what the fifth game, what, what will the sixth game be? Seventh game. I don't right. think that there's this, this idea that they're leaking rumors and stuff. And maybe that happened. Maybe some people were, but I believe that all of the games that were brought up ultimately are in consideration and may already be being ported. Like I've said before, I think the new doom game will be day and date on PlayStation. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, that, I do believe that. Um, that's just, a, I don't have any information on that. I just think that that's obvious. Um, and maybe it's wrong. I don't know, but uh, games like Starfield and, and indie, you have to assume were, are really being sure. considered and Indiana Jones I want to play so but here's the thing Hogue, how do you feel about this now as because you play you play everything right on all the consoles you so me as a more religious person right uh with PlayStation they are sacred I, yes right exactly <laughs> I uh I play over there and now my stance really is and I'm not just saying this to be a dickhead or prod people is like I'll wait till it comes to PlayStation that is my answer now to all so I think that they're always they're going to have to deal with that. And that every time the game's announced, I'll be like, well, I, I assume this will come to PlayStation at some point. I mean, why wouldn't I? Master Chief yeah, I, I'm pretty agnostic. Ago. Yeah, I, I am. I have both the Xbox X and the PlayStation 5 hooked up to the same TV. It's a matter of changing the source for me. Um, so I am picking between every major release that's a third party between what I wanted on. And for the most part, it's not a it's not a pure rule, but I play multiplayer or action centric games on the Xbox, and I play single player story driven games on the PlayStation. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not perfect. It's not every time, uh, but that tends to be the direction I go because that's just what I'm used to in my head is playing multiplayer games over on Xbox. So, Hell Divers makes a lot of sense for me going that direction. But I mean, Hell Divers is is kind of a surprise hit, I think, even for Sony, oh, no uh, in how how it's been taken on. 
So I, I think we're looking at a transition point for the console fight in its entirety because Xbox is clearly trying to make their entire hey out of a game service as their platform rather than the box. And some of that is going to be a little bit uh, concerning for people that have grown up with the Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft triumvirate. Right. And I mentioned this on my channel, but one of the things I said is I think I had forgotten how long this had been the kind of tripolar status quo because I grew up in the 80s and 90s. And so we were constantly getting a a machine from Philips, a a machine from Panasonic. You know, all these various people were trying to enter into the market and play for console bucks. And they had really good ideas that never quite got adopted by some of the major players. Uh, And so I played a CDI, I played a 3DO, I played a PlayStation. I played all these various different consoles and things will be okay from a competitive landscape, even if Microsoft got out of the box market. And I don't think they have any intention of doing that. I don't think you spend a hundred billion to completely change what you're doing. Uh, But I think overall, it's going to be a time of transition and anxiety for a lot of gamers and especially ones that have bound themselves up to a specific notion of what it looks like to win in video games. That's yeah. why I think PC, it's imperative in some sense for Sony to really open their mind to PC. And mm-hmm. this is obviously already going to happen with Concord and Fair Games Day and Day. We already know that. But and I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I feel about this and I want to talk about it more in Sacred. But there's this specific chemistry now with PlayStation, like the calculus around it, where it's like, OK, console flats cumulatively or fl- console sales are flat cumulatively between all the different companies. Um, and your competitor, your primary competitor in the HD twin space is kind of declining in terms of its, if its ability to compete with you like that. I said this before and you, you touched on it, Hogue, you're one of the first people I've heard really touch on this, which is like, why does Microsoft have to be, have to be c- the competitor? It's like, oh, if, they, if Microsoft's out, no one can compete. It's like, I, right. I don't understand that. Uh, but I am curious about the success of single player games on PC, if they can do it day and date or much quicker to, cause I don't know that, I guess what I'm saying is, is I don't know that they have much to lose at this point other than, uh, I don't know if you're courting very many people from PC anymore to play your games and you kind of have your captive audience and then out captive audience will grow, but now you need to find new audiences. And this I think is shown generally speaking, we talked about this on sacred and this is even more pronounced now because of the pieces coming out from Bloomberg recently, but Sony's margins are just so thin that, they need to figure out a place to sell more games. And and mm-hmm. that's why when people say like hell divers on Xbox, I'm like, I don't think that's going to happen, but that's not that far fetched from where they should be. Right. Thinking, well, and you know? it's a two step problem, right? When you talk about business discussions inside those boardrooms, it's easy enough to say there's more money on PC, just like it's easy for the Microsoft accountants to say there's more money. If we sell them to the PlayStation audience, the fear is always the unknown, right? What does that do to our brand power? What does that do to the audience that currently buys our products? The conservative force, whatever that is, in Sony HQ is if we put them too closely day and date, we're not selling PlayStation 5s at all anymore. So what was flat is now declining. And that's a problem, maybe. Now, maybe the future of gaming is everything, everywhere, all at once. And that's just the way things look. And you and you compete with the power of your brand and the actual quality of what you're putting out there in software. Nobody really knows the answer to that, but there's always fear from a board fiduciary type of position to say, yeah, okay, we can go get 70 cents on the dollar if we sell into that ecosystem, but we might lose out on all of the 100 cents on the dollar sales we can make if we control our own ecosystem. So I think you're right. I think the future is more spread out software. I think it makes a lot of sense for a game like Helldivers, where it's kind of light on story and narrative drive and is a kind of perpetual forever game that is predicated on multiplayer enjoyment. I think it's a little bit less obvious if you're talking about like Ghost of Tsushima 2 or whatever might be coming next from PlayStation. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. This is I guess this is the secret, the 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 not secret, but the interesting part of the equation for me, which is if exclusives sell PlayStations, then why are PlayStation selling so prodigiously? Because there are no exclusives. I mean, there are there are so few exclusives that to me, it's just like it's 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 got some sort of inertia. People just want a console. PlayStation is an Apple like brand now. They want a PlayStation in their house. They want to play on PlayStation. And Mm -hmm. I know Sony, it's important for you're totally right about Helldivers where 
people have to understand that a Helldiver customer on PC is far less valuable than a Helldiver customer on PlayStation. They are only getting 70% of that money. They're not playing, paying for PlayStation Plus and they're not endemic to the space necessarily. So they're not buying other things. And so obviously you want to drive people to your console. But I think a key part of my new developing argument is if exclusive sell consoles and there are no consoles in the exclusive, or, and I'm sorry, if console sells, if exclusive sell consoles and consoles are selling prodigiously and there are few exclusives, then how do you explain that? I and, would and argue. Then, yeah. That that is essentially what you see as the kind of sequel uh, version of movies or television or whatever you want to frame it as, which is that the sins of the father are visited upon the son, or in this case, the goodness of prior PlayStation generations makes you think, okay, maybe they haven't been come out in the first four or five years of the PlayStation 5, but they're coming, and nobody has proven to me yet that I'd be able to play them when I want to play them on PC uh, if I don't get a PlayStation 5. So I get them as essentially an investment for the rest of the generation. Do I think that's wise? Is that why I would buy it? No, not necessarily. But I think that's what you're seeing is that they are cashing in some of the stuff that they've invested in their brand with the PlayStation 4, 3, 2, and 1. Mm -hmm. And if this were just a dud generation, I think you would see that visited upon the sales of the 6 and not necessarily right mm -hmm. now. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's the conversation that they're having behind closed doors is what does that look like? If we start releasing all of our stuff on PC, can we sell a six? Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, exclusives are a weird thing nowadays because I definitely still hear people about buying consoles for exclusives, you know, even though it's not like first party exclusives a lot of times now. I mean, we still got like Spider Man stuff like that, but it's been kind of dry lately, especially for this coming year. There's still a ton of third party stuff that people invest in a console for, like, I got an Xbox 360, I remember, for Tales of Vesperia. Mm -hmm. And like I never owned an Xbox console before. It's like just little things like that do add up over time. Little tiny things like now it's on PC, but I could have said like Returnal was like an awesome game or something like that. And PS5, when it came out for me, it was like Demon's Souls. Like I got to play Demon's Souls and that kind of thing. And right now you could argue that for Rebirth, right? Yeah, exactly. There's Rebirth. You know, um, we just had small like smaller games like grand blue fantasy and stuff like that were playstation only and pc but i do think colin i agree with you stuff will start going on pc eventually day and date i don't know if it'll be right out the gate though it might be like a year later or six months later i'm curious how they'll adapt that but i also think they should if they do pc they should do or everything on pc they should do a pc storefront also that links like the, how microsoft has their own but it should be if you buy it on playstation you also get it on PC. Yeah, I agree. So people can earn trophies and all that stuff. But they should also, of course, put it on Steam and all that stuff, too. They should just give you the option for that. Yeah, I, I, I think they were oh, not sorry, planning on. I think they were not planning on doing this as part of this generation. I think they mm -hmm. had some shifts in their strategy. Yeah. So I do think Sony can get to that place where they've got it essentially more thought out in the in the generational transition in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree with you, Brad, that all of this could be more streamlined. You could get more value as a customer without breaking these companies apart. Um, you see that with things like streaming movies or, or not even streaming movies, but purchased movies on a digital environment that come in the DVD or Blu-ray case. You can get into these positions where you can maximize your value as a company, still justify yourself to the accountants and give the consumer more power. Yeah. All right. Um, we're going to read some writing questions real quick before we do. If you sure. enjoy the show, any of our shows, please check us out on patreon.com slash Media. We greatly appreciate your support. $5 a month gets you access to this show early, ad-free versions of our other shows, all that good stuff. Before we get into it, Hogue, also, you have a YouTube channel you brought up. What I do have a know? channel, yes. What's people know where they can slash Hogue Law. We generally talk about the law and business of popular culture, movies, music, and most predominantly, video games. So we did talk a lot about the Microsoft acquisitions and the disputes with the regulatory authorities across the world. We'll probably be talking about the Call of Duty lawsuit, I mm -hmm. think, in the near future. I've been away from the office, as you heard at the top of this episode, uh, so I haven't prepped anything. But there are a couple of business items that have come up. Strangely, when I started the channel, I was a little concerned that there wouldn't be enough business and law to talk about with respect to gaming and media. That has not proven to be a problem. Yeah. So if you're lot, interested yeah. in any of that, come on by. We're talking about that all the time. You can also follow me on Twitter slash X at Hoaglaw, where I'm talking about that and a lot about my Michigan Wolverines. So if you can <laughs> Congratulations. put up with that. Oh, yes. National champions. It only took 25 years. 
that and the lions in the going deep is uh interesting you know i was really uh, rooting for the that, lions man i really was that super bowl was right there but yep. the, the niners earned it yeah so yeah it's a it's a very interesting time to be a michigan fan i guess sports fan for you southeast michigan has the the wolverines the lions and the wolverines are going through a period of transition because harbaugh just left and took half the staff with him uh good luck to the chargers uh but yeah, it's it's wild over here. The rest of our teams are absolutely terrible at most of the sports that they play. So, yeah, the Tigers, no good. The Pistons, no good. The Red Wings are better, but still mm. on the on the back end of the, not being great. Weren't the Pistons on, like, some losing streak this year? Was it the Pistons that were, like, the Pistons, two and I think, were the first one. NBA team. The, I think yeah. the Pistons were the first NBA team to not win a game in a calendar month. And if you know how, how often they play NBA basketball, that's really incredible. That's so interesting. <laughs> Damn, that's brutal. Jeez. They're not good at basketball, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's start off with a question. Nathan Densley wrote in, Hello, Brad. Glad to see you are teaming up with both Law and Order this week. I was wondering <laughs> if the great lawman, Hogue, could give us an update on his health. He gave us a scare, but I'm sure glad he's still with us. Love the new show. I really appreciate that. Yes, I am happy to. I... For those that don't know, I had a stroke on December 30th, 2022, which seems like it's both yesterday and about 50 years ago. Uh, and I was recovering physically, doing physical therapy and occupational therapy all last year. And right now, I am primarily working through mental aspects of post-stroke, uh, specifically post-stroke anxiety, which I haven't had to deal with as a human being before. So that's interesting. I joked with my wife and I said, is this how you feel all the time about <laughs> certain of these things? Uh, and it's it's been a trip to get through. It is one of those things where I'm very happy that I was able to do stroke videos on the channel. Uh, my community was able to put together a, a lot of money in a fundraiser to get a new machine for my rehabilitation hospital. So they have a new they have a new device. It's essentially a video game, which I thought was pretty apt, what they wound up buying, where you stand in front of it and they've got like lights on your peripheral vision that you have to press with both arms, depending on what color they are, hmm. and just really great stuff for rehabilitation. So overall, I'm very happy that I've gotten a chance to talk about these things in survivor groups and videos and other formats. And I think you'll see me in a couple of other places talking about those things. I'm not perfect yet. I know a lot of people come and say, uh, you look like you used to look, or I can't tell that you had a stroke, that kind of thing. And that's very nice. I always appreciate that from everybody, but still working through some things, probably will for the rest of my life. Uh, but I am happy to be here. My meds work. I remember to take them. So that's all working out well. And I appreciate everybody that is worried about me. I'm, I'm going to be here longer than you would like, probably. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear, Hug. I'm glad you're recovering. Glad you're still with us. Gotta I don't recommend that. it. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. You'd probably stay away from that if possible. But uh, yeah, I need that that insight from you still around because you are a smart man and I do like hearing what your thoughts on things. Well, thank you for saying so. I, I like talking about these things. Yeah, uh, we got to write in. This is this must be a sacred symbols listener. This is from Chip Skylark. When is enough enough? I don't think in my 27 year existence that I've ever gotten to the point where there is no longer any defecate on my toilet paper before my ass starts bleeding. <laughs> Am I doing this wrong? Thanks. Uh, wow. Yes. That is a sacred you, crossover, huh? Yeah. You must that be doing unexpected. something Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's leave, let's stay in our own lanes. Um, <laughs> and hey. le leave the subject matter to the appropriate show. <laughs> <laughs> no, bring it in. I want more chaotic emails like this. <laughs> Because be careful what you ask for, I guess is well, what I'm saying. <laughs> yes. Some of the sacred stories are a little insane. We don't need that much, but this is pretty harmless, I guess. Yeah, no, it's no big deal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they do make good clip shows. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, maybe you're wiping really hard. You might be an aggressive wiper or something. Mm. I don't know what your deal is. You got to mm. be gentle or something there. We got to use That's good right. toilet paper, too. I, yeah. yeah. Or get a bidet or something. I don't know. You need help. No. Just. Don't get a bidet. Why you Being kind to yourself European. is important. <laughs> you don't want a clean butthole, Colin? I clean my butthole just fine without a bidet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you wipe and you use a wet wipe or you take a yeah, shower, whatever the case might be. Wipe. We fought yeah. a revolution to yeah. unshackle that's ourselves true. from all things European. 
That's true. And yeah. uh, I definitely don't need that water fountain going into my butt. <laughs> I just don't know. Well, I, I know a lot of people in the West swear by it now. I know, you know, our very own Dustin yeah. is, a, is a, is a, he swears he by is, it. But yeah. when I would go to Europe or Japan and they, these things would be out there, I'd be like, I'm not doing this. You know, I just, just let me do it the way I do it. You know, and then we'll be all set. Yeah, no one's stopping you, Colin. But That's true. You I mean, mean no your one... your ass isn't bleeding, you know, when you're wiping it. So no, 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 no. Um, I was going to say something, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to follow up with a joke, but uh, I'm just not going to say it. It's not the time. It's not the place for it. It's not the show. And the last thing is from DMDO. Are there any conspiracy theories you generally believe? I'm going to say JFK, hundred percent government, dude. Yeah, taken out the CIA. CIA, hundred percent. No one needs to answer this, by the way. If you don't want to. Oh my god, <laughs> Colin. I know you got lots of crazy shit, like aliens and all that stuff. I believe in you almost every conspiracy? conspiracy theory at this point. Yeah. The government lies about everything, so yeah, that's and the true. media lies about everything. Like, how, think about all the thing, all the lies of just the last five years. Yeah, and then compound that out throughout time. And like almost everything that the the media, especially, says is wrong. It's a lie. So. I believe more in conspiracies now than I ever did because I think, well, the, the UAP thing is one thing because it's clear something deep is going on there and interesting. So if they were able to hide that and obfuscate that and even successfully make it so like, oh, look at these fucking idiots with their aliens. Oh, they got big eyes. I mean, he went through a Roswell crash. And you know, like all this stuff is real. If that's if that's true, then I, I believe almost they, they lie about almost almost anything at all. There was I was listening to something. Uh, I like Eric Weinstein. Mm-hmm. The, um, the, he's a mathematician, but he, he does a lot of philosophy and physics and science or whatever. Um, and he was saying he's well connected and he's like, people have to understand that there are still organizations, groups and everything that you cannot Google, like power centers that you would never understand exist, that people do keep generational secrets. And so, you know, do you know what's funny yeah. on that for me is that. I started doing my channel and I was talking about business and, and these companies and everything else. And I got invited to do um, some consulting for some financial firms. And I, you have an email online. I think you both do. So you, you know this, but you get all these solicitations. You get all these random emails all the time. So you're going through them real quick. I get the solicitation to go visit a website and and put in this ID no, number to be a possible consultant on these various financial things. And it's a website that is literally just a rectangle with the ID number prompt uh, that takes you to a different page that is like not, it doesn't even have an address that you could possibly, it's just like a random set of letters that is legitimate. Like this is a real company that's really giving financial advice and consulting for these various partners. And I, I said to my wife when I put this stuff in that I felt like I was in like a Mission Impossible or I was Ethan Hunt or something. So like that is out there. As for conspiracy theories, I did want to say, I think it's a little bit more complex of an answer because I'm a lawyer and that's all I can give. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I don't believe realistically in big, large groups of people being able to have big lies and keep them uh, very well uh, for long periods of time. So if that's your only definition of conspiracy, I don't really believe that those exist so much. I do believe that if there's an... uh, a single point of information or even a small point of information covered by a number of people separately that a group like that, whether it's journalists or influencers or anything else that has the only access point for that information can keep something quiet or otherwise bend it to their will, frame it in such a way that they want you to think about it. I do think that kind of thing can happen. I think we have seen that in the media in the way that we look at things like content curation through the social media platforms uh, I think that can happen, but I don't really believe in the Illuminati guild covering mm. things up or, or faking the moon landing or that kind of thing. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I, I don't, uh, the moon landing one always gets me just because you can look at the moon and see the evidence um, with powerful <laughs> telescopes. So that's it's a little crazy at this point. Right. But like you can see, it's like, oh, there's the rover that was abandoned. There are the tire tracks that lead to the rover. It's going to be like that yeah. for actually there's this whole thing. I don't know if you guys have heard this, like where when we go back to the moon and when we start being more spacefaring about how we might keep like historically enshrine these places to be able to be visited and like kept that way. And imagine in like a hundred years, you can go to the site of Apollo 12 or, or not 12, 11 um, and so on and so forth. So I, 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 but I agree with you generally speaking, it's 
what the thing about the UAP conspiracies, which are so interesting to me, is that it seems like almost no one's in on it. And that's part of the problem because they can't figure anything out if they have all these things like there's so few people read into these things or whatever. And that's maybe one of the theories about why they want to go a little wider to get like smarter people involved. I will say, I think that there are truly evil people in the government and sure. um, and in corporations and all over the place. I, saying, so, I wouldn't limit that to the government. I think any yeah. institution of any power can attract certain personalities that would like to exert their power in certain ways. Yeah. And without getting too political, I think we've seen that a lot in the last five to 10 years. So I just, uh, I, I went and saw my, um, my nephew Finley, he's in ninth grade. He was, he's, he's like, he's always in plays. He's like a stage kid. And he was yeah. in the 1992 Disney play Newsies. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that or no. Oh, yeah, I've all. heard of that. Oh yeah. 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 And one of the interesting kind of pieces of that story, and I was thinking about it through a modern lens there in high school. So they're not really thinking about it like this or whatever. I was like, it's so interesting. It's about how, especially it was 1899, I think when it, when the Newsies takes place, but how like information just I think the guy like the newspaper guy says at some point, like the the news only exists if we print it. Like if, if we don't say it, like it didn't happen, basically. And mm-hmm. we are in a period now where that can't be true anymore. And I think that the powers that be don't know what to do about that. And mm-hmm. so I think that lies are becoming more easily dissected. And, you know, things are true about issues much quicker than you otherwise would have. Well, like, for I think instance, it has COVID's a, origins. I, I think <laughs> it has a weird follow on effect, <laughs> which is that to the extent that you can have a competing source, whether it's YouTube or Twitter or somewhere else, uh, that the person that is trying to frame it in a different way has to get more outlandish with their position slash lie, depending on how you want to frame that. And I see that a lot because I helped a friend in what we colloquially call law tube talk about the Depp v. Heard trial, right? And you see the Vice documentary, you see these various other things happen where it's, oh, those those YouTube coverage people were, were baying for Amber Heard's blood and all these various things. It's like, I participated in those streams every day for the entire trial. And I, right up until the end, I'm like, no, it's a very hard case to win. We have to listen to all the evidence and these various things. And like, they will just straight up lie about what happened that day mm-hmm. in court. Mm -hmm. Uh, And one of the reasons that Hangouts and Headlines, which is another of my shows, exists is because I would come in at the end of the trial coverage of the Depp v. Heard and I would bring up the the New York Times headline or the New York Post headline and I would discuss it with the audience and say, look, we watched this testimony. Do you think this is a paragraph that describes what we saw? And that's how that entire show exists. Now, I think there are good people in the media and I think that there are journalists over their heads with what they're covering, certainly with things like business and math and shareholdings and and industry like that. And I try to help as much as I can. You'll see me quoted from time to time because I want to get more and better information out there. But I do think that that is 100% happening, Colin, where you have folks that try to frame specific issues in the way they want them to be seen. The news is what I say it is. And that's become a bigger problem for them. And you see that kind of lashing out essentially at YouTubers and influencers or TikTokers or whatever you want to frame it as, as idiots and not worthy of uh, your time and attention because they represent a threat to the status quo there. Yeah, and I, I mean, you're mm-hmm. totally right. I, it's very well said just in the sense of th- there's a um, there's this whole developing world. Like Even if you think about video game magazines in the 90s, let's say. If you didn't play ball, you didn't get access and you were done. And that whole right. that whole notion in any era, like that's what Consumer Reports was so big. That's why Consumer Reports was like such a big deal to people in the 70s and 80s and 90s or whatever, because they would be like, we, we just secret shop and just review things straight up. And like, no one knows it's going to happen. We go literally go buy a car and all that. But like, generally speaking, now we're in an era 10, 15 years now where there's just no control anymore and it's freaking them out. And I think lies are becoming disassembled much more quickly than ever. And um, yeah, you're totally right. Like, I don't want to get into politics, but it's just, it, it, it just <laughs> you just hear it all the time. Like, like it's like lying, believe, you know, trust your lying eyes or don't, I guess. It's why, oh, you'll appreciate this, appreciate this. I said this on Sacred. When all this financial stuff comes out every quarter, I go read it. I don't give a fuck what anyone says about it. Like I go read this, their release. I listen or what or read the transcript of the earnings call and get all the information out of that and nowhere else. 
because it's all always through some weird lens. Mm. And yeah, no, I, I try to use as much primary yeah. source material as I can, both because I don't trust myself to tell you exactly what's happening, but also because I don't want to be the final arbiter of how you think about something. And I think that's the best way to go about it. I think critical thinking, critical reading, and people being informed by themselves is still the best bulwark against a, a low trust kind of system. And unfortunately, we're currently living through an era where you don't have a lot of trust in the institutions, and, and justifiably so. People don't know where the truth is coming from. And so I always recommend source material. The problem there is literacy, right? Mm -hmm. Folks can read financial statements and see the numbers, but they don't necessarily know what they're looking at. And then you get into these Twitter fights and mobs and things like that. And I, I want to help if I can. And I think that's great work that people do that, that spend their time trying to explain these things um, with a non or at least less editorial lens. I think all of us are human beings. We're all going to have the way that we see things and we're all going to editorialize a little bit. But the more that we can highlight that for people and say, you know, this is where we're speculating, this is where we're editorializing, the better they're going to be able to find their own tr answers and the truth of the reality of the situation. I also think to that point that introducing fallacies and weaknesses to your own argument only strengthens your your um, reputation to tell the truth. Like, we talked about it deeply with Sony. It's funny seeing it all reported now because when I was reading through the documents, I was like, oh, Sony's margins are really low. And and I was looking at the Tokyo Exchange and everything and I'm like things aren't looking good here. You have to, I think, be honest and poke holes in your own arguments in some sense to, to gain people's trust so that they know that you're just trying to examine mm -hmm. the information as it exists. But I think that a lot of that doesn't happen. Do we saw that with them? Um, it really bothered me actually that Ubisoft interview from a few weeks ago, it might've been a month or so ago where the guy was talking about, or was in quotes talking about how people need to get comfortable with not owning their games. Do you guys remember that? And yes. I went in and I read that, that and that was, and that was never said, like he never said yeah. that he, it, he was asked about in a hypothetical where this, where Ubisoft plus became like the way people played, what would have to happen for that to occur? Mm -hmm. And he answers that way. And then people just circulate it like that. And I'm like, there's just no way he said that. And I went back and looked and lo and behold, he didn't. And that shit happens all the time, all the yeah. time. I, I, I don't really does. want, I don't want people to ever come to sacred or any of our stuff and get that sort of information. Like it's so flagrantly wrong that right. it's, it's, just, it's the same thing that happened with, um, Hiroki Totoki literature club when he mm -hmm. was, um, mm -hmm. when he was giving his, he was saying during the earnings call, like, we're not going to have any big exclusive tentpole like franchise games through the next fiscal year. And everyone's like, no games for PlayStation. It's like, that's not, that's not what he said. Like you might have a, you might have some sort of angle or be mad or be a fanboy or whatever, but that's definitely not what he said. What he said is that he, he literally said God of War and Spider-Man sales. And then he said, we have nothing like this coming in the next fiscal year. He didn't say anything else. Right. So people are just constantly editorializing. And that's why I just don't trust a fucking thing. Anyone says um in any of these news media certainly in our space but god it's worse in other places too and it's like this in tech it's like this everywhere finance mm -hmm. it's like this in real estate so much bullshit you know it sucks yeah it is i mean that's the reason i like to talk about these things on video games both because it's a hobby that i obviously enjoy but also because the stakes as they are in the reality of the world are low right whether sony or microsoft wins the console war whether this video game sells this much or not are low compared to where you see these kinds of things happening in other contexts, in other news categories, when you, when you flip to politics or international news or anything else. So, I mean, I, I would love it if people didn't just take whatever the tweet says as the sacrosanct truth, because there is an incentive to engagement farm. There is an incentive to take a quote out of context and make it the most absurd version of itself in order to get you to click and see whether he really said that. Mm -hmm. or not right and I, I unfortunately i see that happening a lot that that really was one of the impetuses behind my starting my channel was seeing some misreporting about acquisitions and and bankruptcy and filings and what an sec filing says and doesn't say and that kind of thing and i, I thought i could help and i i keep trying to sometimes it feels like you're fighting upstream with with folks that know the truth or or know that there's more to it than this, but they still want the clicks or the articles. And I really do like media and I like journalists in general. A lot of them are my friends, but it does bug me when they go for the clicks anyway. Right. Totally fair. 
All right, dudes. Let's talk about some yeah. video games, man. I don't know how we got talking about that. I don't video remember. Games. But, it's yeah. exciting. Let's I like talking game. about all sorts of yeah, games. Yeah, yeah, I'm just letting you guys go, man. <laughs> it's totally cool. Yeah, fascinating stuff. But we're here to talk about video games primarily. We're going to start off with Colin. Banishers, Ghost of New Eden. Yeah. Uh, don't nod, correct? Don't nod, that's right. They, uh, yeah. dude, I don't know how they get so many games out so quickly. Yeah, they have They're multiple teams now, out. I think. Yeah, they have yeah. multiple studios now, I think. Um, it is interesting because I, I bring this up on Sacred somewhat often because I think it's such a fascinating piece of knowledge is that Don't Nod's original game, Remember Me. I don't know if you guys yes. played that game. No. I, yeah. I, I did. I platinumed it back in the day. I thought it was really good. That was supposed to be a PlayStation exclusive and like a third party PlayStation exclusive that Sony walked away from and mm. Capcom came in and f- helped them finish it and publish it. And I thought it was pretty good, but it sets the predicate for what I think Don't Not is, which is this very interesting two lane studio. Obviously, Life is Strange and all of those kinds of things, more Quantic Dream style, super massive style adventure gaming, mm-hmm. choice based gaming. And then they have this kind of action arc with beginning with Remember Me, it goes into like Vampire, and then you end up in it with a game like this. And um, I really like this game. I think this okay. game is really, really great. And by the way, Another interesting note, I think this will be the last game ever published by Focus Entertainment before they become Pull Up, which is the worst rename ever. So if you if you like your as remind me of diapers, it's what everyone says. But it's it's a it's a what do they call when it's a a word can be the same one way or the other? There's a word for that. I can't remember, but that's what it is. And that's like what the logo is. It's a capital P palindrome. That's exactly right. It's a capital P and a capital P on either side with a ULLU in the middle. And they're trying to get cute. But Mm -hmm. I was like, focus is a great name. I don't know why you would change that. But um, so just a little piece of interesting gaming knowledge. That'll probably be their last game under that label. Um, This was supposed to come out last fall. It's been done for like six months. And part of me feels like they should have just released it last year. I actually think that they might have hurt it by even holding it until now it seems like an even worse time to release the game in some sense i don't um it might have not been ready technically though maybe what is a technical mess at the point and they're seeing all these games come out like jedi survivor getting well it was slated for like october wasn't it i mean it right was, but yeah. then they release a statement Alan specific Wake. right they oh, said was they released a statement they re- i think their statement specifically said like we want to kind of give deference to these other games and we don't think we can compete oh, here okay. in so many words i'm pretty that. sure that's what happened yeah, well, then, my yes, recollection I'm, was that statement was, uh, I think I framed that as honest, which was, this is not a good release window for us. We think we'll be wasting our sales and we're going to move out of here. Mm-hmm. We're going to so, get out of Dodge. Right. So that's why I was saying the game has been done. Um, okay. they, they, I'm sure they hope to polish it. They're working on another game called The Lost Records. So I think they probably moved a lot of the team over there and I'm sure they have unannounced things too. But mm-hmm. into the game itself, um, it takes place in New England in the late t- 17th century specifically in Massachusetts, the colony of Massachusetts Bay and in a fictional place called New Eden. And two characters, your protagonists come over from Europe. We don't really know very much about them. It's a guy named Red McGrath, who's a Scottish banisher, like a ghost hunter, and his wife, um, Antia Duarte. And I'm not entirely sure where they say she's from. Um, I don't know if they have said yet, because you kind of get more about her family as time goes on. Mm-hmm. Now, how spoiler are we going to get in in this? Um, I mean, don't spoil the plot. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not going to talk about just don't spoil like the plot. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not very far in the game. So yeah, go ahead. Good. I can tell you from the trailers that one of them is dead or dies. Mm -hmm. And it's it's, yeah, we know that the woman. Yep. The woman dies. Okay. So, okay. So, yeah, I won't. I I can get into that at least. So, yeah, kind of the crux of the of the game. And this is one of the things that I think is really cool about the game is that Mike and I were talking about this and how much we love this is I love when it's kind of like the exorcist or something. You have the real world as it's constituted and everything's the same, except there's supernaturalism. And some mm-hmm. people take it for great. Like, so exorcism is about the skepticism around that. This is a more in the line of like, everyone understands that like there, you know, it's the world where we're fighting the French fucking hate the Huguen, you know, the Huguenots and all sorts of random shit. The Puritans are coming over here and all the rest. And all that's happening, but and Boston's being established and Virginia's being established and all the rest. But there's like ghosts and goblins and shit like that. I really like so people know I, I studied American history when I went to Northeastern and that was supposed to be my arc in life. 
before I got involved in the gaming industry and that I was going to become like a, a hist- I wanted to be, I always said I wanted to be an armchair historian. That's like what I wanted to be. It made no sense. It was, I'd probably be working as an adjunct professor right now for like $40,000 a year. So I'm glad that I got away from that. But um, for me, I love the idea of the unmolested American continent being found by Europeans and them finding so that being real, but them finding something supernatural and strange about this place. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what the story seems to be about is that they've encountered something that they didn't know existed here that they necessarily didn't have to deal with in the old world and how it subsumes this colony of New Eden or this town within the colony of Massachusetts of New Eden and basically spreads them out to the wilds like there's this there's this haunting and all this crazy shit happening in the town so that when you arrive there only a few people are left and everyone's like kind of strewn to the wind and the entire idea is to like figure it out and like go find people and talk to them and this game is very much like it feels a lot like la noir actually it's not Mm. very action oriented in fact i think the action's a little sloppy and janky yes i expected that not to be mean to, but to, don't nod but i feel like most of their games are like that combat wise right it's it's not the tightest game it's not god of war or something like that but you don't fight very often in it and it's not really what it's about instead what you're doing and this is where, where the game gets fascinating so ho you said it at some point in early in the game the wife dies and because ghosts are real basically the entire thing is that ghosts that are unsettled in life are haunting individual people for reasons and they have to go banish these people and the wife herself can be banished but here's the interesting part about the game and why i think the game really succeeds in some way is that this reminds me a little bit as i said on sacred of fallout new vegas fallout new vegas had these choices in the game and i won't spoil it and i don't even remember very much of it piece by piece anyway but there are choices in the game where you think you're doing the right thing but you're not or Mm -hmm. where things are so gray where you're not really sure what's even happening or what you should do and this game is full of that so Basically, there are two fundamental, there are two good paths and two bad paths, and you have to choose a good and a bad path and a good and a bad path, basically, is the way. It, so I'm playing the game in an almost renegade-like way. My, I want to revive my wife. The other option is to just banish her, and this all happens apparently at the end of the game. I'm not anywhere close there. But if you want to save her, it's almost like Bioshock where you, you, know, you would harvest little sisters. You have to harvest, basically, human beings, take their spirits and give them to your wife to survive. And... This solves the various problems you encounter, but in kind of a negative way. So you encounter like a character and you solve the haunting, but but she did or he did something fundamentally dishonest or they killed someone in real life, whatever. And he goes and he'll banish them instead and take the spirit. The ghost is now dispatched. So the problem is solved, but that person's dead and the spirit is given to the to the wife. So in other words, you could dispatch the ghost and help the person, but it hurts your wife. If you kill the person, it helps your wife. And so you have to decide, like, if you're playing as the husband or the banisher. And I'm playing more as, like, the husband. And it's pretty cool. Okay. Uh, I like that to do the right thing by your... It's kind of like The Last of Us, where you, you'll you do anything for the person you love. But to, this makes it so explicit, as opposed to in between the lines. It's like, well, now the virus is going to proliferate in The Last of Us, whatever, and we could add a cure or whatever. And here it's it's like all of these people didn't deserve to die necessarily, but you are just going to selfishly solve their haunting problem by killing a bunch of them and then saving your wife ultimately. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's so you go to these different people. I'll give a couple of examples. I know these are very early in the game, so they're spoilers technically, I guess, but it's very early. It's very early in the game. Mm -hmm. I'm only, I think it said I've done like 10% of it or something like that because I've been held out. Um, (laughs) But so you find a a woman and she has this husband who is a um, a blacksmith and he's making like all of this metal for the colony. But the metals of like this horrible quality and you go and investigate his workshop and you find like seawater, like this ghastly seawater remnants and all this kind of stuff. And you find that the blacksmithing is like of a very poor quality, like the nails are fucked up. You find all these letters saying like, what is wrong with you? Like, why can't you do this right or whatever? And basically you find out that the wife on the transit from Europe to the new world, like the the husband was killed and like thrown in the ocean. This guy took the, the, um, and he was like really abusive to her or whatever. This guy that she knows took his kind of identity, treats her really well, but can't smith. 
And so you have to like solve this problem somehow by dispatching and banishing the ghost and helping the woman. Another one is like there's a French spy who you find speaking French to her ghost friend, like her ghost companion in, a, in the woods. And she's a Huguenot and all this kind of stuff. And it's about like her loyalty to the, the French crown and all. That's very cool, man. It's a pretty mm. dynamic game. There's a lot of chatter in it. A surprising amount, a surprising amount of it. Like people, it's not like the fallout, like camera focuses in on the face, you know, like kind of thing, <laughs> yeah. which is cool, but that's very old. This is like, yeah. everything's animated, lots of voice acting, cool. lots of personality, people reacting in really negative or positive ways to you. Um, pretty cool undertones, obviously religious undertones, colonialist undertones, nationalist undertones, but about sacrifice and humanity and love as well. The mm-hmm. UI is really clean. I really love the menu UI in the game. The way that they, there's like this really cool way that they show all the different cases. So this is like where it gets like LA Noir and like who you know and what you know. It's just all, but I will say the game chugs in performance mode on PS5. There are times where it's really dropping. I, I saw this, I think, I think um, Digital Foundry might have noticed this. I think it runs better on Xbox as I understand. So you might want to play it over there if you have the option. And one of the cool things, the fighting isn't tight, really, but the cool thing is you switch between the two characters in, a, in action. And basically, yeah. you use the ghost as kind of like your first line of defense. And when she gets kind of pummeled, she'll like retreat and recover. And then you can fight as the human. And that's where there's like real consequence in life or death because she's already dead, basically. So when you're in combat with her, you said she's kind of like the first line of defense. What does she do? Is she punching as a ghost? Is she like punching other people or stuff like that? She literally does punch. Yeah, she. Okay. So you use triangle to switch between them. And she has like these fast moving, but light punches, basically, and, and some okay. different magic moves. You also need to use her as you explore because she has options. She can see things in the environment you can't. So she can she'll there are like piles of dead bodies. And if you like use her, she'll be able to like lift the curse about them and you can fight them and then you get upgrades and all this kind of stuff. So there's you, you switch between them outside of combat too. But yeah, within combat, what I learned over time is, Oh, you should just use her until she's like pummeled to death and then she'll go recover. And it's kind of like Marvel versus Capcom or something. And then, you know, like you'll switch out the character. She'll be kind of recovering in the background. You go and fight and then you use your own health healing items to keep him alive because he's still alive or whatever. So what is he doing? His sword. Yeah. He has like a, he has like a saber. He, okay. You get a you. I didn't know this because I just got it last night. But you get a gun, and there's okay. a, you get a, like a one shot rifle. I mean, this is sixteen ninety eight. I think. Yeah. But what's f- it's fucking hysterical. I mean, this is like Evil West shit in some sense, which is a, I love Evil West. It's a great game. But I was I, I, Micah and I were she was watching me play, and I'm like, I wonder what the reload time is on this because I was I was telling her I'm like in the sixteen nineties, you would, I mean, a person who was like a, a a marksman would take no fewer than thirty seconds to reload this gun. So mm-hmm. I wanted to see like how you have to powder it and like fucking bash it down and get the paper in it and wrap the paper in the ball. It's like, and you might have these things ready, but it's still going to take a lot of time. I mean, by the time you got to the civil war with more sophisticated weapons, it was still taking 15, 20 seconds to reload your gun. He take it's fucking hysterical. You guys should look up the animation. He takes the gun and does this with it basically <laughs> like an, an animation. And it just like reloads it takes probably like That's three funny. seconds. It's very funny. Yeah. So it, it, awesome. it doesn't take itself too seriously because I was really curious. I'm like, wow, I wonder if he has to like take a knee. Maybe if it was only going to take five or 10 seconds, but like take a knee yeah. and do all this kind of stuff. The gun's not very powerful anyway, but it does allow the game in these combat arenas to place enemies around areas that you can no long- that you can't get. So you can just kind of pop them off or whatever. So there is a gun. There might be more. But yeah, he uses a saber. She uses her fist. And then they have a series of spells. There's upgrades and equipment that you can upgrade and charms and relics and all sorts of shit like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, tell me about the structure of the game. Is it more open world or is it kind of big zones you're going through that are connected? How's it all laid out like that? It, it does seem like it's one connected open world, but there are a lot of uncharted crawling spaces, you know, okay. when you get tight. And so I think that's how they, that's how they connect them. So it's not like tales or something where there's like a literal load screen but you can tell the game is loading things in the background at all times. But it's one. Mm-hmm. This is one of the things I wrote in my notes that I wanted to really compliment the game on is I love big open worlds if they can justify themselves. But I mm-hmm. much prefer small open worlds like this. And it's basically the town of New Eden and the woods around it and like various things that are going on. And it feels manageable. And it's not truly open because it's not not every piece of terrain can be if you look at the map, it's paths through terrain yeah. and some big open. So it's not like fallout 
or something where you can go to like to the to the zero zero fucking nexus in the upper left corner all the way down to the other side and you can't do that you have to stay on the path or whatever but it's it's open enough where it feels manageable and it feels like you've been dispatched realistically to go deal with a single singular problem as opposed to the fallout leaving the vault, which again is its own level of cool, but like no, got to go find your father. No idea what the hell's going on. And your hundred hour adventure awaits. I don't think that that's what's waiting for me in this game. And the only reason I haven't played it more is because of just because I've been playing so much hell divers when mm-hmm. I can, because it doesn't always work, but there's a Did lot you? to like about this game. I'd, I'd really, I don't feel like it's doing well. Um, I was a big mark last year for Immortals of Avium, as people know, and that game mm-hmm. got way worse scores than this game got from critics. So it's not that I just I don't know if this was a, this is a very Halloween game and yeah. it's missing something being released here. It's very it reminds me of Until Dawn in 2015, where it's like, why didn't you just hold this, mm. you know, and release this in the fall? Like, it doesn't even make yeah. any sense, really. And that's what they, I think they're going to try to do with Until Dawn this year, ironically, with the remake on PS5. But this this is a game really worth checking out. This is the this game represents the affordable middle space that we need to explore. And I, I used Robocop in as an ex- example last year, which I thought was really good. And um, I loved Robocop. Yeah, I thought it was just exactly what I what, exactly what I thought it was, especially on the back of having just watched the film again. It's like this is perfect. And I think Dead Island 2 is an, actually another good example. It's not mm-hmm. a great game, but it's it's like this is a realistic size, a realistic scope, a realistic production value and so on and so forth. I think that you're going to find a lot to like about this game. This along with games from Remedy and others, this this represents a this is not as good as a Remedy game, but it represents a a, a way forward, not the way mm-hmm. forward or not a new way forward, but a way forward. I'm sure that if this game sells a million copies, they'd probably be fine. Um, I, whether or not it does or not, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, they're not publishing it, so they don't have to worry about that, I guess, but right. So yeah, well, that's bad. No, I hope to it highly recommended. I'm sorry. Hope. No, not at all. I, I say, I was saying, I hope that it does do well. I like to see these middle range games do well. I have it already downloaded. I haven't played it yet, unfortunately, cause I was away. Uh, but I'm glad to hear it's good. I, I thought it was funny that you talked about it being a little janky in terms of combat or mechanics and that Brad said that was what he was expecting. Cause it, I think it's what I was expecting too, right? The remember me's and the vampires of the world you go to because they have some cool little bits of story and some interesting thoughts in terms of their mm-hmm. mechanics and how they're put together, but you don't go there for uh, really on the nose action gameplay. They don't, they don't hit that mark so well. Right. Um, but, but I'm looking forward to this game. And I was going to ask you, Colin, did you play a game called Greedfall a couple of years back? No, I bought it, but I didn't. That, that's that's like a colonial island or something, right? Or like some, it's like a colonial well, they, game. They arrive in the new world. Oh, but okay, it's, okay. It's, it's a game that I really, really liked. I think it's Spider's Best. And, and they're another company that kind of is maybe a little bit less mechanically inclined than some of the really, really big publishers, but has some good ideas. So you recommend that? Uh, I'm going to write that down. Yeah, I do. I I did a video on it a couple years back about how I think it was one of my top 10 games of that year uh, that they have a lot of interesting thoughts. They have that kind of vibe that you mentioned that you liked of the old world coming to the new world and finding dragons. Yeah, and and that's good. That's good shit, right? Like there's there's something I'm really interested. (laughs) I watch all sorts of weird shit on YouTube. There's this really wonderful YouTube channel. It's called like New England Forests and Wildlife or something. I have no idea what it is. But it's like this guy is like Forrester or whatever. And he he like goes out and it's all these documentaries about the woods in New England and old growth forests and all of that. And you have to be constantly reminded. It's like this place was totally wooded when they found it to the point where most of the woods in New England are regrowth from when all of the woods were clear cut and then they didn't need those farms anymore because everyone moved west and everything grew again so even the woods that people live in in new england are not the same woods like they're they're new growth woods and it's just interesting to think about a place so ancient dagan and i always think talk about long island being haunted which a lot of people think it is and oh there's like indian burial grounds and all sorts of weird shit going on over there and we always make fun of the story of bobby flay the celebrity chef how he built a Mm -hmm. house he's from long island and he built a house like out in the hamptons and they found this like iroquois burial ground or something there and he was like, ah, fuck it. Just do it. Any-. Like, like, just like build over it anyway. And I'm like, this is how you get hauntings, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I love the idea, uh, like you said, of a disconnect, especially if you believe, and I don't really know what I believe with Graham, Han- Graham Hancock, but let's assume 
that maybe human history, organized, civilized, civilized human history goes back further. It's even more interesting to think about this place having been found before that, not by the Vikings or the Phoenicians, but in some other unique way, not the Chinese in California in the 1450s, wherever the hell that book was that I read when I was in high school, how the Chinese found America. Um, so yeah, you're told. I, I wrote this down because I, I bought Greedfall, I think, for pretty cheap during a sale because I heard it was pretty, yeah. it looks pretty good. So coming from you, I'm going to definitely add that to higher to the queue because and there's a sequel right coming out or already out Greedfall 2 is announced um yeah i mean I, the, spiders if you don't know is kind of that even lower range than don't nod of games but they reach for the stars they go for like a full bioware experience they've been aimed at that for a long time and greedfall is the closest they've gotten and i really enjoy that game it's you'll you'll see the budget there in some places the small arenas the, the limited number of enemy types, that kind of thing. But the story overall is well thought of. The world building is. And I think just based on what you said about Banishers, that you will like it. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, Ryan Gerson wrote in, Howdy, boys. I've been digging into Banishers this past week, and it reinforces my belief that the best kind of open world experiences truly exist as roughly 3D Metroidvanias. Think God of War 2018 slash Ragnarok, Control, and the Respawn Jedi games. Banisher slowly opens its fairly large world to you, but allows you to go back with new powers and explore. Its side content is deliberate. Its secrets are considered. I personally feel this style of open world game design is truly the best of all the elements. What do you guys think? How do you guys, or how do games with this approach to design, especially with 3D, strike you? Why don't we see more of this? Thanks for all you do, and a wonderful addition to LSM, Miss Charles. Well, thank you. So, boys. How do you feel about this kind of design of open world? Do you guys prefer it over more types? Let's say Skyrim, Zelda, or like Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom style? I think there are good game designs that can work with all sorts of different types of worlds. Uh, Zelda, being able to climb anything and go anywhere, has a different approach to what you're actually experiencing moment to moment than something that is more curated and has the the crevice crawling dialogue between two parties that uh, I think Colin described with banishers. I tend to like the more kind of what I think of as I think this was marketing speak for one of the far cries, but wide linear, Mm. like big zone open worlds, but that are, that have a diversity of biome or whatever it might be because you get some of that variety. I don't like games that seemingly have just a big giant space full of nothing so that they can say that it is that, and because people tend to like there being an open world component to games, I'm perfectly happy with a linear game. Um, whether or not that's the the current fashion is another question, uh, but I, I do think if that is as described, unfortunately I haven't played Banishers yet, even though it's it's ready to go. If that is as described, I like the notion of a game opening up. I like Arkham Asylum just as much as Arkham City, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I'm very very much in favor of game developers reaching for the stars, but being realistic about what they can do with their budget and resources. Yeah. What do you think, Colin? I want games to do what I think, what they think is most appropriate for them flexing their gameplay muscles or their storytelling muscles or immersion muscles. Like there's no doubt that one of the most iconic experiences in my gaming history going 35 plus years is Fallout 3. There's no doubt Mm -hmm. about that. Like there's, I was, I never played anything like that before. And so this idea that it's like, this is huge territory and there's so many stories and you can do whatever it is you want. Like all you have to do is survive. You can go anywhere you want. But that kind of game requires an incredible amount of attention and buy-in. And I think over time, what I realized was those are once or twice a generation kind of games for Mm -hmm. me where I don't want that even more. I want only the very best to even endeavor to do that. I think that's why Fallout 4 kind of fell a little flat the same year you get a game like The Witcher 3 or something that's just so much better than it. Mm-hmm. And I, I I think you're right, Hogue, about games being big for, for bigness's sake. Big empty games have a... They're a turnoff for me, with unless it's part of the game's design. I, I think a game like Avalanche's Mad Max, for instance, is a good example of an open world where it's huge and it's totally barren and empty and it makes you feel it's like, holy shit, this place is hopeless and dead. And I don't know if they yeah, I think I you can use negative space for that. Absolutely. Right, exactly. Shadow and, of the Colossus is exactly like that. Right. Shadow of the Colossus is another great example. 
it's funny that people have been narrowing down this idea that Metroidvanias can be in 3D because I remember this conversation going all the way back to the original Darksiders and people wondering if that game was a Metroidvania game or not. And if you want to go even further back than that, you can look at Ratchet games as Metroidvania, Ratchet and Clank games as Mm -hmm. Metroidvanias um, and so on and so forth and, and move up from there. So I... I'm I'm of the mind as far as this term is concerned. And this is just a kind of a side comment, but we need more terms to describe more things more. Yeah. A, a, better. And I think Metroidvania should be left to 2D games like because that sure. immediately tells you half of it. Yeah. If it's a Metroidvania, you should just know in your head, just like souls like I think should remain in 3D games. And in fact, I think that that term is ruining a lot of it, like could be experiences for people that are like, oh, this game, this 2D Castlevania like game is a is a souls born game. It's like, no, it fucking isn't like mm-hmm. it's funny to me because souls means so many different things to so many different people. Like the fundamental ingredient for a souls game to me is the notion of dying and going and getting whatever currency you were earning back by going back to find where you died or handling whatever it is that killed you. Like that is a souls game to me more than anything else, more than the kind of maze like environment, more than the, oppressive atmosphere of many of the souls games it's it's really that notion of being ready to die death being around every corner and having to go and have that risk reward mechanic of how far do i stretch this away from my waypoint whatever it's called in that particular game and then having to go back and and make that adventure put it on the backpack and go find those resources again i mean to, to some extent like grounded is a bit of a souls experience for me because mm-hmm. you go on these hikes and you die to a spider that scared the crap out of you and you have to go get your stuff back. Um, and, and different people say, that doesn't make any sense, Rick. No, I, I, need, I need the narrative to come through the items. I need some kind of really weird, opaque monsters. That's a Souls game to me. And I think that's part of the problem with genre identification in all things, movies and television and books included, but certainly with video games. And I think one problem is, right, you say Metroidvania should be limited to 2D. I think, Colin, what you mean is, the 2D experience presented by camera, right? Because one of the games I want to talk about is Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown. Oh, yeah, 2. Which is 100% yeah, two, a Metroidvania, yeah, yeah, yeah. but is also a 3D game. You're right, yeah, 2.5D. Right, you're exactly right. So, right, game 2D gameplay, let's say. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Good, great game, by the way. I can't wait to hear what you have to say about it. Because I, okay. um, I feel like we... This is frankly something that some organization like the Library of Congress should really be doing because video games are serious enough to be taking this kind of thing up in an organ in, in ingesting and organizing this sort of thing just like they really have been doing with film more and more which is good but we need an almost dewey decimal like system for video games i really believe where not to find games but to categorize them text and, and have a taxonomy for video games where in the dewey decimal system i don't remember what it was wasn't there only like 12 major categories or something like that and then everything got split up in all of these major ways and that to me would be super interesting. It, we there aren't much more than it's like action, adventure, sports, role playing game, strategy, simulation. Like there's not that many of them, but underneath, and then how they would also interconnect with each other genetically. You can have this yeah. fascinating family tree, even of how all these games connect with each other. I, so yeah, you're right. So uh, Metroidvania for me, I just I don't acknowledge. We can use the term loosely, but uh, yeah, you're right. Two point five D or two D. Let's say two D gameplay plane would be something that would be met- necessary for a Metroidvania because it's inspired by Super Metroid and Castlevania Symphony of the Night. So how else can you possibly, mm-hmm. in- how can you get a 3D inspiration out of that? You know, it doesn't make, like Mario 1 doesn't inspire Mario 3 necessarily or inform what we look at as Mario 3. I mean, I think in some sense, these are two different games. You just jump and explore, but we're talking about two different things. So I think we have to kind of keep those separations as well. But I, right. Mar- so- Mario has the 2D, 3D problem, right? Mario 64 is nothing like Super Mario World. Precisely. Um, but we both we recognize both of those as Mario games now at this point. That's true. So, yeah, I would I would love to. There's people smarter than me with more money than I'll ever have being able to organize things like this at their institutions and all sorts of things that will fix, f- solve this problem. But I think it would be it the term adventure game itself. Is so interesting because that means very, very specific things to me. And yeah. I, I but I think to a lot of people that's almost like a misnomer in some way. Like, how did that even become mm-hmm. that? Um, well, and, and yeah. of a certain age, right? It's it's tends to be pixel art, inventory, 
strange puzzle solving, you know, your Monkey Islands, your mm-hmm. Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, whatever it is that you played in the adventure game genre. Yeah, Maniac Mansion and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's where I think of it. But like you go before that, Infocom games and and your your two word prompts for adventure games. And so it really depends on when you grew up. I agree with you that it's not great to be able to speak on these things with a term like Metroidvania, not the least of which because it's incomprehensible to folks that aren't well versed in gaming. Right. I mean, like that's the romance, drama, comedy have the advantage of being able to come in and say, I, I think I know mostly what you're talking about when I'm in the movie section and you're saying those things. <coughs> Metroidvania still gets me looks from my wife and she's been gaming with me for 20 years. So, I mean, that that's just not a name that means anything on its own because it's referring to games from the 90s, folks. It's been a while. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. true. I also think I have to, he doesn't talk to me anymore, but I've always liked liked his work is I think Jeremy Parrish made that word up. I'm pretty sure, which is pretty mm-hmm. interesting when you can track like where something comes from, which is and so the etymology of it. Yeah. Yeah. And Metroidvania is a complete nonsense. So is roguelike. Rogue is 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 fuck. rogue is older than I am. You rogue know? is ancient. It, yeah. Like and no one knows what that is. So like, and, and oh. somehow it's like and then rogue light. You know, and yeah. it's like, oh, my goodness. Right. Light and like are useful terms, but only if you're really well versed in gaming. Um, And yeah, Rogue, for folks that didn't play Rogue, it's essentially a mystery dungeon game nowadays. If you've played any of those, that's that's Rogue pure. Mm. That's that's what Rogue was. Yeah. Uh, Genres are messy and they always will be. And it's very annoying, but it is what it is. I'm going to I'm going to invent a new one. By the, I'm going to invent a new one later in the show when we get to some of other categories. Yeah. Yeah. I wish indies would figure something else out for that yeah oh it's oh uh this 10 million dollar indie game published by annapurna it's like oh i'm not sure that's an indie game but yeah fair enough i did like dave the diver michael was a huge fan too i'll pick it up when it comes to yeah comes in april does it yeah with godzilla right yeah yeah that's right yeah 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 godzilla in a dredge crossover Dredge Dave the Diver awesome had game. a Dredge crossover. I adore Dredge. Yeah, Dredge, Dredge has a special place in my heart because it was one of the first games I could play while I was getting my left hand back. Nice. So Dredge was really easy to kind of move a boat around and then manipulate a menu. Yeah. Uh, and it's just got a great, weird atmosphere. It's, it does. It's one of my favorite things it. about indie games is it's like, let's let's take a toy boat and pretend that we're going to fight Cthulhu with it. <laughs> okay, sure. Go nuts. Yeah. You can make that game. Good job, guys. Uh, and I Dredge, I couldn't recommend enough. Uh, mm-hmm. because it's just so fascinating as a yeah. kind of combined game. I bought yeah. it with my, uh, it's sitting on my cross media bar. I haven't played it yet, but I bought Dredge with my PlayStation stars coins. Cause it's nice. like one of the special games that's like cheaper yeah. if you buy it with your coins or whatever. So I didn't know they bought anything. That's nice. Yeah, they did. If you go, yeah. you have to like sign in, you have to be on it and, and activate mm-hmm. your different tasks, but then they can o- often be quickly eliminated so often just like playing a ps plus game or just logging in or whatever and i don't care about any of the trophy they have to integrate it with the psn better they do on on console until then no one's gonna really care but exactly yeah but yeah you get real i think dude i think i have i you can actually oh you can actually trade in your coins for psn money yeah um yeah yeah at like five ten or twenty dollars at a time i think and i think i have something like forty five dollars worth of coins but i'm saving them because i got dredge let's say dredge was twenty dollars i got it for twelve dollars worth of coins or something so i want to see if they have future, I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to check my balance right now on uh, on the episode here. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, you'll be surprised because you get them for purchases too, and I buy. I'm a prodigious purchaser of games, so you definitely mm-hmm. get a lot of coins for that too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I well, it's funny, right? Like because I, I will buy a game on my PlayStation, and then my cell phone will go beep. Be like, mm-hmm. yep, I, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, as I get my, you know what I was so happy about? I don't know if you guys ever noticed this, that when you would secure PS plus free games every month, you'd get emails that you bought them. Yes. And then they finally shut that off and everyone was like, yay. Like, why did that take like 12 yeah, years? So annoying. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so annoying. Now we play a game of what the heck is your PSN password? Oh my God. Yeah. I hate uh, when the, yeah, Sony's content even, right here. Dude, Sony's login situation is so annoying too on their phone, on the phone app because you have to do like the find uh, the what where's the motorcycle you know? oh i hate those dude. or like have the arrows point towards each other like the puzzles where i'm like i'm not even sure what the fuck you're talking about you know <laughs> i'm a little shot but i don't think i'm that shot you know so yeah. well you know the fun part of that is for the most part they're just checking to see if you respond in a millisecond Mm-hmm. all right guys interesting let's talk about helldivers 2 
Less. We talked about a little last is. week, Colin. Yeah. Uh, it's taking the world by storm right now. Everyone's trying to play it if they can get into the game. Uh, Hogue, I would like to start with you because me and Colin talked about it a little bit last week. And I, Colin, I know you have much more thoughts. We'll get to you after. I've evolved. Oh, tell me that. Yes. <laughs> Helldivers is a game that took me by surprise. Uh, folks that follow me know that I tend to like a narrative-driven, story-rich game. Alan Wake 2 was my favorite game last year. We talked about Final Fantasy. All these various games that tend to be associated with what I like have deep, rich story. But I also like games that essentially just evoke story, that world-build kind of around the edges and let you feel like there's a story there. And then let you play out that fantasy in video games. And I think Helldivers 2 does such a fantastic job of that. I was wondering when this was announced, whether or not the game would make a good transition from the over-the-top camera they used for the first one into this over-the-shoulder perspective, which is a little bit more standard. And I think they handled it so well. Mm -hmm. And the images that you get are so evocative of uh, Starship Troopers or many other things that you could think of where you are an infantry person fighting the bugs or the robots, you're in various Terminator scenes, depending on which direction you go. And obviously it has taken over social media with some of the clips and things that you can put out there because it is so bombastic and almost satirical. And I am so happy for the folks that made this game because it is the kind of game that I remember playing when I was younger, right? So we get very much uh, stuck in thinking of prestige games or successful games as mini movies, whether whether you're talking about The Last of Us or Cyberpunk or any of these other games that I really enjoy, I love. I love those stories, I love those, those narratives. There still is fun in kind of the uh, experimental, experiential gameplay loop. And the good news about that, if you're a smaller developer, is that if you can somehow master that and de develop that secret sauce, like I think the Helldivers team has, that can work forever, right? You're not dependent on a narrative beat. You're not dependent on characters or plot in Helldivers. You're probably dependent on looking at what your live services roadmap is going to be to keep people involved in the game. But it's clear if you've played the game that that bottom third of the radar is dedicated to somebody sometime. Uh, and so I think they do have something coming up in the future for Helldivers. And everybody on social media and the internet playing it is undoubtedly going to keep the fire burning for that game for some time, I think. And it's really interesting to me that you have seen word of mouth, social media, experiential games be so much more effective in marketing and really spreading to people than some of the AAA games that have come out over the same kind of two month period. With Pal World and Helldivers, you really see the effect of making a game experience kind of pop for, for those 10 second, 30 second TikTok clips, whatever it is you want to use as your social media platform of choice versus your Suicide Squads, which I like, or your Skull and Bones, which I've also liked. Um, and I think that's an interesting kind of inflection point for selling video games in 2024 and beyond. Mm -hmm. Colin, let's hear from you. You Last week, you were solo gaming. Mm-hmm through held hours mostly but you've changed as far as i'm aware right yeah so it's funny this is like uh that let's consider that conversation 1.0 this will be 2.0 and sacred symbols last week was 1.5 because i started to kind of mm. I, I started kind of getting through this this idea where there are there are difficulty levels in the game from zero to nine or something like that i think it is and yeah something like that once you get to like level three you're kind of pushing it and by the time you get to level four, there's no doing it by yourself. Like I don't unless you grind and grind and grind and grind and then do things slowly by yourself. I couldn't imagine going to some of those places where you have to fight like the huge Titan like enemies and having any hope. Like there are enemies that are designed on the bug side, especially where it, it, you're supposed to draw them towards you so other people can shoot them, shoot them in their weakness. Absolutely. And the bullets like bounce off their heads. Dustin was saying that he got killed by his own bullet bouncing off of one of those things, mm -hmm. which is so funny, you know, um, <laughs> and so I kind of, I was trying to figure this out for myself. I don't play online games. I really don't. And was I open-minded to this game more than I usually would be because of where it comes from? Yes. But for me, I, that's the same thing with Last of Us Factions, by the way, back in 2013. It's like, that's why right. I loved that too. Now that's going to contradict a little bit what I'm saying here, but I don't like PVP games. 
And I don't think that I'm ever going to really do that. Um, so like, for instance, if Fair Games comes out and it's PvP or it's deeply that, it's like, I'm not interested in this game. Or Concord, we don't really know anything about it, but that's supposed to come out later this year, multiplayer. And I like the PvE stuff. And I like it. I like this game. And this might be really endemic of a lot of um, or indicative of a lot of multiplayer gaming today, as opposed to when I used to play games on multiplayer back in like the Xbox one or the original Xbox era where everyone was talking, like everyone was fucking <laughs> talking, you know, right. um, it was weird if you didn't have a mic and no one talks on this game. I still haven't encountered a single person in Helldivers 2 that talks. Some people use the little chat thing in the corner, but I just ignore those. And most people don't say anything on them anyway. And it's very unintrusive from this sense. And everyone, there's a certain visual language in the game that allows people to understand what's supposed to be done, either by using the in-game kind of map tracker and someone puts a a pin down and then everyone goes towards it. It just seems like there's a a, a typical order. Everyone understands in the game that you kind of need each other. If you're on this level four, level five, I think that's the highest I've gone so far, where it's like you you got to have each other's backs or this is going to go really badly. Like it, it, sometimes the, I love how sometimes the missions start on those levels and you're immediately attacked. Like you <laughs> land in like a field of all of them already attacking. You. Like you can't even get your because like I love playing and getting my <clears throat> I get my machine gun out immediately from from space <clears throat> and I get uh, my little drone companion out from space. Mm-hmm. But you don't even have time to do that. Like when you land and you just have to keep going. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. It's funny because I was just listening to a Sunday show where a guy kept clearing his throat every five seconds. And I was like, that is the most annoying thing. How like clear your fucking throat. This is a God. <laughs> this is a God season pays thing. I was just yesterday. Unlike meet the press. That's strange how that works. So. The game. This is what I was saying earlier is that I don't know how much I trust my own instincts on this game or the value of my opinions on this game, because it's not. A game I typically play. What I can tell you is that it's clear that this game has caught a lot of people by surprise. I think no more than Sony. And that's not true only in the performance of the game on servers, which we'll talk about later when we get to the other segments, because I want to ruin that. But there's this idea I've this game has made me second guess what I know about Sony's PR strategies and like how they approach games being exposed, because you kind of see it and you're like, how didn't you know? And then if you kind of track that logically, it's like, okay, so you did know. So why didn't you show anyone the game? Like, what did it go gold very late? Somewhat, but not really. Could you have invited people to Arrowhead or to fucking San Mateo to play the game? Like you didn't give any, there was no beta. In some sense, you ima- I imagine this game would have maybe even been as big, if not bigger, if there was a beta, because people would have become mm-hmm. completely obsessed with it. And so I look at all of those things and I'm like, what is your, what is your strategy here? I'm also curious about the player base count per platform. I get the vibe that this game is doing an order of magnitude better on PC than on PS5. It does it. I Uh, don't I don't know if they're releasing. They haven't released cumulative overall numbers. They say things like we have a caps of 600,000. And if that's true, then you have 450,000 people or whatever, 410,000 on Steam. So that means you have mm -hmm. fewer than 200,000 on PS5. Now, I think that this game behind the scenes is going to show them a lot. This is all data. And it's what I said about in the Insomniac leak about that really interesting piece of data when they launched Horizon Forbidden West in the PS Plus and lost like $90 million. But that was like a really important piece of data for them to be like, oh, shit, this really does hurt our business in the bottom line. So this is probably the exact opposite. They have to figure out if they want to embrace this idea. And we were saying it earlier of like dispatching games to PC where you make less money and have them less captive. You don't even have them on PS Plus. They're not even logged into PSN in any way. You don't have to do that. No, they don't even an option. You know, so mm-hmm. to me, I'm like, do you embrace the inevitability of this? Is this a one off? Is this kind of the I don't want to say special treatment, but are people into this game because it's PlayStation? I think there's a piece of that. And I think they're certainly getting the benefit of the doubt with the performance of the game because of their PlayStation. I think that's right materially true, not only because they're PlayStation and they have goodwill, but because they don't know what they're doing. And I think everyone knows that. So they've kind of stumbled. The original Helldivers was a game that at most 6,000 people concurrently played. Right. So they certainly mm-hmm. didn't and think it was, I was pretty good. Right. And so we're talking about 100 times more. Right. You know, uh, and I'm sure that they were like, there's no way that they had thought that. I don't think the, you can see pre-order numbers somewhat reliably, although you could still buy the Super Earth edition now. But when you see the person as like the super citizen um, mm-hmm. 
rank or whatever, that's Your usually title, a pre-order yeah. or, or they're spending more money to get that special. It's like twenty dollars more. I would love to know the money, the equation behind this, but people, I think, are going to take umbrage with what I say here, too, about the game, which is that I don't think this is what they're looking for. I think this is nice. I think it's a nice story. I think Helldivers 2 is going to exist for a long time, but people have to remember certain things that are true about this game. Number one is that they've already painted themselves into a corner because they said support for this game will be free. So that, I think, is a huge mistake that they're going to have to figure out how to undo. I think that you can support the game for 12 to 18 months for free, but I think you have to kind of prime people to understand paid content will be necessary for, to make a game like this not thrive, but to make the money that Sony is looking for. Because if you do the math at $40, let's assume it's for, it's $40 straight up, all PS5 versions just to be friendly. At, at 2 million copies, that's $80 million. And I'm telling you, that's not the money Sony is looking for. Right, you know, like, yeah. like it's, it's, and so people are like, what are you talking about? This is like a huge success. And I'm like, no, it's great. It's a, it's an amazing, wonderful story. It's an awesome game. But from a business standpoint, I think that this is going to teach Sony a lot, but it's not the golden goose that they're looking for. It's not because no. the golden goose they're looking for is a free game that's available probably across platforms that can churn billions of dollars a year. And I just told you that Helldiver is selling 2 million copies, which is probably about accurate, I would say at this point, maybe a little more. It's $80 million gross if they all sold on PS5. That's not, like I just said, most of them sold on PC. So you're talking about 70% of whatever that revenue is. So I just think from a business standpoint, this is going to be a really fascinating experience. I'd love to be a fly on the wall there (laughs) because there's There's so much question that this isn't the winning game model, right? Right. This isn't the Fortnite. Right, exactly. Um, But I do think that there is going to be a question of whether or not it's sold and is successful because it's not that monetized right that's true that's totally true like there's i think there's different approaches because and this brings up an interesting point that i've seen people kind of bandy around and i don't think this is going to happen by the way but it's like do you look at factions or the oh hog are you still there oh oh hog i'm still here i'm just having coughs oh okay i just okay okay. i we didn't know if we lost you so i don't know if they if they go about um this situation and and think like we only have one lane, right? I think they look at it, the games as a service thing as multiple lanes. People say like, oh, this is their first games as a service. It's like, no, it isn't. I hate when people say that. No, it isn't. MLB The mm-hmm. Show is a game as a service. It comes out every year. People spend tons of money in microtransactions on that game. Plus, it's a huge seller. That's their first game as a service really in this modern era. And it's been going for years. So this is another lane. But I wonder if they yeah. look back at Last of Us Factions and say like, is there a lane for this? Because it's done. I mean, I, I've said this before. I know people who played it. I don't know how like how like encapsulated and finished as a final product it is, but like it's playable. Like people were enjoying it. It was. Yeah, I said before it was on the it was on the same dev kits that people were playing. The la- people embargoed people playing The Last of Us Part Two on PS5. You could see The Last of Us Online on the dev kits, right mm-hmm. on the cross media bar. So I wonder if they look back at this because I was always of the mind why couldn't an online game exist for a year or two years? And you have a small a community of people that still play it, just like a small community of people still play factions. Yeah. So I wonder if they, they that open, they, they realize, oh, there's actually multiple lanes for us to kind of be successful here. Helldivers 2 is not going to be a huge moneymaker for us, comparable to what we were looking for, but it's a nice project for us. We gave it eight years. We rebooted it. Um, we, we put a lot more money into it and it's, it happens to be incredibly fun. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, I think, the the main point of it is there's just something very satisfying about it. But I have to be honest and say that I don't know how useful my opinion is on this game, comparable to how confident I am about single player games and talking about them, because this is a space that is still mysterious to me and that I just know full well that I'm not going to really dwell in very much. That's why it's yeah. so surprising how much Helldivers is taking my time, you know. When it, when it will let me, because it's still not playable sometimes. Uh, right, that's what I was going to say. I think that's just a testament to how good this game is, is that you are going out of your comfort zone a little, going in multiplayer. Like, even though you're not talking with people, a lot of people don't talk multiplayer games. Most, even I play, people don't talk. But uh, I think there's something special about that, and Sony should definitely look at that. I think you're 100% on the money, Colin, with different lanes of a live service game that they can do. I think if they are purely chasing the golden goose of Fortnite money, I uh, realistically, I don't know if they're going to find that. 
because there's just way too much competition and to keep something like that going costs an insane amount of money. Look at Naughty Dog. Like, I don't know what they were thinking when they were saying like, oh, well, we can't monetize this game or we can't keep up. If the game came out, we couldn't keep up to date with it. Essentially, it's like, I don't know what you were thinking by even building this game and not being able to do that. They're going to need a very like specific studio with a ton of staff to keep that going. I think this is a good way to start their live service thing because they're building goodwill for their live service games. Like I have plenty of friends, like real life friends who only play on PC and they're playing this game. I bet a lot of them don't even know it's a Sony game, but they're just playing it because it's good. But maybe if they hear that, they'd be like, oh, OK, maybe they're making a new Sony game. I'll check in on that. And also the price point is a huge factor on PC. PC gamers they're not willing to spend as much money on games often, I would say. That's why for a long time you'd see games cheaper on PC. You can even still find games cheaper on PC, but the fact that it's $40 is a huge benefit to this game. And, and it, it still is, has microtransactions. It does. That's the whole thing about the microtransactions. All right, we're back, everybody. We just had a quick snafu, but we are back. We were in the middle talking about Helldivers, specifically calling the uh, the their model with this live service type of game. Mm. When we were talking about there's multiple lanes, you'd say, for live service games. Yeah, right. And so I, I just I'm curious what I guess to to just uh, wrap it up, it would just be I, I would be curious to know where they want to be and what they're trying to do. I think that we were talking about a company that's lean on margins. This game was in development for a long time. The crew grew to 100 people. They're hiring now to support the game. I have no doubt that they're thrilled with how it's doing. I just think people need to recalibrate what they think this game is going to do for PlayStation mm-hmm. as a brand because it's it's. It could be the beginning of something great, or it could be an additive brick to a really impressive fresco or whatever. But like, I just, to me, I look at it and I say, this is a wonderful game, but this is not what they're talking about. And they have no interest in making $80 million. Right. Uh, they, they, I mean, that's nice. First of all, it's not making $80 million. You would imagine the profit on that would be very low, actually. And mm-hmm. to me, I just, they want Genshin Impact. They want Fortnite. They want yeah, Rocket League. They want, and I, I think you're right that the idea that they're going to get one of those is low, but I don't think it's unbelievable. It just, it has no. to be the right game. And this can't be the game. Like this isn't the game. No, that's you not. need, you need a game that can accommodate way more people. Um, I'm not saying even from a server low, but just like more interactive and stuff. If they were, if Sony was interested in smaller, but online success stories, they would have an MMO by now. Mm-hmm. Right. They, this, this is not, or another MMO. They had DC universal, although that was really Sony online, but anyway, well, I digress. I, I, I go ahead. Oak. To bring the real world into it, my day job, I have often thought of the live services push as venture capital-like, which if folks don't know, venture capital is money spent on companies that haven't proven that they can make anything yet. And essentially, venture capitalists put in money to 10 companies on the notion that nine of them are going to fail or not make huge money so that the 10th can go crazy. Right. So when when we talk about Sony and their announcement that we're working on 12 live life services games or we're going into this direction, I've always viewed it as we're going to do all these different models. We're going to try all these different genres and types and we're going to hope one hits big to cover everything else. And I think Helldivers is a version of that. But yes, it's not the final model. It's not what's going to win any of the console or video gaming wars. They're not ended by a Helldivers. But I have also said that I enjoyed the the PlayStation 2, Xbox 360 era of what I at least interpreted as more variety and more different experiences. And Helldivers is the kind of thing that I'm happy exists and I don't really think has a close analog to anything else that you can play right now. I'm a single player gamer as well. I, pre- I predominantly play RPGs and action adventures and things of that nature. And I was still drawn into playing Helldivers primarily because it isn't that kind of competitive pvp environment where a person of my vintage gets shot in two seconds and then has to wait to respawn etc and it had a cool little wrapper on it i also like that the environments are relatively small and and manageable and you go in and out of these mission environments often i I like that kind of bite-sized video game approach it feels like a game i can keep on my um rotation bar Mm -hmm. and pop it between bigger sessions of something else if i just want to go shoot some bugs or robots and I think that's a really good, smart niche to to hit for any maker. Uh, and I think, yes, Helldivers doesn't change the Sony plan, but obviously it's better to have the mass success unexpectedly than to not, right? So I think Helldivers justified its existence, even if it doesn't change the overall long-term plans for Sony or anyone else. 
Yeah, uh, Hoga, I'm glad you I'm really glad you brought this up because I was thinking this is you were talking about the PS2 kind of era of games. And Colin, how many times have we heard, you know, Chris say he misses the PS1 kind of energy, the PS2 with these really weird kind of little games? I think this is a game that can kind of fill that gap a little bit that can kind of give that experimental feel or smaller feel that a lot of people are missing from PlayStation. You know, people who are burnt out maybe on just the the triple A God of War is like, those are all great games and I love them, but it is really cool to get a smaller little game like this every now and then. So I think from a PR standpoint, Colin, it's a really good move, but from a cash flow, probably like, I think you're correct and you're right on the money of them. It's not what they want, but it is a nice win for them regardless. Yeah, they can't complain. Let's, I don't want to understate it. The numbers are huge on PC. Like the, the concurrent yeah. numbers are beat gta 5's concurrent numbers starfield's concurrent numbers i mean this is an inc- halo right this is an incredible mm-hmm. success story i just we're talking about sony we're not talking about yeah, pull up yeah you're right you know? yeah um people hate so, the bugs right and yeah and the bastard is like the whole bastardization of the whole the whole conversation around starship troopers that's a, that's incur- occurring because of this game is awesome to me um, again i i always realize how old i am when i see these kinds of things happen on social media right it's like uh, people are discovering Starship Troopers as a movie now as a result of <laughs> yeah. Helldivers. And that's hard for me to believe. Yeah, it's it's incredible to the the movie and the book are so different from each other. The movie is is supposed to be a bastardization of the book. I think that's the entire idea, because the book is an almost. The book from the 50s is about like a, a civilization where um, like a human civilization where like you have the freedom to not do things but you just don't get to vote or you don't get to like participate in all these kinds of things and that's where the whole managed democracy idea and hell divers comes from and that's one of the things that i really wanted to underline by the way in this game that i think is really great which is that the game is a completely self-fulfilling constantly reinforcing satire and Mm -hmm. i really love that like the fundamental idea that you are basically i mean this is how i read it anyway as you are just cloned versions of yourself um, or you're different people. I don't know exactly because you always come out frozen as if you're in cryo sleep. Right. right? So like they're they're like reviving you or you're just other people like however, whatever it is, um, the the way it plays on the uselessness of the human in the machine and like how and the fodder nature of everything you do and the incredible violence accompanied by the dramatic lines about liberty and freedom and the, the bravado and all of the rest it's it's really truly it's truly wonderful from that perspective it's not deep it, it's not even trying to be deep it's just it's funny because it's true like this this seems believable in some sense like this is insane and i love that about it and that it's just it's about it's just about the, the craziness of the military industrial complex about mm-hmm. human expansion about colonialism about all sorts of things that i think they don't need to say very much at all because it's yep. all in the game play itself and the way and, and in, in the barks and in the fucking violent ways you die. And then you just immediately come back. Yeah. Just another body in the fray and another body and another body and another body and so on. And so I, I really, I agree really want to that. compliment it for that. Yeah. And that's the yeah. same bit that of course the starship troopers movie is famous for. I do think there are a couple of places where hell divers gets a little bit, Maybe wrong notes on some of the things. I I get a little bit um, disbelieving of even the satirical tone of like I I I sweet liberty I lost my arm that kind of thing. I it, it's not it's not as even subtle, which is hard to say, as Starship Troopers. Uh, and I think some of that gets a little bit arch Saturday Night Live skit e. Uh, and that's going to work for some people and it doesn't hit me quite where I live. And that's comedy, right? So it's subjective, but I would rather see it a little bit more subtle. And interestingly, managed democracy is the place where I see that the most. Managed democracy is a term you can imagine right now on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else. The concept of a regulatory authority managing what democracy means, which of course is uh, the notion of the people having their own say in how they are governed. and that's a subtle kind of uh, political speak that I can see happening in the real world versus the the folks just shouting about liberty as if it were a God uh, is not as sincere in my experience 
uh, with the game. And maybe that doesn't matter to you. I, it doesn't take away from the gameplay at all. Uh, I think where it mostly comes across the best in terms of its satire is the bombast of the musical score. I don't hear people talking about that as much, but when that score comes on and you're doing the loading screen where you're descending to the planet, it is it is all that rel- ridiculous militaristic bombast. And I joked with my brother while I was playing this, said, yeah, I think that the, the audio direction was, no, no, more bombastic. No, more. More bombastic because it's it's insane the the music that plays while you're fighting the bugs and the robots mm-hmm. and everyone else. Uh, so I think it's very cool. It's a cool vibe. They have completely, completely encapsulated what they were going for with wars against bugs and robots, and I think that's what's paying off here. And I also think that bit of fun and what is engaging for people has gotten them out of discussions that they'd prefer not to have about some difficulties with matchmaking and server infrastructure. Uh, you know, it is a game where I think it is demonstrably worse as a solo experience than even with a second person. And a mm-hmm. lot of those enemy designs, as you pointed out, Colin, are you got to hit this one in the butt and you really need somebody to be the distraction fodder. And it doesn't it doesn't really work with one person firing a gun. Uh, and they were having a huge amount of difficulties matchmaking for that first weekend. And and, st- and, and still. I mean, as of the time we're recording this, I think it's still a problem, you know? Yeah, yeah and that's that's good for this particular game. I mean, there are games that are okay with solo and it's essentially the same game just with buddies around you. This is not that. This is designed around multiple people. They have weapons that use multiple people. They have buttons that only open with multiple people. And I think that they are getting away with that and not really being uh, put over the coals because they hit the nail on the head for what they were aimed for and the experience that people wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, dude, I've been playing this game with like everyone from LSM. Like it, like me and Dustin almost playing, it feels like every night. But I've played with Gene, Chris, Locke, Do ben, you guys everyone's talk? Playing. Dude, you like Oh, we're on Mike. Discord talking to each other. Cause we're just cool. hanging out and stuff. But um we were talking about like when Gene was playing with us, we were talking about how it just reminds us of the good old days of like Left 4 Dead and stuff like that that's the kind of vibe this game's giving me and i think that's why it's striking a lot of people particularly on pc because it is that kind of like zeitgeist getting together with your friends and just going out there causing chaos with nothing like a difficult game but not too serious like when we're playing we're killing each other on accident all the time everyone's laughing having a good time and i think that's so important that they nailed this with that game and i think that's why a lot of people are sticking with it like a lot of my friend groups who don't play a lot of games or aren't into the game industry at all. Like they're all playing it too. So they have something very approachable. special. Yeah. And I think to and, Colin's point about talking, I think one of the things I noticed early on is I agree completely. Nobody's talking Colin, mm-hmm. but the way that it's designed, as you say, the, the, the visuals and how you approach the game is really designed for what is the modern 2024 silent pug group going after yeah. something. And it works really well, even if you're not talking because of the pings and the way the radar works and you can see everything that you're supposed to do and the bullets are flying off the head. The fact that you can see that is helpful to all of that. And I was happy to hear that because I, for the most part, don't want to have my mics on or talking to people. That that experience has never been one that I have found to be particularly enjoyable, at least not since the Halo 2 days. People just have whatever they have going on in their house on their mics and I don't love that experience yeah like entire uh, experience ex- entire stories of in and of themselves going on on some of these mics in my oh, yeah. in my old days yeah oh yeah you, yeah you get a lot of spouses talking you get right. a lot of people Kids. and the yeah. people that aren't that are not necessarily the people you want to hear from anyway and so i would prefer to think of you all as fellow hell divers that aren't having those experiences in your gaming environment and are otherwise just accidental fodder for my automated turret I apologize. Mm-hmm. Also, not a sorry emote, but I, the experience is is just very enjoyable. And well, y- y- to that point, do you know what one of the things that I think the game does that keeps people in it and it makes it both it makes it it's high, the, the each mission is high stakes, but everything's kind of low stakes. Is there's no as far as I can tell, there's some trophies attached to it. But if you as if you go through all of your lives and make it out with no lives left, but you're all out, there's no penalty. Like use the lives. Like yeah, it, use in other words, dying is it's not so brutal wherein you'd get mad. Like, cause I can imagine people playing this game. It's like being at a blackjack table in Vegas and and you pull a card you shouldn't have, and everyone else gets mad at you, right? They because do. you fucked up the entire deck, right? And 
because you shouldn't have taken the, the book says you don't take it there or whatever. It's the same thing here where it's like, it's oh, you make a bad can. move. Right, exactly. Exactly. Like that's supposed to be my king. And it's it's kind of like there's a, a, a but when you play in an easy table where no one cares and it's $10 a hand and everyone's just having a good time, it's different. And that that feels like this to me where they're so flagrant. You get 20 lives, I think, on the on the missions I'm playing or whatever. And it's like, so if someone dies stupidly or you get fucking carpet bombed on mistake, it's not the end of the world. And that would be a big deal or make people really mad in mm-hmm. other situations well, where and I don't really that's part of the joke, do- right? I mean, like that's right. the brilliance of the design is you get to right. that end screen and they show you get the experience and you get the the cash bucks or whatever they are in that requisition points. Uh, in Helldivers for completing your objectives, you even get glorious sacrifice if you do everything and you all die. Uh, and then the experience and crap that you get for actually surviving the people that you return home is so small compared to that. Like that's part of the joke of how they how they think of the hell divers as mm-hmm. par- as opposed to their strategic initiatives. I, I, well, oh, oh, I'm go sorry. Ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, go I, was ahead. Just, I, was, I was just gonna say, like, <laughs> I keep Micah just keeps rolling her eyes at me when I keep saying this, but I'm, I, I I fight with the bugs almost entirely. I, I did a little bit of the robot stuff, but I, I'm not really into it right now. So I, I stay mm-hmm. with um, in the bug planets. And I'm on this. I've been on this planet for Fen uh, called Fenrir Three. I don't know if you guys have been on this one. Mm-hmm. And I just keep telling her, I'm like, how many? Li-? I like, I die, and I look at her, and I'm like, how many lives is this planet gonna consume? You know, like I, I try to, I take it really, really seriously as I'm playing it, and like this, you know, we're oh my mm-hmm. god, we're going back to this place. So many of my friends died here, kind of thing. Like just not even taking it seriously in that sense at all. I think there's a real humor around the game that even makes yep. you want to kind of play with it that way. Yep, and. That's why I love that they said basically like, we don't want to make and we're not going to make a PvP mode like that's not what we are because the game is fundamentally PvP in the sense that there's there's friendly fire galore but to Hoke's point it's all part of the narrative right yep. of insanity like it oh that was that's why they call it I think wor- they call it so, like if you get four stars it's something like something success like uh, worthwhile success or something like that or valiant mm-hmm. success like where they it's like oh that's worth it your lives lost but the whole Again, my favorite image is just of the hell divers stumbling out of cryo freezing onto a ship like with no context. Yeah, it's just it's just I wonder how many not to I don't, I don't think people are fundamentally stupid out there. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it's like I wonder how many people don't even think about this game on that level at all, because that's like what makes the game shine in my sense. Like otherwise, it would be fun to play. But there's something about the whole narrative and insanity and it's all brought from the original hell divers. All of it's from the original hell divers. So that's yeah. what's even cool about it, too. The whole Galact or the whole you know planet to planet hopping and everything getting crazier and attacks happening and like you said Hogue I think you know the introduction of new character like new enemies would be cool in another another part of space and the crossover potential with this game I think is hold so up. huge we, hold up I'm gonna stop yeah. it right there Colin okay yeah Paul Andrew Roden hey summoning crew I would love to hear your hopes for Hell Divers too specifically if you can make a wish list of features weapons stratagems game types or anything else what would make the list. Thanks in advance. Loving the show more. I think I don't want to do this yet, but I can. And I already see this as people that are asking for this, but it's like more players per map would be pretty. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like eight, a raid mode or something. 12, 16, like where you just have these insane, like imagine all of the bombardment, just insanity. It might, it might not even be playable with more than four people. Maybe six or eight would even be pushing it, but that would be interesting to see. But I think that the potential here to cross over with kill zone specifically, Yes. is so I mean, huge in my opinion that it would break the story because it's not what it's really about but it, even if there was like a little dlc where like part of the galaxy was taken over by the hell gas or something yeah there, there's just i never imagine a world where i would buy skins and things and i, I from the story i would totally buy like kill zone shit from oh my god just, yeah because i think skin? it fits so well here it's so obvious i hope it must be hitting them like a coconut out of a tree on their head like duh like, of course, we got to look into doing a kill zone crossover in some sense. Yeah. So that's what I'd like to see as far as mo- again, this this though, Brad, goes into what my my inability to really track my own opinions and my own worthwhile opinions generally in, in this space is like, I don't really know, like people that know better than me will be able to know how this game should grow. I'm kind of along for the ride in some sense. Well, you said a lot of stuff that I've heard people actually say in the space. One thing of more player counts like people are talking about like a maybe like a raid boss kind of thing maybe like a giant giant bug or something like that or you need eight people to take down or something like that Brain some lost bug. planet two yeah. stuff yeah exactly uh people said kill zone two colin i think they could just do something goofy with this game colin just be like oh there's a wormhole and we found other dimensions or something 
they could do, you know, they could put dinosaurs on a planet. That's what right. I would like or something. What about dinosaurs? What about, I mean, this is fucking nerdy, nerdy for PlayStation fans, but what about the Chimera and home planet from Resistance? I was thinking of we, Chimera we, also. We, yeah, we never, fantastic. we actually never see them in their own, in their own planet. <laughs> um, so That's it would the, be cool. That would be oh. so, that would be so sick. You That's know? how we get more resistance lore calling is through. Was, <laughs> imagine if like, you know, managed democracy, super earth, they're, they're colonizing and then they come across the Chimera and homeworld. Mm -hmm. And that's like a piece of DLC or whatever. That would just be so yeah, sick. I would love that. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I was I'm thinking a, Chimera. Oh, go ahead, Og. I'm a world building politics type nerd. So, you know, I'm, I, I'll defend the Star Wars prequels. I'd love to know more about Super Earth and those kinds of things. But I'm reluctant to say I want more story or narrative in this. I really do think that there is value in evoking a world and the feeling and not trying to tell a linear story with it and letting the gamers tell the stories that they want. So I don't think I want plot in Helldivers. I do think that probably each of the enemy factions could use a Would You Like to Know More video, not just the intro. They did that so well. Uh, but I would love to see one for the Terminids and the Automatons mm -hmm. and whatever that third faction is, which I'm currently betting is Dissidents. Um, and so I would love to see that just That'd as a be kind so of... Sick. Why do you think that? Why do I think it's the dissidents? Because yeah. I think that the, the stuff that you can pick up from the various bases and discussion points in the little memos and things suggest that dissidents or rebels or whatever you want to call it would make the most sense as That's to so what cool. they built. That. Yeah. Um, and I think that would be really interesting from a, you want to turn people's heads towards the satire and what this actually winds up being talking about. I think dissidents is the way to do that. Um, and I think even then you could have some kind of, you want to talk about expanding things. You could have some kind of a Titanfall esque multiplayer where the, the distance are potentially the other hell divers. And you could have things where you elect to be on one side or the other super earth or, or the rebels sure. uh, and do those kinds of things with what you've already got built into the game. Uh, and I think, that's been hinted at in various places in the game, but I, I'm just kind of wish casting a little bit. That's super, that's super cool that you observe that. I didn't even observe that. The, the one thing I, that ties into what you're saying though, that I thought was interesting and it's subtle. You have to actually really go around with a cursor and look is that there's like so many spaces on the map that all have planets, but they're like not even brought to any attention unless you dive in. So like you can go to like the earth system and like all of the, there's like planets and spots there. And you wonder to your point, Hogue, like what if it all starts there? And like, that's like, you know, and you, there's like a pincer, you know, with your guys between the bugs and the, and the, and the rebels like fighting from super earth or it's exciting. I think to that think, would be like, awesome. I, I just don't know. I'm, I speak, I speak about this game. Like it's one of the very few multiplayer games that really caught me and really factions was the last one. And before that, I would say you'd have to go all the way back to Xbox. Wow. With game, like you said, Halo two, but really the last game. This was before Halo 2, actually. I liked Halo 2 as well, but was Rainbow Six Three. I was obsessed with I was fucking obsessed with that game. Obsessed with it. Obsessed with playing. The one it I remember that. the most, and I can't remember the name, so maybe one of you can help me, is the one with mechs where you had the radio uh through your headset on Xbox and if you had to build up the tower so you could talk to your teammates. Oh, kind of, I don't know. It kind of died when they went to an Xbox Live. Is, is that Mercenaries? No. Mm. I'm not no, sure. How, I how that was reminds me a lot of Mercenaries with like the calling down the airstrikes and things. Yeah. I can't yeah, remember I the name of that I game. Somebody recall. in your comments is going to know it in two oh, seconds. Yeah. Definitely. Did you did you play Kill or sorry, uh, Socom Kong? Yeah, I actually played only the first one. I returned. Oh, you didn't play two? No, I, I returned oh. the whole modem. Oh, like, man. That was when you could buy adapter. things from GameStop and then just bring them back. Yeah, the adapter. I bought it. I bought it with Madden and SOCOM, and I, I returned it. I was like, I don't, want, I don't want this. Damn. Yeah, SOCOM and 2 was, was like, I'm never playing voice online games. Voice-activated gaming there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the Xbox, I will say, I mean, my whole, my whole context as a, as a PS2 player was first of all, I was like a GameCube whore, hardcore that generation, but also hey, GameCube is awesome. But Xbox was like an online machine to me. It was almost like another machine. It was like a, not sure. even a machine where I bought a bunch of games for it, actually. Like, and there were good single player games on there, like Chronicles of Riddick and others. But 
that was where I played a lot of their multiplayer games. It was it was with oh, my first yeah. Xbox Live account, which is lost to history. Yeah, yeah. I was along with so seven jealous. other Xbox Live accounts that I've had. I finally have an Xbox Live <laughs> account that I know it's attached to my Windows account now, and I use Windows, so now it won't be lost anymore. Because oh, I used good. to just make new ones whenever we would. Pl- I, I have like I had one I just used for Gears Three, and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, Colin, I'll read this comment. We kind of yeah, talked about this a little, but I want to hear your thoughts real quick. The great Santani wrote in, "What's up, some forty one? Brad, please tell Colin that playing Helldivers 2 solo is like playing the Final Fantasy 7 remake without having played the original first. Thanks and keep up the great work. I would generally agree with you unless, like like I said earlier, you wanted to stay on the lower difficulty levels. But there was something about the ignorance is bliss situation here that I have to acknowledge, which is if I had gone in, if I it's like Gran Turismo, like I I don't play Gran Turismo because I don't I know I don't like car games and I don't even bother trying it. Maybe I would like it, but I don't but I don't try it there was something that tricked me into this in some sense or my own preconceived notion about what the game could be because I've wedged so many multiplayer games in the single player, but I have to acknowledge also that those developers, whether it's massive with the division or gearbox with borderlands, et cetera, they, they're pretty explicit that you can play those games by them by yourself and that they're engineered to be played by yourself. They never mm-hmm. made that claim with this game, but nonetheless, I went in thinking that I could at least get, make a go of it and at least understand it. But there was something about if I if I had known what I know about the game now, I don't think I would have tried it, which is so which is so ironic. And it was really the unintrusive nature. It all started as kind of a slow trickle, because as I was saying to people, because I have 2000 friends on my list, like a maxed out PSN friends list, there's always a bunch of people playing it. And the only thing you can do in game, you can do other things on PSN, but in game, you can't shut off your multiplayer functionality. You can either make it so it's public or friends only. So even when I would make it friends only, I still had people jumping into my games constantly. And in the beginning, I would just kick them out. And then eventually I just let them stay. And then I was like, oh, this is totally fine. And then before I know it, I was looking for games that I didn't have to host that other people were leading the way on. And so it's kind of a happy accident in yeah. some sense. We got to get you in like a session with us, Colin. The rest a of sesh? the LSM boys. Yeah. I, get you I, in Discord I, with us. Yeah, that would be fun. I, I'm i also curious if like, would you guys consider this? I, I described it uh, on Sacred Symbols as this, and I, I got no pushback. But is this a an extraction game? Like, no, uh, like, I would say it. I like when you say extraction shooters, I'm thinking of like Tarkov and stuff. So, what differentiates like, that experience from this experience? Apart, because you're going in and then so, getting out, right? Yeah, Tarkov. Like, I don't have a ton of experience in Tarkov, but it's very hardcore. Like, you are essentially uh, extracting at the end of everything, but there's a lot more like. A lot more going on in Tarkov. Like there are quests you're also doing, and of course there's PvP out in the wild. Like, and if you die in those games, I'm pretty sure you lose everything. Right. So it's about kind of repeating a lot. I think that's what Marathon's going to be much more like, Colin. From okay. what I understand. Yeah, because I, I wonder. Yeah, uh, cause I'm trying to. Yeah, because I'm trying like to find mission out. Mission based. Fr- right. Okay. Levels. Mission based and PVE. Yeah. So because I'm trying to find like what other game I might like, and I know I'm going to get a bunch of recommendations, and I I want people Left to be dead. Yeah, well, I actually did like Left 4 Dead back in the exactly. day. So that, that's a good example. Yeah, I li- and I like Horde mode in Gears yeah, as well. Yeah, Tide. You would like Vermintide. I guess I'm Vermintide. kind of understating like the amount of online games I've played in some sense, but <laughs> because, because I don't, I play so many games and I don't, you know, if I'm playing yeah. something for 10 or 20 hours, it doesn't even feel like I'm really playing it. But yeah, yeah. But um, it's funny because I, I said that last week, I think on the show in the, in the division, I, since I refuse to play with anyone, I can never get out of the dark zone. I never once got out of the dark zone <laughs> one time, never once. I would get things I would get so close sometimes I'd always get jumped. You know, um, I know this feeling. Yeah, I, I play the division single player as well. I, I love the division for reading the placards in the museums. So I'm a weird gamer. I love that. Uh, I love that series. It's so good. Yeah. Division yeah. is good. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with playing stuff solo. Like, I think that's totally fine. But you do miss out on some stuff. Can well, be a some lot, of them are clearly designed away from that solo, like Helldivers. Yeah. And yeah, I'm reliably yeah. informed from the internet that the game I was trying to find the name for is Chrome Hounds. Chrome Hounds. Chrome okay, Hounds. Yeah, I, yeah, I never played that. Cool. Nice deep cut, um, Hogue. That was a good deep cut. Now, Hogue, let's move on to the next game you want to talk about. Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown. I played like an hour and a half of this game, and I thought it was very good from what I played. Yeah, but I, I want to hear your, your thoughts. Honest to God, I think this is the best Metroidvania since Super Metroid and Symphony of the Night. I mean, I think if, <laughs> if this had come okay. out since then, this would be the name of part of the genre. And Prince of Persia has a storied history. I mean, Prince of Persia right. was a game that I was playing 
on, I think, like Apple IIe's in my elementary school. So Prince of Persia has been around a long time. Uh, this is a new take on it. It's a lot more um, agile. And this is one mm -hmm. of the reasons I wanted to talk about Tomb Raider at the same time, because Tomb Raider really is the original recipe Prince of Persia in 3D. Uh, and the remaster collection just kind of puts a button on that, because by all modern standards, Tomb Raider controls horribly. But it yes. controls perfectly for what it wants to be, which is this 3D Prince of Persia. And I think that's something that we could see a little bit more of in modern game design. There's been a kind of push for a long time for realism and instant reactivity to animations and things like that. And even some of that in Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown. Uh, but there is value in precision. And I think Tomb Raider has that. You can see kind of where the boxes are. You can see exactly how a jump is going to play out for you mechanically and that allows for the game to be a little bit less guided than we see in a lot of modern game design uh, and that kind of comes back around with like the final fantasy 7 rebirth yellow paint controversy if you want to call it that or yellow paint in any game as a controversy which is that graphics and the way games are designed right now are designed to be photorealistic and to not have a whole lot of distinction between what you can interact with and what you can't interact with on a like an asset level. And so they paint yellow, the things that you can interact with directly so that you know what to do. Prince of Persia, the lost crown is instead of that, a, a precise Metroidvania from a 2.5 D perspective and has fantastic bosses and a constant feeling of discovery. I don't know what makes a Metroidvania fun to you two gentlemen, but for me, it was always the notion that there was something new around the corner and something new to find when you got that missile pack or whatever, and you could come back and check out a new area. And the Lost Crown is the best at this that I have played in a long, long time and is constantly engaging, constantly interesting, and not too technically demanding. Uh, I have not, I am not the souls player in my group, right? I'm not the one that likes to parry everything ever. And, it, and Prince of Persia has a parry function that is very, very useful, but is not really kind of required just to make it past some of these boss fights. And some of them will really will really try you, will really strain you, but not to the level of an Elden Ring or a Dark Souls or whatever you want to compare it to. Uh, it also, on top of that, has an interesting narrative with interesting characters, which honestly are unexpected and almost like icing on the cake for a game of this type. And so I tend to be more generous towards Ubisoft games than some of the people on the internet. It's a company whose games I tend to like, but... Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown to me is a cannot be missed full game of the year contender for 2024, even if we're only at the middle of February. And I couldn't recommend it more. Yeah. Uh, like I said, Helga, I only played a little bit, but I was super impressed with how much story presentation there was in this game. You know, I'm used to a lot of Metroidvanias. Like, of course, there's a story, but story, I feel like, takes the background a lot. Metrovanias, but at least from what I played, and I know is the more earlier parts of the game, there was a lot going on, a lot of characters, a lot of fleshing out the plot, like explaining why you are where you're at and all that stuff, the history of who you are. You're like this uh this group of warriors. They're called what, the immortals or something? They are the immortals, yes. Yeah. And you're not even actually the Prince of Persia in this game. You're a different guy named Sargon. Is his name Sargon? I'm trying to remember. It's been That's a while. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Sargon, the Rabashar, I think. The, the but Black it is a Wind. cool yeah, it's a cool approach. And one thing I always appreciate and I always value highly in games and especially Metrovania is, is the atmosphere and the tone of being in this city, like this abandoned city that you're in. I think it's really great so far. And the movement is really good. Like Prince of Persia, of course, platforming roots and all that stuff. But like, man, it he is Sargon is really fluid and it feels really good to move him around. Like Colin, I, you're going to absolutely love this game whenever you get to it. I can't wait. Oh, for I, pl I platinum. I platinum it. Maybe. Oh, you did. I didn't even know yeah. that. OK, yeah. yeah. I was like, wow. Colin's going to love this shit. Yeah, I, I got so. the platinum in it. Um, yeah, I loved it. I, I just I thought it was I don't think I love it as much as some other people do. And I think that there are some fundamental problems with it, in my opinion. But mm -hmm. a major problem I had, Hogan, I don't know. You do you play on PS5 or Xbox PC? I am playing this game on the PS5. The PS5. So I don't know how it's working for you now. I'm sure it's been patched, but this game was buggy as hell. Um, this was one of the buggiest games I played in a long time. There were there were entire. You'll appreciate this. There was a and this was discovered on PSN profiles how to get around it. That's how I discovered how to how to figure this out. But there was a specific mission you get from a guy with like a moon icon in like this room. 
and you talk to him. And then every time it would be repeatable, like in different parts of the game, I would let it go and, and come back. I would freeze. You couldn't move. So you couldn't accept the mission. You'd have to hard start, you know, shut the game down, come back and just not do that mission. Eventually, it was realized that if you did that mission, shut your PlayStation controller off and then turned your PlayStation controller back on, it would work. Um, ah, like weird shit. Like, we call like, that the Hideo. Yeah, yes, exactly. An unintentional, <laughs> yeah, an unintentional fight with a with an MGS character. And so I in in some sense, I I think um there were just problems throughout the game, freezing problems, crashing problems that I had pretty endemic to it that made it that hurt it a little bit. And I think a bigger problem for me, and you had brought this up earlier, was I just don't like 2.5D. Like mm. I, I just I don't it's fine, but I don't know any game that would have been better as a 2.5D game than just a 2D game. And I, I, I think you could have gotten, I imagine, I, I don't want to put everything through the lens of Castlevania, but this is, a, this is a genre that you're inspired by when you're making a game like this. And imagine beautiful pixel art for a game like this. Uh, imagine oh, yeah. f- parallax scrolling and all of the beautiful things. As I'm playing that game, Lords of Exile. It's like, this game is beautiful, you know? And imagine what the Ubisoft could have done with so i just look at 2.5d fundamentally when i see it as a cop-out and when games that i really like do it like uh bloodstained is a good example i'm like this is disappointing because this would be an amazing game even more if it was if it looked like symphony of the night but instead it's only inspired by symphony of the night and so games like shovel knight and axiom verge and others would not be as beloved if they were not pixel art games and i think that that kind of hurts this game for me, though. I think they're trying to sell it at a certain price, though. I think it would be difficult to sell a $40 game like that, which is ridiculous because it would, it's actually more expensive and more difficult to make the game look like that. But I think that that would be lost on a lot of people and they'd be like, look at this ugly fucking SNES mm-hmm. game. It looks like Super Castlevania or something. And to me, I think that that's beautiful. So that was the aesthetic is nice. There's nothing wrong with it. I just fundamentally don't like 2.5D games. Um, sure, the, I think that's fine. Yeah, and I think... But the, they did use the 2.5D in some interesting ways, which I thought was cool in the boss fights in terms of there was that one boss fight where he shoots the arrow in the air and then all the arrows come down and it has like a 3D effect because you're seeing it from above. That's something that you couldn't do in a 2D game. So they do mm-hmm. go in with the camera and kind of show the 3D nature of it more greatly. So it's not like they don't use it at all. The The bigger thing I thought was because people were talking so much about the cool map functionality with like taking screenshots and making notes, which is very cool. And I was I actually never really used it because I but when I got the platinum, because I would use the other just markers with like the treasure chest icon or the question mark and just be done with it. But I thought the maps were kind of sloppy. Like, Mm. I don't I think the game kind of reads strange. I like again, because you're in 2.5 D, you can't do squares. You can't like embrace the grid like you would in Metroid or something like that. And so that's my mind reverting back to things that I want more than what I'm getting. But I I think that there are so many Metroidvania games now. And I'm at, for the first time in my life, I'm missing them. Like I'm the things are coming out and I'm like, I don't even know what that is, which is not usually they wouldn't get by the goalie. But I think yeah, that's there's, prob- there's a ton on PC, especially. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> and it's cool. But there are not many that that hit me so hard anymore like time spinner i remember being one that was like this is fucking awesome um and obviously uh hollow knight was superb i gotta play the ori games i only played ori one at an event for Mm -hmm. a while but i never beat it and obviously never got anywhere close to beating it so have you played blasphemous no and that was no i did i did play the first blasphemous briefly okay okay i found it kind of stiff and difficult this is where i was this is where i was getting into the People, some people describe that as a Souls game, right? This is where I was getting into. Oh, blasphemous! Yeah, oh. this is where I get into the like. What are we describing with with yeah. these games? I, I, and again, I don't think you can use that term with two D games. I would um, just say to me, blasphemous is much more of a Metroidvania than a Souls like. It just has like a couple elements, I guess, from Souls like, but its core is a Metroidvania. Like Hogue brought up earlier, you, you die, you get your your health back and stuff like that, or your souls back. Small elements like and challenging difficulty people is always associated with souls like. But uh two kind of gets fixes or changes some of that column. Blasphemous is really good if you ever get around to it. Yeah, I'd like to to check that. I I love the genre. I mean, it's one of my favorite. Yeah, I know. There's so many games. I totally it, understand. It, it totally and I'm just such a mark for just traditional games. You know, I, 
there's yeah. just that's what I loved about that Lords of Exile game so much is like the holy shit, it's just a complete yeah, rip-off. Well, we'll get into it. Oh yeah, I don't. But mean uh, to- you brought up pixel art, Colin. And I'm usually with you on a lot of things. Like I was, I'm always hoping Street Fighter will go back to pixel art or fighting <sighs> games in general. Will go God, that was so because cool, I think man. of like the animations, like the like Third Strike when the way everyone looks is just like. Third Strike Marvel kissed. versus Capcom, dude. Like yeah, these Marvel's are beautiful, Cap- gorgeous these are games. Beautiful games, beautiful. Yeah. And I and I still say Symphony of the Night is one of the most beautiful games ever. I yeah, mean, it's gorgeous. People just, uh, I get it. You know, it's you want to feel different. evolving, but I just, yeah. I think you can get deep atmosphere out of those games. Yeah, you know? I do too. I wonder if that's because we're we grew up with some of that. I'm not sure what the younger audience thinks about a lot of that stuff. I have no idea, but I still think it looks great. I can tell you my daughters love pixel art, but I think oh, that's, that's great because it's a little bit rarer. Sure. Yeah, mm, I could totally see that. Um, any other final thoughts on Prince of Persia, Hug? I, I love it. I don't hate 2.5D, although it's not my favorite. I do think that Colin might be underselling a little bit how much they swing the camera around. They're, they're mm. pretty dynamic with that uh, throughout the game, and I was pretty surprised almost every time it happened. It reminded me of like a Final Fantasy VII camera swing, right? And they, oh. would, they would do that a lot cool. uh, throughout. And I think the most important bit of it in terms of the design is that it is just really well paced. It keeps driving to the next thing very well. And I tend to get, not bored, bored is the wrong word, but a little bit stagnant and not so interested in playing some of these games like in the middle section. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this drives right through that. And I, I really think... Anybody that's at all interested in a Metroidvania type game with very high end production values and super responsive action should try out Prince of Persia, uh, unless they hate 2.5D. <laughs> I don't know how it would look in pixels or in full 2D. I guess I would worry that it would look more like a Rayman Legends type, right. and, I, and I prefer this look to that. Mm. Uh, I don't think I don't think you were going to get a Ubisoft pixel art game, so uh, I no. guess. In the reality that we have, I like what we got. I like yeah. how it looks. It is yeah. aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right, guys. It's time for Sort It Out. If you don't know this segment, listeners, viewers, this is a segment we just talk about. Something that's annoying us in the game industry. Could be a company, game itself, person. Who knows? Ho, you're our guest. Let's start with you. So I have to say somebody who needs to sort things out. Yes. Okay. Well, let's go with the folks running the servers for Helldivers. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think that's the sword out from everyone on the planet right now. <laughs> no, everyone's I mean, I, like. <laughs> and I, I have a certain amount of business empathy for this, right? Because yeah. you don't. You don't think your game that has this, the 6,000 concurrent is going to have 450,000 concurrent the next time. And you don't want to pre buy things that you aren't going to need so server stacks and infrastructure is always one of these things that happens with a multiplayer game that that busts out yeah uh but i do think when you're a week a week later you are you are testing the patience of the fans that are loving your product yep i agree colin that was going to be my answer as well and that's why i didn't totally want to be because I, I, i'm sure some people were like this this is very conspicuous that they're not talking about this it's because i didn't want to ruin this this moment uh, i didn't know others were going to pick it too but i'm glad to hear it is um Sony needs to figure this out. And mm-hmm. listen, I'm not a technical person at all. I know that. But you would think I have this imagination, maybe I'm totally wrong on this, that a company like Sony in urgent times can take out its big swinging dick with other companies and say like we need urgent help here. We need urgent access, we need whatever. And you would think that if you're buying server space or accommodating, and I, I said this on Sacred Symbols too, and this comes from a place of, of ignorance, no doubt, but you would think that there would be like some sort of like, we have a spigot with all of this access to server farms or whatever we need, infrastructure that's ready for our games that are coming. And we can give a little bit of it as needed to all these different things in a way that's more urgent than 10 days. And the game is still not really functioning. I have never gotten into it since the day it came out without having to wait. Like it never just goes on. And I said this in a sacred symbols group text that, and this comes from where my ignorance in, in, um, in multiplayer gaming generally, but as I understand it, these games typically have 
readable cues. And that yes. seems to be what you're entered into, but it makes it look like it's just not working or you get mm-hmm. these weird, like an error message that says negative one. It's like, oh, okay. And then there's just a countdown from 30 to zero. And then it just stays there again. It's like, can't you, what is stopping you from fixing this? I don't, I don't understand how it's that complicated. You're not a 30 person team with an independent, you know, amount of money or VC, like we were saying earlier, you're fucking Sony. Mm -hmm. To me, I just think at some point you have, you go in and you fix the problem. And I know that that's easier said than done. But again, in my imagination, I imagine these multi corp multinational corporations with billions of dollars and all this technical expertise going back to the fucking post-war period. You think they would have some sort of idea on how to fix the problem. So I think that that's an urgent thing and it is worth asking why people are okay with it. Like that, I think is a reasonable question to ask. Is it a bias towards PlayStation? I think a little bit. Is it, is it the game is so good and it's not stopping you from getting in completely. You usually just have to kind of amorphously wait and hope you get in. Like I left it on for 45 minutes yesterday before I got in and I just did other shit. And then in in the corner of my eye, I see like, Oh, now I'm on my, uh, my ship and I'm ready to go. That's weird. So uh, it is, I think it's worth asking why Sony has gotten eights and nines on the game. I can imagine like there. So, and people might, I don't know why people would be surprised me saying that, but that's how I feel about it. I think that there's more to be said about this, but I think that it has to all shake out first, but there's no doubt that they're, they're shitting the bed for as big as hell divers is right now. It could be bigger and they have mm-hmm. to know that mm-hmm. like they have to know that they've turned people off. They have to know, especially on steam. I, I would, I'd be curious to know how many people returned it. You know? Yeah, um, sure. So I'm not saying uh, it's like they're not crying. They they have all this fucking sorts of money from this game. I'm just saying it could even be better. That must be frustrating because the numbers are tempered. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, so. So, I mean, I'll just kind of give you my perspective on some of this of what you're saying. Not because I don't disagree with you and I think they absolutely should fix it is. I will say from the review standpoint, I'm assuming because, you know, you reviewed games too, Colin is. I am assuming that they reviewed this probably in a week. Honestly, when I was playing, when it came out, when I was playing it, I wasn't really having any problems, but it seems like the problems have gotten worse over time. So that could be one thing. I have no idea. And I guess what you're saying with people putting up with it is for me, as someone who's played a lot of online games throughout the years is I kind of expect this with a lot of online games. You know, I've gone through Diablo three. I've gone through World of Warcraft. I've gone through Final Fantasy expansions. Like I'm used to the games coming out and them not working for like a week. And that's just kind of, I'm used to that. I'm not saying it's right and it shouldn't be like that, but I'm just used to it. So I guess that's a lot of it. It is for probably a lot of PC players also. Like I remember Classic WoW and stuff like that, even recently just waiting in queue for stuff like that. I'm just... I am just kind of used to call them, but it does suck. And I think they need to absolutely fix it because they are a huge company. So they got to be all on hands on deck with this game, getting it going. But yeah, that's just my perspective on it. So I don't know. Uh, for my sorted out, I guess I just kind of just talk about Microsoft in the sense of just kind of like their whole thing last week, the podcast, it was just kind of weird. The whole, how everything was laid out, how they explained everything. I didn't learn a lot new. Like, I guess they kind of confirmed four things, but they're like the four games. They didn't even tell us what they were. They kind of were contradicting each other about what they were saying. Like they were still very vague about a lot of stuff. And it was the TLDR. Like this could have been a blog post kind of thing. It felt kind of unnecessary. The whole thing. I don't understand why they did it. They could have just said like, Hey, yeah, we got four. Like it, it should have just been a blog post, especially when they weren't giving us so much information they're still being vague about a lot of stuff. It was like cool to hear about Diablo coming to Game Pass. Like, that's cool. But I I have so many more questions still. I'm like, well, is that expansion that's coming out for Diablo this year going to be on Game Pass also? I wish they kind of just answered a lot more to that stuff. They left a lot of questions still up in the air. And I was hoping they would kind of solve or like lay them out more so it'd be concrete. But um, the, uh, the, yeah, I'm sure the, you're used to all that with them. Anyways, I know you don't like their messaging. Their messaging is horrible. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know that anyone would make any other legitimate argument to say that their messaging is good. Their messaging is not good. Mm-hmm. Um, and it hasn't been for a long time. And they do a lot of messaging. Like, that's the other thing is that they won't shut the fuck up. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, yeah, that's true. Which, is, which is, makes it even stranger. But I think the Game Pass. The, so talk about messaging. 
and we we saw this in real time actually on um, on sacred symbols as we were discussing it, and then things were kind of coming out in clarifications where they were like, we have 34 million Game Pass subscribers. And I was like, oh, well, that's not great. But they set a number. That's on, interesting. I think it's been 25 months since they set a number. And then they said something like, and everyone is going to get, all 34 million of them will get access to Diablo 4, like we were saying, right? And uh, and then they come out, like like was noted in many places, they come out and say like, wait a minute, 34 million subscribers. And then Tom Warren or whatever from The Verge asks them, does that core subscribers too? And they're like, yeah. So 34 million people can't be getting Diablo then. Or is it, is it going to be one of the core games? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. So like, it's like you, you can't even get your messaging right in a pre-recorded podcast. And then, and you revealed that your Game Pass subscribers potentially didn't go up at all. That was the more surprising thing too, where I'm like, damn, dude, that it's actually worse than I thought from a subscriber point of view. You could argue that they are literally still at 25 million paying you know, Game Pass subscribers after two, three years. I think it's pretty, I think it's, uh, I, I again, if I, I think if people believe their messaging as it was laid out I, and they didn't read between the lines, they're going to be in for a rude awakening because there'll be a game five, a game six, a game seven, a game eight, a game nine, a game 10, uh, and so on and so forth. And that's going to be what they said it over and over again. We need to do what's good. And especially in the interviews that came out that they did the supplement interviews, we need to, we need to do what's good for the Xbox brand, like the viability of the Xbox brand and the writings on the wall there. So I agree with you. I, I don't know what would have been smart to do. The hi-fi rush leak within the game made it incontrovertible that they were coming to PlayStation because it's yeah. for people that don't know, it's an image of the character holding his guitar, like a sword, like a cloud would. cloud. Yeah. And so that's in there, which I also think is weird that they would use that as the like, which is not even a real the exclusive. <laughs> it's kind of, not a yeah, <laughs> neither here nor there, but that's weird. But um, so I think that 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 kind of made things more troubling for them because I think they actually could have just avoided this completely. But I don't like the idea that's going around, and we discussed this earlier, I think, or maybe it was on Sacred that like people there's this idea that rumors were being buried with different people in order to float things to see what would be popular and what wouldn't and all that. And I don't like that game theory around that simply because wouldn't that burn their people? Like if you're using, so if you're like reversing it and now using these people to seed things very much like in politics, like when a New York times thing, like it's like someone told them that they didn't go find that out. Right. Right. Um, Typically speaking, wouldn't you burn those sources if they end up being wrong? And if so, why would you do that? And if so, why would the person people take the bait? Because I think the one major thing here is that I think we realize that most Xbox insiders don't know anything about mm-hmm. what's going on. And really, these stories come from two or three people that were then amplified unknowingly by a lot of other people. Like, I think people like Tom Warren, Jez Corden, and those guys have connections. I don't believe yeah. any of these other guys do. And I yeah. think that so you either have to read it one way or the other. Either these people were used and wrong. Or they were just dead up wrong, but either way they were wrong. But I, but I do believe that when when it's coming out, like when Tom Warren's the one that said Starfield and and India are being considered, I believe that, and yeah. I believe that Starfield after that DLC is going to come out, like six months after that shattered whatever DLC is going to come out, then it'll come to PlayStation. I believe that, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think I think Indiana Jones is probably some sort of imperative to bring that to PlayStation, uh, because we already know that. Disney's licenses with Spider-Man are insane. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. And we know the light too. The licensing money is flowing like wine. Didn't we just learn that um Hasbro made or I guess Wizards of the Coast made something like 90 million dollars from yeah, Baldur's from Baldur's Gate. Gate. Yeah. They didn't even do anything. So that's nice, free money. Yeah, so free they're money. Gonna, they're, everyone's going to want that. So I just think it's more frustrating for people to like do this to themselves if they're so heavily invested in Xbox remaining like this exclusive bastion. It's like, why are you doing this to yourself? You're just going to, you're going to be so disappointed. You know, you are, and it's ultimately going to be that way for everyone, but it's going to happen in some sort of order and Microsoft's going to go first. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. It's, it's, I'm so glad it's behind us in some sense now, although it's not because now every Xbox game that's announced, I'm I'm going to wonder if it's going to come to to PlayStation. I'm going to assume that it probably will at some point. And I think that, (laughs) <laughs> on one hand, Phil Spencer saying all these things on his on his podcast, and then he's telling The Verge like 
and we look at a, an industry in five years where no one has exclusives. <laughs> it's like, okay, mm-hmm. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, but tell that to Nintendo, dude. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's what I said. I was like, that's a fat chance with Nintendo. Yeah. Like PlayStation, I think should consider playing nicer just yeah. because I think you, you want to explore, you know, on one hand, on one hand, I, I think they can make the argument. I think on one hand, they believe internally, like we can put our knee on their necks now and be done mm-hmm. with this, you know? So I don't think they're going to get fucking anything from them. But there's another there's another you know, there's another consideration, which is like, oh, we could actually play nice with them and coerce more out of them, you know. Uh, But I think that what do you think about that? Do you think that Xbox is in a vulnerable position now as far as not going away? I never thought that that was going to happen. But now, like, it's over, basically, right, with them and Sony. And I think Sony should probably focus now on Nintendo, I would think would be the next target of of the audience you'd want to grab. I think what happens in the quarter one financial reports with Xbox set an alarm bell in Xbox internally that holding the exclusives from the acquisitions for their own service was not moving the needle on hardware sales or Game Pass sales. And honestly, at the time of acquisition, the fight would have been, all right, do we sell these into Sony that has a bigger market, a bigger player base? Uh, Or do we hold them for ourselves and increase our hardware sales and Game Pass subscriptions? And if that doesn't move, and maybe they didn't give it enough time, right? You never know. These strategic fights happen. Even big companies that are worth trillions of dollars still have people running them. uh, And you have these political fights happen internally. What looks to have happened is that the Xbox team decided that, or the Microsoft team decided that they could not justify not making the money from the PlayStation fans and the PC fans or whoever, the, the rest of gaming, because they weren't even selling more of the hardware and the Game Pass. So do I think they're vulnerable? Yes, because Sony has the bigger uh, installed base. They're going to continue to have that. And Xbox seems to mostly be yielding on those grounds. And so they don't have a lot of leverage to even negotiate with Sony, right? You say, you get access to our player base. Well, Sony says, well, okay, it's not the worst thing. We like more players, but your player base isn't that substantial. And that's the business conversation, right? That's that's why those voices in Microsoft are so strong is that the Sony base is so big, much bigger that it's leaving money on the table to not sell into that. And Sony is facing the inverse of that. So I wouldn't be surprised if Sony tried to negotiate hard against Xbox, depending on what things look like in the future, and even for maybe different terms on what the revenue share is. I mean, I think there's a whole lot of discussions that are going to be happening on the business side between these two companies and Microsoft is not in a position of strength. That doesn't mean that they can't leverage other things, right? As you mentioned earlier in this episode, they provide Azure services to Sony. uh, And so that's going to be a part of the discussion as well. When you have strategic partnerships like that, everything is on the table, right? What are the rates? What are the amounts? What is, what is the access point? What is the rates that you're going to charge for access to our software? And that can go both ways depending on, exactly how good your negotiators are, but Sony doesn't have a lot of incentive to play ball uh, on this. And I think that'll play out in the ultimate result, not because either side is, ha- has worse negotiators, just because the leverage usually answers the question of how these things play out. Yeah, that's very well said. I think mm-hmm. it, to me, there's something full circle about Sony recalibrating its business to focus on Nintendo again. Because I think one of the I think one of the understated things about the first generation of PlayStation was it was built, as we know, out of the scorn from Nintendo, their arch rivals to this day. And the consequent, like Sony was always focused on Nintendo and they happened to kill Sega, but that was like collateral damage. They, they wanted to kill Nintendo, you know, um, Sega had to die for Nintendo to die. And that's why Sega games ended up on GameCube first, right? First, you know, obviously Sega Dreamcast and then into the GameCube era and Xbox later on and played kind of nicely with Sony last. And so there's something kind of interesting from the business perspective of ending up back where you began, which is here are the two companies, you know, um, in the in the core gaming space. And I think Nintendo's success with lower end portable hardware has been massively influential on the futures of these consoles. I think it's fairly clear there's going to be a handheld Xbox. I mean, I think that that's a pretty compelling rumor. And it sounds like there's going to be a handheld PlayStation, you know, like a real I one. Have, yeah. I have long said that the, the race for photorealism is in some ways a mistake, right? You see that with Nintendo. You see that you can get good gaming experiences that people enjoy, that people even go to your console for 
without 4K resolution and with the various other bells and whistles that PlayStation and Xbox compete on, right? Now, it's not to say I don't love those kinds of things when they appear in games. I'm looking forward to Rebirth. I enjoyed Cyberpunk, these kinds of things. But I also have enjoyed Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey and various other things that don't on a technical level compete with any of the things that PlayStation and Xbox are putting out. But the fact that foam stars on Sony looks better than breath of the wild is kind of not an important data point for whether I'm having more fun with one or the other. And so I think Sony will fight Nintendo. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I think Xbox will still being one of the biggest publishers of video games in the world now, especially after the acquisitions, have a lot to say in how that all works out, regardless of whether they have a plastic box or not. But I also think that folks are underestimating the chances of a new entrant, right? I mean, you've got big tech companies that make technological hardware that are sitting and looking at this industry and saying there's a whole lot of money there. Now, you've got a lot of history also of not, them not succeeding, whether it's Google or Amazon or these various other companies. But I do think an Amazon or even a Meta on the Facebook side uh, or someone else is going to say, let's have this conversation. And you're going to have an upstart, much like Microsoft and the Xbox was earlier this century. Yeah, that's an, it's, yep. it's interesting to think, too, that what you're saying speaks to what I mentioned earlier, Hogue, which was why does it have to be Microsoft? And I feel like they've kind of had their shot. They didn't really, it's not resonating to the point where they're going to be a dominant player. Now, I think Phil Spencer spoke to this a little bit about what the way they see things, which is as the biggest publisher, right? And that would be something very different for a company that doesn't really publish entertainment stuff. You know, like the the Xbox Mm -hmm. is really their only entertainment flex at all. So I wonder who the new competitor could or would be, and would it be an old scorn competitor? I mean, Apple was in there once with the Pippin and all that kind of shit, or would you have fucking Samsung or I don't know. I don't even know. Like, it, it, I just think con- it's like making, I keep saying this on sacred. It's like making a car. Like these things are so difficult in their own ways. Obviously making a car is much more difficult and much more expensive, but it's actually easier in some sense. Cause you just put it out the, the, the door and you sell it as opposed to having this thing where you need people to come back and use it. Um, dump money into it not gas money but money that goes back to you this goes back into the bmw subscriptions for things like heated seats and shit like that they even want to get in on that money but i just uh i do wonder like who would have the gumption to do it and is it even is it even worth it to get into a into a situation like you could be someone like tom at moore's law is dead who says cloud gaming will never truly work the way we think it will because of the laws of physics and or you can be someone who's like the inevitability of this console as future is nonetheless inevitable. And if you look at it with through the second lens, then why would you even bother getting involved now? It, you might want to be at the, the tip of the spear with the next revolution. You mm-hmm. just don't want to be on live or something that's like way too early, you know, but right. It just seems yeah, well, like I mean, first mover yeah. advantage is real, but it also getting there too early is real, right? You mm-hmm. could argue that the Xbox One and the check-ins and the various things they were doing with digital ownership was ultimately well forecasted, but way too early to sell into the marketplace. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And yeah. Th- I mean, that's de- demonstrably too. I think there's multiple just, I think about that even with Ouya in some sense, not that it would have been this like huge platform, but just that it's like this, this very cheap, easy to crack open, and fuck around with machine. I always, I always thought it was going to fail because I think it was just, it was stupid because it was, it was like this Android mobile device. And I'm like, you just didn't market it right of what it could have been. And I think Xbox one is a similar thing, although they were ahead of the curve. Maybe they should have stuck with their guns. You know, I don't, that might have actually, anytime you have that change in strategy, you, re- you risk what we've seen a little bit with Xbox, which is you describe their messaging as bad. I would tend to agree with that. I would describe it as half measures. Like they all are always, half measures and everything sounds like it's in flux or fluid, right? Mm -hmm. You you might remember when they were raising the prices on the Xbox gold uh, and the entire social media storm that arose from that. And then they immediately wheel it back. That seems to be their pattern of talking to anyone. And I think this got out of hand with the Starfield, the PlayStation. And I never thought, even if that were a hundred percent true, that Xbox had decided Starfield's going to PlayStation is going it on this date, that that means the end of the Xbox brand. But they lost it when the internet lost it. And then they decided on the podcast, which Brad described as weird, and I think justifiably so, 
but I think they thought they had to say something about this to assuage fears and to more specifically try to communicate that they knew what they were doing. And I think sometimes that gets away from them. Yeah. Let's hear from uh, the listeners. They've got some sorted outs real quick. Sure. Uh, this is from Mubarak. Mubarak. Hey, lads. Loving the various summon sign uh, permutations thus far. My sorted out is dedicated at City Skylines 2 developer Colossal Order. Missing features, unstable PC experience, no console release date, and now content creators are on the cusp of moving on. I can't believe how quickly they've burned away the goodwill from Skylines 1, and it shows with uh, Steam numbers for Skylines 2 being well below Skylines 1. Yeah, I've not heard great things about the situation around that game. Yeah, I read I was reading a little bit about that. Yeah. I didn't know any, I didn't know anything about that till recently. The cities yeah. kind of came out of nowhere, right? I mean, I think you always have the risk of being a little bit of a one-hit wonder when you hit on these things, right? I would not assume mm-hmm. the next game uh in the Pal World universe would have the same <laughs> kind of resonance uh, as as Pal World 1. Uh and I think it's it's a bummer because I think that kind of story in PC gaming happens all the time and what it does is it prevents me from jumping in with things until I do like an hour of research to figure out whether it's even as described in the Steam uh, description and whether or not it's getting updated in the communications with the developers. I feel like you have to go write a research paper to buy some things on PC. It's one Mm -hmm. of the reasons I like console gaming better, even though that's kind of been whittled away a little bit because of how open some of the storefronts are on these various platforms. Yeah, they're bad. Uh, This is from Nightmare, Nightmare, Nightmare. Howdy, summoners. I have a sorted out for PlayStation. I've been having an awesome time with Helldivers 2, but please, Sony or Arrowhead, sort out the cross-play and add cross-progression or at least trophy progression on PC and console for goodness sake. I bought the game twice thinking this would be a no-brainer, especially because you have to sign into your PlayStation account on PC in order to play. Oh, and you do? I, I didn't know that. I said earlier yes. that you didn't have to. Oh, it's, So you have to have a PSN account to play it on PC? I believe so, yes. That's recall, it, why that's wouldn't kind of, they have progression then? Yeah, I was Great thinking question. that. Well, why would you also? That's so interesting. They have a bunch of captive people then. I, with PSN accounts. This is like a half measure in some sense where that's, that actually makes the whole Helldivers 2 success story a little bit more interesting to me. I believe they want to have cross progression, but it probably got bumped just to keep the game going for now, at least. All right, dudes, let's talk about keep it up. The exact opposite. Sort it out. Good news. Who's doing good right now? Hope, let's start with you again. Sure. I am going to say the Final Fantasy VII Remake Rebirth team. Not Square Enix. Not Square Enix. Let's not be confused there. Uh, But I do think that that particular team has been killing it with their teases and, and social media presence and what they've been showing of this rebirth project. And honestly, I don't think people have given them enough credit when remake came out and it was all said to be in Midgar and you were going to leave the city. There were a lot of questions about what a game that actually gets out into the open world in the final fantasy seven environment would look like in this series. And I think everybody that has seen this game and has played the demo uh, or is otherwise excited about this has been pretty happy with the direction they've gone. And I think that's, that's a tough thing, right? I mean, Taking on the Final Fantasy VII name, and even though I think they cheated a little bit on the marketing, uh, and and going forward and trying to make something that fits in that universe is brave in and of itself, and then succeeding is damn near impossible. So mm-hmm. keep it up, guys. You're going to get a lot of crap on the internet, regardless of how this game is, but I think you're doing oh. a good job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Colin, what about you? Yeah, first of all, well said about about uh, Square Enix, I think. Um, they're doing they're they're coming into their own again and i think that they're sorting out their future of big fewer mm-hmm. bigger games which is good and bad but i'm looking forward to playing rebirth as well uh for me i wanted to give a shout out to the few websites gaming websites and games journalists that i think are doing good work because there's just so much tripe and garbage out there and it's so bad. I, I I know because I I do read these websites every week on Wednesdays. I actually go around to every gaming web, like big gaming website for hours, and I open tabs like across my browser and just read and and take notes as I prepare for Sacred Symbols. That's where we all we get all of our citations and all that. And there are just websites that are just like Kotaku, for instance, just so 
bad. Like, I don't know who's reading it. Where Who's reading <laughs> this? Who's a Kotaku fan? Like, is there anyone out there that would be like, I'm a Kotaku fan? I don't think so. Like, I, I, I read some of this stuff and I'm like, I don't know who this is for, why you're writing this, who's paying for this. But then there are websites like, uh, and I think even websites like IGN are kind of falling into a, into a trap. Like they, they, some of their people do some good reporting, but it's always politically biased. It's always tainted with this opinion content that distracts from maybe some of the bigger things that they're trying to do. So I don't even want to give them too much credit, although we don't cite them very much. But Video Games Chronicle, I think, is just such a, an exceptional video game website. I wish mm -hmm. that they published more, but... They're very reliable over there, no matter who you're talking about. Andy Robinson, Jordan Midler, etc. And I think that if they report something, you can definitely believe it. If they say something from an, a source from theirs, you can definitely believe it. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's good aggregate sites too. not so a, not. I don't want to call them aggregate sites, but they don't do any original reporting. They're just kind of mimicking what's out there with a, a website like Push Square, I think is another really, really wonderful website that stays away from the bullshit cites their sources you can go to the original source so easily it's always bracketed at the bottom of each story so you can just open it in the new tab and read that instead if you want i just think though well let me back up the use of a of a, of a i don't even want to say a free press it's like video games like it's not that serious but a, <laughs> a, an unfettered press is important in video games but the financial realities of being able to support that kind of stuff are gone and done and I think there was this idea that even some of them, like I think some of them are trying to do it now from um, from some of the websites making a, a sort of defector or Grantland style website. It's like no offense, but to be able to do that, you have to have like a high level of talent and people need to like you and you don't have a high level of talent and a lot of people don't like you. You know, that would be like me thinking I can do that. Like too many people don't like me to be able to do a, like a like a Grantland or like this 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 huge kind of project. And so you find your when you find that that kind of work doesn't pay the bills anymore you either do more sensationalist work or you get into commentary which is what we do which is a crowded space a competitive space um you know half of my job is to put try to put some of our competitors out of business in my opinion because like we need the attention we need the the funds and the money that's the market and i just think that there's such a dearth of quality games reporting comparable to other spaces that i'm in whether it's politics mm -hmm. or sports or whatever like the amount of good sports reporting is huge there there are good sports reporters writing for almost every professional website or professional team in the united states not to mention the people that are interspersed and just you know editors at large at the athletic or espn like big stories break constantly nothing like that happens in games even when we have a big story like xbox and all the games it's all he said she said half of it's not true people are just full of shit so shout out to the guys that do it right and mm -hmm. uh, i think video games chronicles is is the the king of the, the pile there as far as i'm concerned it's not nice. a very impressive pile but being a king of it nonetheless is i uh, love vgc i quote them yeah. a lot and as a disclaimer i have written for them I, I wrote a couple articles for andy on the patent of the wb nemesis system and some other stuff Ooh. so they always get my seal of approval for trying to get it right i don't think you can promise anybody will always get everything right but they contact me when there's a legal question they don't know uh and there are a lot of other places that know me that don't do that. So I, I like VGC a lot. I'd also like to put in a shout out on this topic for seasoned gaming, where I do the Bitcast every weekend oh, with good. Ainsley Bowden and his team over there that are putting out really good game reviews and fighting the good fight for the labor of love version of the hobbyist gaming website. And so if you're interested in that, seasonedgaming.com, I believe is their website. And I, I really enjoy them as well. Yeah, we've crossed right. over before. Um, yeah, he, he's nice and they're yeah, good company uh, over there as well. And VGC, I think Hogue is an example too of a, of of it. I see like these things pop up. It's like, oh, there should be a new video game website. I'm like, that sounds fucking suicidal. I don't know why anyone would do that. But VGC, while not new at all, uh, has become newly relevant. Like it was irrelevant. Yeah, they carved out their niche in the yeah, last couple of years. Definitely. Like it was an irrelevant brand, in my opinion, mm -hmm. until maybe Andy took over. I don't know if it was like when those guys went over there, but it's like it's it, you could turn it around. Like when you see a ship like Kotaku, they couldn't pay me enough to go fucking try to turn that ship around. But someone might be able to do it. 
you see something oh, yeah. like DGC and you can be like, this is possible. You just need to not have um, insane writers with political ideologies that they must put into all things, no matter what well, happens. Kotaku is a good, uh, a good one here because I used to go to Kotaku a lot. And for the most part, I only really see it now on terrible social media posts that they make about some topic or another. Uh, and I think the last one I saw where – I got into my fighting stance was when they said, I think Rebirth might be a sequel to Final Fantasy VII. And I, I think I tweeted out, uh, yeah, okay, so you played Final Fantasy VII Remake. It's like, they're, they're not hiding the ball by the time you get to the end of that game, guys. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and Kotaku obviously has its own political bent. Various places on the internet have their own political bent. Uh, I think it's strange that video game reporting has as much kind of politics and editorializing as it does. Uh, but I've always been in favor of anybody being able to find whatever flavor of journalism or media that they want. I just don't think that that's particularly useful for understanding whether the next Resident Evil is a fun game to play. Uh, and so I think video game media could be better, but yep. I don't see it getting a lot better in the near term, so I like calling out the ones that are doing it right. And I, I like Andy. I've been in... Uh, in internet contact with him for a while. And so I'm glad to see VGC seemingly doing well. Yeah. I actually yep. tried to pitch them on help before they launched their podcast. I liked what they were doing so much. I pitched them. I was like, could we work together to try to get you guys? Like you need a podcast presence. Like we could produce that for you. Like you guys are of a great talent. They had plans that they already had in, in motion and they probably wouldn't want to work with me on that, on that level anyway. But I saw they are one of the few that are doing it right. And, they're slowly just you're right about Kotaku. It was highly relevant at one time, highly relevant. Mm -hmm. I used to uh, read it all the time. Yeah. I mean, they broke stories all the time. They had a, they, I didn't like some of their writers, but they had a good cast of writers and I was good friends with Jason at one time, not good friends, but friends with Jason at one time and others that were there, you know, Steven Totillo, obviously, although Steven Totillo stole my, uh, my, <laughs> the quarry exclusive uh, scoop, scoop and then pretended that he yeah. that he found it in that, that so that that ruined my opinion of him to some degree um but yeah it's strange how it's turned into commentary really which is good it's it's good to decentralize things no, have no more gatekeepers and if you can and this is important to me on sacred although i let everyone do what they want to do on our shows is to like just eschew entirely connections and tethers to pr to publishers and developers and just play buy and play games the way everyone else does and be an everyman and it's it's very different that that's now appealing that would have been so that would be like the equivalent of writing a newsletter and stuffing it into people's mailboxes in 1995 or something it's mm. but that and everyone would be like i don't want this shit i want fucking egm and nintendo power and all that and now they do want this it's just divided and subdivided in many different ways and that's why i wanted to talk to the ign union people and they were nice i, I have no problem with that i don't even know who i was talking to on via email but it's like I don't mind private sector unions. They don't bother me. I think that's totally fine. No, but do we got to do, but I, I'm it's to me, I wanted to ask him like, doesn't this seem like the wrong time? Like, isn't it too late? Wouldn't it have been made more sense if like the Greg's and the Collins and the Damon Hatfields and like the, the Claymans and all the like really popular editors at one time did this for you, but we didn't know to do it at the time. And now it's kind of too late. Like you have, mm -hmm. you don't have that kind of intrinsic value. And that's kind of a sad reality of a site like IGN that gets two thirds or so of its traffic from wikis. The, the, you know who's like really valuable there are the strategy guide writers. That's, okay, always, yeah. that's always, always been true. I was one of them at one time. That's like an unfireable position at this point, probably at IGN. And so, yeah, yeah so yeah, I, I, I'm going on and on. But shout out to the few websites and the few people that, you know, the few people that care about accuracy. There are even people at some of these websites. I'm not going to name them that that are that play into the fanboyishness and the and the annoying and the annoying kind of YouTuber mentality that taints their work and taints their products. Um, and you can't have it both ways, in my opinion. This is why some people get mad at me. I had this kind of it wasn't a backhanded comment necessarily, but no one was pointing out that at the Xbox podcast, who was conducting it? Did you guys notice? Um, I heard who you said it was. Yeah, it's Tina Amini, I think her name is, who was the editor in chief of IGN. And it's like, what? This isn't, and, and everyone just, and even half the people that know that, they're like, who cares? 
Mm-hmm. It's like, you don't see why that matters. It was the same reason why when Jonathan, and I don't mean to pick on him, but Jonathan Dornbush, who ran Podcast Beyond, my old podcast at IGN, long after we left, he left, left and became Naughty Dog's community manager. And I'm like, that's not weird to anyone. It's not like he just snapped his fingers and became that. You have to get over right. the mental hurdle. All right, first, I'm looking for a job. I'm looking for a job with the company I cover. I'm going to start reaching out to the company I cover. I'm going to start mm-hmm. doing interviews with the company I cover. This is going to start going in the background. These are months long processes. Right. And so people that even would do shit like that or even want to or are willing to do shit like that, were never in it for the right reasons. And it makes you wonder if you, you should have ever trusted them at all. Imagine, for instance, if Jonathan was in this conversation for four months with Sony about being a community manager from his application to, to, to doing his interviews, he was covering them that whole time. Yeah. It's like, yeah, is he going to yeah, pull his weird. punches? Like, I don't know, man. I just don't. I don't know what people don't see about that as being weird. So the people that stay on one side and then do the good work on one side, you got to appreciate that. In mm-hmm. some sense, Andy Robinson could very easily work for all sorts of publishers. Yeah, he could do consulting and all sorts of other things. I don't know. I, I respect when people almost it's not below your station. That's not it at all. It's like you're willing. You're fighting the good fight, as was said earlier. Mm hmm. Uh, I just got a quick keep it up real quick. Um, I have been experimenting a lot recently with randomizers in games. I did Resident Evil 1. I've been doing a little bit of Elder Ring. So keep it up, all the modders out there, giving a little longevity to some of those games. So, so talk, talk, to about, talk to me about that. What is, so what, what you play Resident Evil 4? For instance, no, it was 1. Re- Resident Evil remake 1. of 1. Remake, okay, so... so. So what what ran, it, what's randomized about it? It randomized all the item locations where everything is, wow. all the enemies and bosses. <coughs> wow. Can it break so, that way? No, there's they have things set up for so you can't like soft lock the game in a lot of yeah. ways. You can get crazier if you want to, but the ones I were doing were you can't soft lock it. But like, you know, I was walking down a hallway and a shark was just there in the hallway, started <laughs> swimming at me on the carpet, stuff like that. That's cool. Yeah, it was That's a lot cool. of fun. Uh, okay, uh, let's get a couple from the listeners real quick. Sup, some. Oh, this is from Joshua Smith. Sup, some and sus or sissies. Has that one been well, used yet? Okay. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just joined the Patreon this month and it's been worth every penny of my five dollars. I want to give a keep it up to Capcom because damn, <laughs> they've been knocking it out of the park. For quite a while now, it's good to have the Capcom I loved back. True. Capcom is always just doing such good work. I can't wait for um, Dragon's Dogma 2. It's going to be so good. Uh, this is from Moot. Hello, you summoners. Keep it up to Game Pass, Persona 3 Remake, Resident Evil 2, and 3. Brotado. That's how they ended it. Is that a game? Yeah, Brotado, 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 Brotado is a game. Yeah. Well, I don't even know what that is. What the hell is that? It is a uh, potato, a, I think it is. It, it's a Rotato? vampire survivors. I don't know what we're calling those uh, now. Auto shooter. Auto shooters, yeah. Yeah. Auto shooter survivor game. I don't know. Survivors. Yeah, you're a potato, you fight aliens. You know, the usual video games. Yeah. By the way, what is Phil Spencer what what benefit does he get for vampire survivors being exclusive to Xbox? Uh Great and, question. and not on PlayStation. Great oh, question. I, I was going to say, I play it on my Switch. So no, no, I know. It's not everywhere, but it's box. not on PlayStation conspicuously, and you know why. Yes. And I just wonder if someone would have maybe, if we had any real journalists asking me questions, <laughs> uh, that would have been an interesting follow-up. That would have been. I digress. Uh, Sean Mason wrote in real quick. Hey, Summoners. I have a quick keep it up to the Dukes, Maddie and Cog. I want to commend both of them for their excellent work. This week's episode of Defining Dukes showcased why they're among the finest in the Xbox community. Their balanced perspectives on the recent Xbox news provided a refreshing contrast to the polarized opinions that were seen all over Twitter. Uh, yeah, Maddie and Cog are awesome. They do great work. So hell yeah, we'll give them a shout out every yeah, time. They're killing it. They're killing it. Yeah. They're doing They're doing a wonderful job. And I felt bad. I don't, I don't think they really thought this, but it, it came up when we, we did the crossover episode where they're like, what happens? To, we didn't know what was going on with Xbox. And they're like, what happened? Basically, someone wrote in is like, is Defining Duke going to like, end if this just like they become a third party (laughs) publisher and i'm like no like at the very worst or at the very least we would just give them another show you know and keep Mm -hmm. them doing something else Mm -hmm. but i'm like that's not gonna happen so don't worry about that that's Mm -hmm. where my predictions came from that i i'm like it's not gonna be as bad as you guys think don't worry about it no yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) i mean if xbox dies it's gonna be a very long time until they completely gone all right 
Hogue. Yes. Tomb Raider, dude. Yeah. You've been playing Tomb Raider? I've played a little bit of this recently also. Let's hear your so, thoughts first, though. So I played Tomb Raider Original Recipe way back when, uh, and it really was a game that was designed around being Prince of Persia, fighting uh, simple enemies, avoiding traps, making difficult jumps. Uh, in 3D instead of in 2D. Obviously, folks know Lara Croft now, but that was its original sales pitch. And in its remastered environment, I think this is my favorite kind of remaster insofar as when you turn it on and you play it, you say, yeah, that looks right. That looks mm-hmm. like I remember it. And like other remasters that are running on the same engine, you have a button in this that you can turn it back to, to back in time to see what it looked like in the 90s. And it looks a lot better now. It looks very different yeah. than you actually remember it, but it does hit that beat of how you think it looked back then. And so I think the remaster project I like because it's a game I enjoyed and because I don't think games today really follow this ethos as often, which is precision in uh, platforming allows you to have environments that can seem organic, but that you can work through as a kind of environmental puzzle without yellow paint and all these various things because the rules are so specific I, I step back one step and then I hit these buttons and I'm going to jump when I need to and it's going to be automatic because that's the way the animation works and those kinds of things. And I miss that kind of gameplay because right now you've got a lot more photorealism and kind of bumping into things until you see yellow paint or you try to figure out what's interactable or not. And Tomb Raider, even though you can look at it and say, well, that's blocky and it's not as photorealistic or as organic as I would think in real life, affords this different kind of gameplay opportunity than specifically kind of all coming to a point where we're trying to make the most realistic environments possible. And so I will always like that. It's one of the reasons I like Nintendo. I think there are other universes to explore in game design than what the biggest, most photorealistic games are leaning towards. And this Tomb Raider Remastered project just reminded me of that. And especially in context with playing a flat up awesome game with Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown. So I've had a year so far that has been just as good as 2023, which I wouldn't have imagined is possible in video gaming. And on top of that, have been playing Infinite Wealth. So I, I could not be happier with everything that I've played so far. And I recommend the Tomb Raider remaster to folks, because if you can get around controlling a person, a human being like a tank, uh, like the original Resident Evil, and you can see what they've done with the game design, uh, I think there's a lot to enjoy there even now. But it's gonna be it's going to be a little bit of a culture shock. Yeah, uh, I played Tomb Raider a little bit back in the day. One of my friends had it, and I remember renting one of them for a while, but I never like played through a lot of the, the older ones, I would say. So it's been really fun revisiting it, this. Um, <laughs> Control-wise, yes, it is tank controls. Uh, it is like Resident Evil, but it's like Resident Evil trying to do platforming, which can be extremely frustrating, I guess, like, just yeah. there's a button for literally for Laura to sidestep because you have to be so precise in your movements. Like if you push back a little too much, she'll just leap back too far and just fall off something. And there's definitely a lot of adjusting, like running and jumping. Like you have to get a, a good amount of uh, running ground before she can like do a good jump. So it, it's been a lot of adjusting for me, but it has been fun at the same time. Hogue of it makes me feel nostalgic of, struggling just to do platforming, which is something I haven't felt in a long time. You know, most games you play are nowadays are so fluid and movement feels so good, but now it's very archaic in how it is. Cause it's a very old game, of course. And I'm having fun just kind of figuring that out. Like I was struggling just to, like, there's this part where you go through, like you jump over like a stream for a while. You're just platforming back and forth. And I'm having to go so slow and be so precise and plan out everything pr- like, properly before i can make it because it can be tough but this uh this version of the game they did add modern controls to make it a little smoother i actually prefer the tank controls after doing them both i like the precision i can get out of the um the original controls i think but i prefer tank controls in resident evil even like the remakes i like the tank controls more so maybe that's just me but it's been cool revisiting this game. Just the level design, I think, is still kind of inter- or still pretty interesting. Like you're saying, oh, Hogue, how there's like no yellow paint, of course, as a modern thing. But I think going through these spaces and really navigating them, because you have to do pay attention to where you're going, because there's a lot of stuff that's just kind of hidden. Like uh, one of the stages I remember, I didn't see. Just there's this 
uh, ledge I could have climbed on just because of the geometry and how everything was kind of blending in. But once you do find it, you're like, oh, okay. And it leads you into some really cool areas like the the dinosaur. Everyone remembers the dinosaur. That T-Rex coming out the first time is still really fun. And I, I do, do think look- the remaster has a bit of a problem with that insofar as you're right. Some of the shading is a little bit more naturalistic. Yeah. And sometimes it's useful to hit the button to see the older graphics because you, you'll yes. see the kind of bolder textures and where the ledges are a little bit stronger. Yes. So that's not great. But no, I, it's not like it's I think it's it serves its purpose. I think it's better or it's better more often than it's worse, I would say. And yeah. thankfully, like you said earlier, I think this is great. They can just push a button and it swaps between the um, the versions instantly. Even the frame rate, like the remaster one is 60 and the old one is like, I don't know, probably 20 something. Yeah, it's maybe chunky, 30. whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, it's very chunky. And I love how it does that so quickly. Reminds me of um, Diablo 2 Resurrected had stuff like that. And I think some of the Halo games did also. Yep. But it's been a, a lot of fun. These games are probably, from what I remember, much harder. Because now you can just save anywhere, which is great. But I remember the old games, you just die. It's like, well, got to do like that whole level over again. And like, you could die. There's like a lot of traps that just kill you instantly in this game. Like debris just falling on your head or a spike pit out of nowhere you're just gone so it's been a lot of fun revisiting it though uh i haven't played two or three yet in the collection but i'm having a good time with one it's pretty rough in some areas but i think it's definitely more manageable those old games than they've ever been and the I price tag yeah i think the price tag is 30 bucks for all three so it's a I nice believe. entry and i definitely think they're worth checking out especially for even just from a historical aspect you want to see like a lot of earlier 3d games especially when when this game came out, I don't think there was the dual shock yet, so you had to use triggers probably to rotate the camera. You so. did, and I was going to say the right stick is a trap. Yeah, they, they've they've added camera movement on the right stick in the new one, but you don't want it. Don't use it; It'll, it's a trap. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of wonky. I'd say, like, I've definitely spent time trying to line stuff up, but which has been kind of part of the charm for me in this whole playthrough. Uh, Colin, yeah. how are you feeling about Tomb Raider? Uh, you check I, this had, out? I have a very Colin comment about this which is uh well i want to give aspire credit because i don't know if you guys saw this or if it's probably not important to you but they went off with the trophies i don't know did you guys see this with the, the trophy I, situation? there was a someone wrote in specifically to ask about your opinion on the trophies yeah so it's interesting there's something going on with ps5 where the way that the ps5 does trophy lists precludes certain games from having platinums in certain ways like mm-hmm. i think each package can only have one platinum trophy and you you saw this with with um, Uncharted Collection, where you needed to get Uncharted 4, you needed to like get a gold trophy in Uncharted 4 and a gold trophy in the DLC that indicated you beat him on the hardest difficulty or level or whatever, which would then unlock the Platinum or whatever. So there's all mm-hmm. this weird shit going on with the Platinum trophies. Anyway, I say that because the PS4 versions of Tomb Raider 1, 2, and 3 each have like 100-ish trophies, which is insane, and a platinum trophy. Yeah. But the PS5 list is all three games combined, and it's 253 bronze trophies, 16 silver trophies, and no gold trophies, and no platinum trophies. What? And, and so it's actually worth f- over 4,000 points. And uh, in the back end, like comparable um, to like what achievement points would be, and they're nuts. Like the trophy lists are, cr- like for people that are into trophies, you should definitely look into this. There's never been a game like this before. Mm. Um, that has had trophies like this. And if you're, if I was like, a, I'm not a Tomb Raider fan, really. I did play Tomb Raider when I was a kid and I played most of them, I think, if not all of the core mm-hmm. games Um, up to today. But I'm looking at the list now and it's just, they're just crazy, crazy lists. So if you, <laughs> if you have a crossover of trophies, a love of trophies and, um, and Tomb Raider, you may want to take a look at this because again, there's been nothing like this. Like if, if, if Cap, this is the antithesis of what Capcom did with the Mega Man anniversary collection, where it's like, oh, here's like eight bronze trophies. It's like eight. I, we were going into it being like, oh, we're going to do all sorts of cool shit in fucking Mega Man. And then we're, you're going to have to mm-hmm. be Mega Man 2 without getting hit. And you're going to have to do all this kind of. And then it's like, oh, just beat each game once and you get bronze trophies for each. And I'm like, that sucks. And this is the yeah. exact opposite of that. This is like a lot of love and care. It's going to drive people insane, probably. Actually. No, no platinum though for PS5? Yeah. So the PS5 version has a folded. So the PS5 version. For some reason, and this has to do with the way the consoles deal with trophies, though we don't have all the answers yet, is that it's just a, a package where it's just the Tomb Raider one, two and three remastered package. You go into mm-hmm. it and then it's all these different lists if you and they all count towards one thing. If you go to the other games, they're all individual games 
packages okay. and those have platinums. This happened actually the big canary in the coal mine that this was happening. I don't know if you guys remember, you probably wouldn't, is that the most recent Call of Duty game didn't have a platinum trophy on PS5, which and everyone was like, mm. that's the weirdest thing ever. And it's because yeah, of weird. like, it's because people think that the Call of Duty package that they've opened for the trophies now will be like the Call of Duty module trophies that they'll add constant lists to. And so none of them will have platinums, but you're paying the price for that early on. If you care about that shortest shit, it's worth knowing, but I don't have mm. any more answers for it right now. But there are certain games that indicate yet yeah, things are changing in some way. So, yeah, if you go look at the list, it's 200 and it's, it's 200, 269 trophies in the list. Good Lord. <laughs> That's an absurd amount of trophies. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Tomb Raider's cool. Check it out. All right, Colin, final game. Lords of Exile. You texted me about this specifically. <laughs> this well, Castlevania I, game. Yeah, I promised it, early. Not, in name but yes yes i promised earlier that i would add a new genre to and i want to call it the castlevania like sure there are just a series of games that are coming out that are unapologetically castlevania games they're not even yeah. trying to do anything else and this is the most recent one it's called the lords of exile it comes from Squidbit works and was published by pid and it's available on all consoles. It doesn't seem to be doing very well. It only has 34 reviews total on Steam, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's dying on the vine or people are playing it certain places, but I played it. I, I actually played it all in one night and I got to the last boss and I couldn't beat him. And then I just went to bed. So I haven't I haven't gone back to it yet. But it's truly unapologetically Castlevania. It's so funny how far people are pushing this. And the only reason I don't care, I would care more about this if Konami cared at all about Castlevania, but they don't. Mm -hmm. So if you're not going to do it, then other people are going to do it. And this game, I, I showed it to you, like, it's so unapologetic that the main character in the game is the same color as Trevor Belmont yeah. and Simon Belmont, like that orange and yellow hue. It's it's totally when I first saw the Bloodstained Ritual games. And, which are awesome. Those games are fucking phenomenal. Those are probably the best Castlevania like games. Those are really mimicking Castlevania three in some sense. Yeah. Um, and those games, especially the second one is like superb. Just that one boss mm -hmm. with all the coins and the money. I don't know if you remember that it was like so cool. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, so when I first saw those games, I'm like, wow, this is really pushing the very limits of look and feel the classic like Microsoft Apple you know, like how far away, can we, how far can we push this? Can we invert everything and all that kind of stuff? And, and this is way worse than that. Like, I'm like, wow, this is real. This is a Castlevania game, basically. And there are some additions to it that make it a little bit different, but it is what it is. He feels the character feels he jumps. He feels like a rock, you know, that okay. really yeah. stiff NES Castlevania. And people say like, oh, why would you want to play a game that's stiff? It's like, that's kind of what Castlevania was all about. Symphony yep. of the Night was what turned it around and made it more arcadey, but it was about if you jump, you better hope you're going to you're either going to get knocked back by an enemy or you're going to make it where you go. But there's not going to be any decision making or canceling, you know, once you're in the air. And that's like this kind of game. So you have to kind of get get wrap your mind around that. But this is a really, really cool game. And it is beautiful. This is a beautiful game. Uh, some of the backgrounds are just astounding. Four or five layers of parallax as you're going. So. They'll be like, you know, they'll be like a beam, like a Roman style beam and then the like plants and then the sky and then the castle in the background and then the moon and it's all moving separately. It, man, gorgeous. And what I wanted to say, too, is that. I say this a lot about Lily Mo, the studio that I co-own. Is that so it's 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 wrote to a lot of people, but for people that have not heard me say it or put a finer point on it is there's a difference between games that are inspired by old games and games that are old games. And this is an old game. There's mm -hmm. nothing in this game. I, I mean, not technically speaking, I don't know what, even what engine it's on, but you look at this game, and you're like, this could run on the NES. Hmm. Probably, you know, like it's not like shovel Knight or where shovel Knight has like this really dynamic MIDI track, like style track. Like, it wouldn't even fit on like at all. It wouldn't even be able to work. We want to make games like that at Lilymo, where the games look like you. It's just a game you didn't even know about from 1988 or something. And so there's two different paths that people take with these retro style games. And this is one of those games where it's like, oh, this is like you could show this to someone and be like, do you know this game from the NES era? And like if they were just kind of more casual, they'd be like, I've never seen this in my life, but they would think mm. it was real. 
And I really, really dig that. And that's what we're trying to trying to do too. And it's not like a very popular place to be, but I like it. It's it's like we were born too late, so we couldn't part we couldn't participate in a, in an era and where where we really wanted to be. And as the NES will always be my favorite console, this is the kind of shit that I love. So shout out to Lords of Exile. I might be the only one ever fucking talks about it anywhere, but it's, it's a, <laughs> there's just too many games, dude. Then this is the kind of thing know, that I'm talking are. about where games like this suffer. Yeah. Totally. But it's not, it's not, I I will say this real quick. I don't know if it, does it say it here? Yeah. There's a, it's $14.99 here. I want to say I thought it was $19.99 on a console, but either way, I think some people might balk a little bit at the price, but this is the cost of doing business with these beautiful pixel art games. So dude, 15 bucks. That's like nothing, man. That's dude. I just know know from selling these kinds of games. I don't think we've never put out a game as beautiful as this. I don't think, but yeah, but where people are like, oh, we found ten dollars is like the sweet spot, even eight, you know, and we're going to yeah. we're going to charge for the role playing game, probably like twenty four ninety nine. It's just much bigger. Yeah. And we're curious to see how that goes. But that's a big price increase for us. You know? Yeah. This game looks awesome. Like fifteen dollars, in my opinion, is a steal for this game. I thought it was going to be like twenty five or something yeah. like that. Dude, did you watch the video like how the, there's a video on Steam and they show the very intro of the game? It is just Rondo of Blood. Like straight up. <laughs> oh, yeah, like that is the yeah. It's just like the carriage, the horse carriage coming up or whatever. I'm like, this is so fun. I was just immediately I was like, this is so funny. And I I kept bringing up videos actually to show Mike. I'm like, look at how much of a rip off this is of Castlevania three specifically again. The clock oh, tower, yeah. the pirate ship kind of shit and all that. I was like, oh, so funny. yeah. Yeah. Oh, Shout there's a, another playable character, too. She looks like a ninja. Yeah, you unlock her at the end. I haven't unlocked her yet. OK, cool. I love stuff like that. Unlocking new characters. Yeah, it's like it's like, yeah, it's like unlocking Maria or Richter. Or whatever yeah. back in the day. Good stuff. Yeah, this game looks amazing. God damn it. There's too many games right yeah, now. Yeah, it, it is. It's it's literally a night. You know, it's it's cool. not more than that, I don't think. Hogue, That's are all you, it needs to be, man. Are you a Castlevania fan, Hogue? I don't know if we've ever talked about shop about Castlevania. I love Symphony of the Night. I never really connected super well with the first few. Hmm. Um, but I also don't have any strong negative feelings about them. They were clunky in their own way, as you say. And I was never very good at them because I was too young to be good, any good at them when they came out. But yeah, I do like older eras of games quite a bit. My my favorite game of all time is Star Control 2. And that hasn't changed even as modern games have come out because there was a certain freshness a, a, of people figuring out what designs would even work or play out for fun for people uh, mm-hmm. in that era. And so I, I like the 80s and 90s. Uh, for those games, uh, even though I think Symphony of the Night is the pinnacle of that Castlevania feel for oh, me. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. The Castlevania Advance Collection is really good, too. It was good to go yeah. back to those and actually be able to see them. I remember when I got Circle of the Moon, I could fucking barely see it playing it like <laughs> under, a, yeah. under a lamp on my Arctic White <sighs> Game Boy Advance. Yeah, Symphony of the Night is the king in every way. I don't, I don't know that it'll mm-hmm. ever be beaten, but it would be so nice for Konami to go back and revisit it again. When you really think about it, they left us with that shitty fucking online ex- Castlevania. Remember that thing? What was it called? Yeah. Harmony. Uh, of oh, har- well, dis- yeah. Was- dissonance? Despair? Yeah. Something, like it was that. something of despair. Harmony of Dissonance is the GBA one. The is that the game. G? Yeah. With- yeah, Wait, yeah. Do you remember that game? Hogue? It was like the, it was like the on, it looked like Symphony of the Night, but it was, it was like online. And there were a few people. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I don't remember. remember it super well, but I do. That, that was also an era of invention, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's when you get the Xbox arcade games that are all kind of a little bit weird. Uh, and I think Castlevania was one of those. Konami's a weird company. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they sure are. I think that might have been Iga's last game at, at Konami. The what, what's so which is a fucking shame. But yeah. but uh, yeah, shout out to I love Catholic horror. I love mm-hmm. vi- vampires. All Same. the things like Castlevania is so appealing. It's so appealing. They don't. I would. They're sitting on a gold mine with that franchise, in my opinion, especially after the way the Netflix series was received. And yeah, get it going, dude. It what are you doing? Yeah, they're going to hire some bullshit team to make some horrible I Castlevania know, game, dude. just like they did with <sighs> what they did with Silent Hill and what they frankly did with Lords of Shadow. I mean, no offense to Mercury Steam. I thought Lords of Shadow one was good, but Lords yeah. of Shadow two was really yeah. bad. And Woof. um didn't understand Castlevania at all. And they, I think they just got scared away ever since, but there's studios out there that would probably fall over themselves to do Castlevania. You know, yeah. let them unleash yeah, the right. money. Economy's got to unleash the money. You got to spend the unleash money. The That's cash. what they're afraid of. 
So surprisingly, Mercury Steam did good with Metroid. Yeah, Dread was, Dread was good. great. Yeah, yeah, so. they revived themselves. I I would have been skeptical about that because they did that interstitial Lords of Shadow 3DS game that was like a Metroidvania and it sucked. Mm. So I, hate, bad. I hated Near that game. Fate? Yeah, I hated it. Yeah, yeah, not good, not good. Jeez. Well, now I just want Castlevania to come back. I know, right? Do it, Konami. Stop being cowards. Or just license it Bring to it someone back. else. Sony is really the the best bet of probably uh, extracting it from them not mm-hmm. not owning it but licensing it you know to someone yeah <coughs> all right let's finish off the show with a uh, few questions from our audience remember if you want to send in a question patreon.com slash last stand media hop on over there all right this is from joshua jones hello there generals i was just wondering are any of you guys going to try the free eight hours of skull and bones i tried the beta for it and fell in love with it it's like playing Black Flag. Oh, and that first hour is rough if you've played Black Flag because the controls are so similar. Uh, Hogue, you said you've been playing this. I did. I played the open beta before my trip, uh, and I liked it enough that I knew I would buy it, and so I bought it when I got home. I really like this game. It is cool. um, not what I was expecting at all. It's more of a resource management and uh, economic simulator than I thought they were making. And I've always loved those games. I going back to like privateer uh, and the various things where you had to make your way in the world with a very light kind of story. And you've heard me mention it in this episode, but I, I like places that can games that can give you a sense of place without necessarily a super strong narrative. So what I think they've done with skull and bones is kind of a Sid Meier's pirates kind of notion. Here's some pirate islands. Here's some, various outpost towns. You're trying to be the best that ever was the, the, the best pirate go nuts. And I think I've seen some reviews that don't like that approach. Uh, and I don't blame them. We're, we're more used to and more accustomed to more direct narratives, whether it's in Assassin's Creed or anything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this isn't that this isn't the game where you go and explore the islands yourself so much. Uh, but I think if you're interested in, kind of resource collection, the survival crafter kind of elements with a pirate ship and economics and trade that there's more to like here than I would have expected before the beta. So I like skull and bones. Cool. It's a weird thing that is not a lot like a lot of other games. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wish I liked or was interested in it. Mm-hmm. I just want the pirate game. I want to be a pirate and go on my ship and go yeah. out on the islands. Yeah. Around. It's not that. Yeah. yeah, and exactly. I'm just like, I don't know why no one's fucking doing that. Like, Sea of Thieves is kind of like that, but it's multiplayer. But I'm talking single player pirate game. I want that kind of stuff. And I, I knew Skull the, Bones wasn't like that. So, so I think the fault, people but. that wanted it to be a big old black flag game yeah, are rightly exactly. disappointed in what they went with. Uh, I just what came out of this process, I actually wound up liking. So I am. Well, that's Skull good. And Bones. It's great to hear. I hope <laughs> I hope they make some money from this because uh that game was probably really fucking expensive. And I don't know anyone that's really hyped on this game. Not even some of the biggest defenders I knew of this game are even playing it. So I'm glad some people are liking it. I don't dude. I can't, I can't believe this game is $70 though. I'm so surprised it's $70. Right. And right against hell divers, which is selling yeah, it for another live service kind of game. Yeah. We'll see how it does though. I don't want to be All a right. pirate. <laughs> I had to get a Seinfeld <laughs> reference. I had to get a Seinfeld reference in there. I know someone wrote in about Seinfeld thing. Like I forgot what it was though. Asking like, what episode of Seinfeld is this from? <laughs> but Colin got it in anyways. I'm now. I'm gonna get a puffy shirt and send you a screenshot yeah. just for the heck of it. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, Colin, you better be delivering the Seinfeld references when we're in New York. Oh yeah, I'll you do the best. Chris I can. Better be on that. I'll do the best. I get it. It's never intentional. It just always. I know. Seinfeld it just comes is out, so dude. worldly. It's just that. Yeah, that it, it's just that show. It, it, yeah, it's ref, it's deeply referential. It's like The Office, which was, yeah. well, I think, a kind of a similar thing. But Seinfeld's much more so, though. Curb. It, so yeah, it's so weird. Uh, Seinfeld. No one in my family grew up watching. Like I didn't know anyone that watched it. I didn't watch Seinfeld until I was in my my mid twenties. And it's still good. Oh my god, it still holds up, man. I believe it. That's uh, there's some almost. There's a jealousy of not having seen it and being able to see it for the first time. Like, it, like, yeah, uh, it's a very special brand of humor. Micah calls me Larry all the time. Like when I say yes, something, I stupid, she's like, oh, she's like, OK, Larry, you mm-hmm. know, like when I say like what, something offhanded or whatever, is that something that she doesn't agree I with? I can see that. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, let's see. Peachy wrote in. Hello, summon signers. 
One of my favorite series is the monolith developed Shadow of Mordor slash War series. The most innovative mechanic in those games was undoubtedly the Nemesis system. First of all, have you played those games? Do you like them? And since Hogue is on the show, could he dive in a little bit into the non or the now patented Nemesis system? How did they get away with it? What is the legal limit for a patent of a game mechanic? Could Nintendo uh, patent catching a creature inside a ball? I mean, if every new innovation in gameplay was patented, we'd have pretty shitty games in the future. Please educate us. Yeah, we'll start there, Hogue. Sure. And as I mentioned, I did an article on the patenting of the Nemesis right. system for VGC. And I also have a video in virtual legality on my channel on this particular question, if you're interested in more. But for right now, suffice it to say, most game mechanics are not patented because people don't bother to go and try to patent them because it would be very hard to defend that patent. Mm-hmm. So you go through a process of getting a trademark or a copyright registered or a patent in this case, and then you have that registered in whatever country you're talking about. Predominantly, we're talking about the United States here. Uh, And then if somebody says, uh, we're going to make a game that uses that same system, the the, the company that owns the patent has to go and defend that patent if they want to stop that game from being made. And oftentimes, that second step doesn't make a lot of sense because the game is in its nascent stages. You don't know whether it's going to succeed. Gaming is a volatile industry, uh, and so it's expensive to litigate those kinds of things, and you're probably not going to police them. I don't know that I've heard of the Warner Brothers team uh, in- instigating a patent uh, litigation on its Nemesis system for anybody, and that might be because the other companies are scared off from doing it, which is the real reason that you get a patent like that. But it's not just, can I capture a monster in a ball, or can I have orc generals fall and be replaced? If you actually go and look at the... Warner Brothers patent for the Nemesis system. It's pretty specific in terms of a relationship between two players can be modified by a separate event, uh, and one of the players can be an NPC, and the various things that might describe the Nemesis system to you if you were a boring lawyer uh, or a patent clerk trying to figure out what, what this thing does. And in my opinion, it's probably too broad. The patent office is not god kings descended from on high they're human beings too and so you can sometimes snow them with what you're offering as a novel invention because patents are for inventions uh and i don't know whether or not it'll actually stay out i think warner brothers does this in order to try to dissuade the pal worlds of the of the universe uh but i do like shadow of war in particular Mm -hmm. a lot shadow of mordor i like a little less uh but I don't know when we'll next see that system being used to great effect. Yeah, maybe Wonder Woman, the game they've been working on forever. I really yeah. wanted one more Shadow game because the way Shadow of War ended, it's like, well, you have to do a third one. And I don't yeah, know they, if we're ever going to get it now, which sucks. They never have to do a third one, do they? Yeah, you know, the, the, the Hobbit Lego games that they were making that only mm-hmm. had parts one and two. That's weird. Oh, interesting. But the ending of war was just so cliffhanger. Definitely they had more to tell. But whatever. It is a lot. Yeah, I Uh, think they're fun. I uh I I hope that whatever Monolith comes out with next is great. I think they're a good company. Uh and I think Warner Brothers is one of those companies that has some video game gold and sometimes doesn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So I hope they get the support they need and that Wonder Woman or whatever uses the Nemesis system next uh, uses it well. Yeah. Colin, have you played those? No, I haven't. I I never I'm I don't like Lord of the Lord of the Rings enough to play those. That's it. I'm quitting. No, I'm joking. (laughs) No, it's like it's like my dad's favorite thing. And like my sister Allie's obsessed with it and all this. I just I like the books a lot and I like the films. It just they never really spoke to me. I think the first. The first one for sure came out when I was at IGN too. And so if I wasn't playing something for a review, I really had no time to play anything. Mm. Anyway. So I missed quite I a definitely few don't have a Gandalf quote on my desk right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a nerd lawyer. It's okay. <laughs> uh, this is from Ethereal Pizza. Great name. This is a question or this question is more dedicated at Colin and Hogue, but I'd love to hear from Brad as well. I'm an Aussie and the whole concept of the NFL makes no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> Last week, a friend of mine invited me over to watch the Super Bowl, and she gave me a crash course in the NFL before it started. 
It's fair to say there's still an absolute fuckload I need to learn, but I managed to pick up the basics such as how downs work, the scoring system, fumbles, etc. I was absolutely enthralled by the Super Bowl by the end of it, and it was on the edge of my seat and hooked on the NFL. So my question is this. I'm not particularly a fan of the way EA monetizes their sports games, but would buy but would buying in one of the older Maddens a cheap be a good way to help me learn more about the game, such as the complex details? Definitely. Cheers, fellas, and keep up the great work. When I was a kid, I think I learned all the rules of sports from EA Sports. Like, I, I, I was playing, what, like Lakers versus Pistons, NHL 94, Madden, Sports Talk Football, which isn't EA, but like those various things and, and learning about the rules. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I like rules. One of the reasons I think football is as popular as it is in America is because we, we're a litigious society that likes rules. Uh, and football it has an abundance of tiny rules and things. Uh, I've also have been fortunate enough that this past fall, as Michigan was readying for its national championship, my oldest daughter started enjoying watching football. So I've had a lot of times, especially when I'm really tense about losing a football game, where I've been asked, why did they stop doing that? Why did the clock stop? What are the downs? And I think that uh, football is much more approachable if you're playing it through a video game context. So I think an old Madden is a great choice for that. Sure. Yeah. What about you, Colin? Yeah, I agree with Ho completely. Specifically, there were two. Uh, I play uh, like like you. I played all the sport. I love sports games when I was a kid. It's so funny because I don't play sports games at all anymore, but. I would yep. buy NHL every year, Madden every year. I had a bunch of baseball games and some basketball games. I remember even on Dreamcast, my favorite Dreamcast game was arguably NBA 2K. I played Ooh. over a phone line and I thought it was like the most revolutionary thing I'd ever done in my life at the time. Um, Madden taught me football because football is not a relevant sport in my family outside of like some uncles and cousins. The, the relevant sport in my family, high, like the highly relevant sport in my family is baseball which is not a relevant sport to me anymore, but I was a, I grew up a huge Yankee fan and mm. I loved the Yankees when I was a kid and into my twenties. I just don't care about baseball anymore. I just think it's, I love the game. I just think the MLB is broken and I'm not going to get into all that right now. Just, it's not for me. And not a lot of people feel that way. So it's not that uncommon and hockey I played. So that's how we came to love hockey and how we understood hockey. But, mm -hmm. um, and basketball is just kind of self-explanatory and I like basketball a lot too, but football was kind of a mystery to me. And I've often remarked that I didn't understand how much I loved, truly loved it until it was too late for me to play. Because by the time you're in high school, which is when I really realized I loved football, I was like, well, you can't. I'm too small anyway to play. But And I was playing hockey. There's a bunch of reasons, but I would have loved to have tried. But mm -hmm. it was digging through the playbooks in Madden. And I, I, remember specific, I, I remember specific things that I remember learning, like, or when I learned them, like what a spy is, right, in a defense. So it's like, you know, the spy is like usually you usually have a QB spy, like a player that like usually a, a safety or a, um, a lineman that's just watching the quarterback. And if the quarterback tries to run or, or make a, a escape from the pocket or whatever, that they're just you know keeping an eye on them. And over time, slowly you realize like, OK, four, three defense, three, four defense, nickel defense. These are all the positions, cornerback, strong safety, free safety, you know, defensive end, defensive lineman. And then on the other side, wide receiver and tight end, blocking tight ends and fullbacks and running backs. And it does seem like it's a lot. But then, as I think Hogue would, would totally agree, it's like there comes a time where you start seeing through the matrix of football and I, where you watch it enough. And at least for me, it's like, oh, holding. And then the flag flies out. Right. And, and it's like you see the pellet or you see a, a flag coming from a certain part of the field. And you're like, oh, that must be that. And nine out of 10 times, you're right. So you just have to subject yourself to it enough. And then before you know it, you just kind of know it. Like you just fundamentally know it to the point where I couldn't understand looking at a football game and not understanding every aspect of it, basically. And um, the only caveat I would have to yeah. that is that the vocabulary that Madden uses for describing its plays is not necessarily modern vocabulary or the vocabulary that was adopted by like announcers. Now, for, for the most part, I think announcers are pretty bad at their jobs. You talk about games media potentially not being the best. I think sports announcers in the world of 2024 are maybe the worst that I've been, I've seen since I started watching sports uh, in, in football in particular. Um, so I would caveat that like, they're not going to talk about I form. They're not going to talk about some of the ways that Madden describes the formations uh, if you watch an NFL broadcast, but you'll get the idea. And I, and I think Colin's exactly right. 
that you'll get the notion certainly of how downs and distance work, points, that kind of thing. Uh, but the 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 minutia it changes, and also because the NFL changes so rapidly, right? There's there's a notion of edge rushers just being gener- generic kind of forces as linebackers or linemen that the NFL is kind of embraced right now that probably isn't reflected in older Madden terminology. I like how things you're like, right. Things like that. You're totally right there. And I think that the other thing that's interesting too is just, and this is more true in the modern games, like modern Madden games, but I remember this even being the case in the on the SNES and PS1, which was like just the depth of the playbooks and the individuality of the playbooks that somehow resembled, I think more over time, like what, you know, where they were running like a West Coast offense or whatever, like it would resemble that. And you would just begin to learn. I just it's so funny. It's such a great question from the audience member, because I really have always believed this about Madden for, for just. And it's so funny to hear Hogue kind of agree. And I was going to say the other game for me in this regard was FIFA, which was never a game I bought, but I used to rent when I was a kid on SNES. And then where I'm not a soccer fan, really, I think it's a cool game. I think I have a I've said it a million times. I have a huge problem with the timekeeping in, in soccer. I think it's fucking crazy. <laughs> Um, (laughs) and it ruins the entire game for me. Like the entire, just for people that don't know, soccer is split into two 40, what is it? 45 minute halves or whatever. And yes. And they, the clock runs. And then at the end, they'll put like an arbitrary amount of time at the end that would make up for like penalty time. And when the ball goes out of bounds and it'd be like, oh yeah, just play for four more minutes. It's like like an injury. It's like, what, what? Like every time I'm like, like, why don't you just stop the clock? When the ball goes out of bounds and then people say like, oh, football, NFL football, the clock runs and stops. I'm like, it's all about manipulating the clock. The NFL is all about manipulating the clock. You know, there is. And there's um, a lot of coaches that are bad timekeepers. Right. Exactly. Like it's different. Like you want there are games where you're playing a certain team, you're playing a certain offense, you have a certain rhythm where you're like, we want this game to get going, like get it over as quickly as possible. And then there are times where it's like, well, we want to slow this game down, you know, and make sure that no time passes for whatever reason. So I love the question because it's it allows me to speak to that. And to my continued annoyance that sports crossover with video games isn't bigger with the fan bases, although it's it's obviously substantial, but the whole sports ball mentality and people not seeing, you know, the dismissiveness of sports. I hate that shit because mm. um, I, I think they're, they're natural bedfellows and always have been. And shout out to the earliest games, right? I mean, not, not so much the earliest games on 2600, but Nintendo Ice Hockey, Blades of Steel, Tecmo Bowl and Tecmo Super Bowl. Uh, right. Uh, fucking bases loaded. Uh, baseball stars, which was probably my favorite sports game ever when I was a kid. Baseball stars. People should look that game up so hard, far ahead of its time. It was an NES baseball game where it had a battery in it. Dude, we didn't get battery support in in EA sports games on SNES until like 96. I want to say and what that means is that you couldn't wow. save your progress. So like you, there was no season Cash functionality. Words. Dude, I, I used to Oh, you'd appreciate this. I still have them. I used to keep binders and play 82 game seasons in NHL 95 and keep all the stats by hand and like all the Damn, standings impressive. and shit and use like the out of town. You remember how there was just a selection for out of town scores and it would just be a random generation of scores. I would use those as the other scores in this in the league and keep these standings by hand because the games wouldn't allow you to do it. Meanwhile, baseball stars an SNK game from maybe 1989 on NES had this. Ro- it had no licenses, but this robust system with statistics and seasons trades. And it was player creation. It was so good. That game is so good. Still one of the great <laughs> sports games of all time. So shout out to all those. Pre- no licenses was fun. Yeah. You just had a city name. Yeah. Yeah. They had, I remember they had like the lovely, la- like it was all, all the lovely ladies and like the ninja something. It was like all these random stupid things and like the, awesome. the best approximations you can get of Japanese people, English names, you know, like those, those, ra- mm-hmm. do you ever see that image that goes around? It's not from baseball stars, but it's from something else where it was like a Japanese made Western sports game. And the, and the roster of players is all nonsense. Like not one of the words is a real English word, but it's like <laughs> things that people made up for, I got to find it for you guys. That's it, awesome. I'm sure the audience out there knows that it's, it's like, it looks like what you, th- if you didn't really know English, what you think English names were. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. dude. It's good shit. Back in the day. Yeah. All right, final question. This is from Fernando. Hey, Summoners. This week's episode of Secret Symbols Plus with Genki got me thinking about the Japanese gaming scene. With Xbox looking to restart soon with a possible handheld or streaming device and a possible PS Vita 2 from Sony, can the Japanese market help give either of these competitors an edge where console gaming is on the decline? 
Thank you for all uh, the great content and have a and great to have Ace Attorney Hogue back for another LSM show. Much love from Dirty Jersey. So, if we get new handhelds from Microsoft and Sony, do you think that will help them in Japan? Because Nintendo dominates Japan. It's mm-hmm. not even close right now. I don't. I personally don't think there's really anything. I, I don't think Xbox should even be worried about Japan at this point. Yeah, I um, don't think it's maybe. valuable enough compared to the other jurisdictions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think anything that gets you into a more uh, urban accessible environment is going to help you in those particular environments. So I, I think everybody with a handheld is going to do a little bit better in Japan. Mm-hmm. I don't think winning Japan is all that informative of how you're doing as a gaming company. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, though, about... Let's say Sony does another handheld and it does work with whatever your library of games that you have already. Do you think they could take ground from Nintendo or quite a bit of it? Because from my understanding in Japan is a lot of the spaces are very small and a lot of people don't necessarily play on big TVs and a lot of that stuff. They always a lot of the appeal is just playing in handheld. Do you think it'd be wise for them even to try to take their ground in Japan I never know what Sony's doing with their hardware strategy, to be honest. Uh, Mm -hmm. The the PSVR 2 and the Portal, they don't make a ton of sense to me from a business perspective. Uh, So, I mean, they might might trot it out there. I loved my Vita, Mm -hmm. uh, but it's dead, which is ironic, I suppose. Uh, (laughs) But but I I would love to see everybody take another crack at it. Yeah. Uh, Heck. I'd, I'd like to see the whole console space turn into switches going against each other if that's what they want. I love the switch. It's very, it, I took the switch on vacation because it's so easy to do. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I think that would be great, but I don't have any reason to believe that Sony or Microsoft is going to devote too much time to trying to win Japan with those kinds of things. Yeah. What do you think, Colin? Yeah. I think this is a, I've long said that the leaving this ground uncontested was strange. Uh, the, the the handheld space, like the, the the more mobile core gaming space. Japan is a very mobile centric on the go society. A third of its population lives in Tokyo, very small spaces, lots of activity, socializing and all the rest. People are just out and about really robust subways and bullet trains and all the rest. So, mm-hmm. but I think that Japan's, and, and this is something that I think Hogue was kind of speaking to is that Japan's winning Japan seems important because gaming is so Japanese. But it's mm-hmm. it, but that's just because the two of the major companies are Japanese like the and and gaming culture is deeply, you know, rooted in Japanese nerd culture. There's no doubt about that in video game culture and all the rest. But I think that at 100 million people and in our lifetime with a shrinking population, no doubt, it's like winning Japan is not really a relevant thing. I, if I were them, I would just I would actually just be like, we're not even really we have to play. We have to have some presence in Japan if we're Microsoft and Xbox. But I, I would imagine that they know that it's, there's just no winning there. They, people mm-hmm. have to remember they tried. They really tried. They did dump a lot of money into it. You can't you could can say a lot of things about Xbox, but you can't say that they didn't try, especially in the 360 era. You said you bought your 360 because of Vesperia. Mm-hmm. And that was a time to, that that never came to PS3 in the West. But that was a timed exclusive in Japan as well. That was a big deal. Right. Microsoft paid a lot of money for that. I remember the Final Fantasy 13 trailer dropping at the Xbox conference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Certainly. So they tried. Yeah. It, it's just it's 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 not trying to be dismissive of the brand. Generally, it's just that, that they shouldn't bother. It's not mm-hmm. going to happen for them there. It's not important. If anything, Microsoft should be taking a cue from Sony and Sony is investing heavily in South Korea, China, India and Africa. And I said on Sacred Symbols a couple of weeks ago, no one except for us talked about that Africa story with their mm-hmm. their investment into um, Carry First, which is like the biggest publisher in Africa, gaming publisher. Like you got to go where the heads are, like where the where the, the hands that hold the consoles are. Now, I, I want to say one thing, Hogue, I disagree with you. I think Portal is I think the Portal is awesome. Clearly, the demand for it is greater than they expected. And I think Hiroki Totoki Literature Club said in the uh in the fi- fiscal call that they looked at it as an experiment and a successful one about for engagement, you know, and mm-hmm. um, it just seems like they're, they're throwing the, like, I think that if anything, the, the portal, if you look at it as like a, one of those peg games and uh, like the, the left side is them not doing a, a handheld and the right side is them doing another dedicated handheld. Like the peg went one side more to the right with, with the portal, like, and it's success, right. you know, 
I think it was actually pretty important to the evolution of where they may, might get here. But let's be qu- let's be clear about the nomenclature per, per the write in. Let's not call it a Vita two. It's the third <laughs> handheld, and so let's just call it a third hypothetical PlayStation handheld. Yes. Yeah, v- Vita two is not happening. No, that would be stupid yeah. to call it that. And and yeah. it's it, it just yeah. you would. We all thought PSP two would have been the smart, especially in their naming mm-hmm. structure. That would have been the I obvious know. name. I wish it was PSP two. That would have been sick. Or next generation portable was still cool too. NGP, but yeah, that um, was cool. But nonetheless, yeah, RIP Vita. We tried. We well, hey, yeah. I'm mega proud. Lily Mo released one of the last games ever on Vita, um, Dang, and we yeah. would and we would still release games for Vita if we were allowed, but we are not. Damn. <laughs> yeah, man. If um, Microsoft or um, Sony can get like their their own version of a Steam Deck, that'd be awesome because Steam Deck. Everyone loves that thing. Just having all your library, it's so great. I just wish it was smaller. It's too clunky for me. There's something interesting, though, in the... And again, I I don't know enough about tech at all to to be able to really dissect this further, but in the fiscal... In, like, the the Q&A with the investors, they were asked about, like, shrinking... Basically, they were saying they were having a difficult time extracting any more margin out of hardware. That... I guess silicon is getting to like a, a certain nanometer where like there's nowhere to go and mm. there's no more savings to find. And you would imagine that the next solution therefore is to get it in that shit into another device. Like, okay, so this works in a handheld now, a very expensive one. Cause mm-hmm. it, I always thought it's like, Oh, maybe what they would do is make a portable PlayStation four. I've said that many times before PS4 games are still dude. Um, the, uh, Prince of Persia game was on PS4 natively. Mm-hmm. And so like they, they're still releasing PS4 games. PS4 games are going to be coming for years still. Not big ones, but PS4 games nonetheless. And I was wondering if maybe that was what they're going to aim for. But now and talking to Tom at Moore's Law is Dead and just having some conversations and thinking about it, it's like, no, they really could make a portable PS5. Um, you'd just be paying a Steam Deck like price for it. And maybe yeah. people would be willing to do that. And I would be down for that. And I think Nintendo kind of led the way, as they always do with handhelds, but they led the way in the sense that they realized that what was holding them back was not the quality of the games, but the the distraction of having two devices. Mm-hmm. And so would would capturing a handheld device that works like your your native hardware be the only way forward? And I would think so. Like the people that think there's going to be a bespoke Vita like a third PSP or whatever. No, no way. Nah. No way. Yeah. There's just no, no market for that. There's no one that wants to make games for that. Sony doesn't want to make Sony doesn't want to make games for PSVR 2. They're definitely not going to want to make games for a handheld anymore. <laughs> so yeah. they whatever they do has to be unified. That's the only rule. And I think Portal is kind of like an evolutionary, like a like a Lucy, you know, as it were. Yeah. Man, it's interesting. You brought up PS4 games and I just looked this up because I was curious metaphor is gonna have a ps4 version also and that's not till the fall i'm sure dude um they're coming still yeah it's uh it's good i mean this is good I, I, as long as the games aren't being held back that was what was frustrating about god mm-hmm. of war that was what was frustrating about horizon but i'm not really looking at an atlas game and thinking that it's being necessarily held back by its ps4 right, version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so as long as Absolutely. the aiming is good and we're not doing lowest common denominator shit because i even know tom was even speaking about this idea of having like a backend module for developers like in the even in like the SDK or whatever, where things were easily scalable backwards in some sense, where you would still be able to aim forward more like a PC. And mm-hmm. we're, we've we've slowly been getting to that point anyway, but I don't know if it's going to happen or not. But that's certainly they should have been contesting it a long time ago. And now is the time. I don't think anyone expected handheld gaming was going to stick around. Vita is another example of bad timing. That's it. I mean, yeah, b- bad other things too. bad price, memory cards, support show maybe bad a lot of things but the timing didn't help it because that was at a time where people like no one's going to want this anyway we want to play on our phones Mm -hmm. no they don't well they want to do that but certain games in in fairness i don't play my switch in portable mode hardly ever it's just an ultra portable console yeah yeah i never play in portable mode unless i have to all right guys that's gonna do it for this episode excellent hogue thanks for joining us man it's great to have you on here I loved it. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Before we go, remind the people where they can find you. Oh, sure. I'm doing YouTube videos at youtube.com slash hoaglaw. Uh, and I 
talk about business and law and video games and virtual legality or hangouts and headlines where we talk about news items and try to critically read articles and establish where maybe a little editorializing is going on and where we can get good information and have a fun com- conversation with the community. So if you like any of those things, check us out on the channel. We'd love to have you. Or if you just want to hear me rant about Michigan football on Twitter, I'm also at Hogla over there. <laughs> Colin, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having Always me. Two weeks in a row. Yeah, I'm, I won't be back again next week. Don't worry about it. Yeah, you'll be on cool down for a little bit. Yeah, we now gotta I got to breathe. Now I have to, uh, I have to rest. Go back into yeah. my coffin like Vincent. <laughs> any uh final thoughts colin any final words you want to get out there before we head out um i don't know man i'm just i'm excited for sacred 300 i'm excited for the mm-hmm. shows that are coming up later in the year we're gonna have hoag at one of them hope to Ooh. hopefully get at europe later in the year just to, mm-hmm. it's getting closer and closer because mike and i have to go to boston in a couple of weekends because i bought our bruins tickets uh, for christmas to go see a game there uh, but then a couple weeks later, we'll be in New York for that. And then kind of got to roll into the planning for the next show and so on and so forth. So it's interesting how dynamic the company has become. And it stresses me the fuck out, frankly. But everyone's doing it. <laughs> but everyone's doing a, a great job. And uh, I'm proud of everyone. And I'm, I'm glad you shout out the Dukes, especially earlier, because I think that they're doing it. You know, they're kind of shining right now as, as, as is necessary. So it's good stuff. Yeah. Dukes are good. Love them. All right, everybody. That's it. We're going to get the hell out of here. We'll see you next week. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Summon Sign is a product of Last Stand Media and Colin's Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is written and hosted by me, Brad Ellis. The show is produced by Dustin Furman. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. Summon Sign, along with the rest of Last Stand's media shows, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we are grateful for your kind contribution and generosity to our independent endeavor. Thank you.